Hello, Internet, and welcome to Creative Live. We are here for a very special three-day event with Mr. Scott Robert Lim. This is Think Like a 10K Wedding Photographer. My name is Kenna Klosterman, and I will be your host today, along with Mr. Jim Katechi. Jim, how are you doing this morning? Uh, Kenna, I am excellent. It's so great to be hosting with you again. I know. Uh, it's, it's been a while. It's been a while, and having Scott Robert Lim today, woohoo! I know. I'm so excited. I know. He is just... Full, a ball of energy. Yeah, he sure is. A ball is. of energy. <laughs> and uh, both you and I have, have had the pleasure of hosting uh, with Scott before. And it's first time for me was in down in San Francisco. And that was actually before we even opened our Creative Live San Francisco offices. It was like our trial run, um, testing out <laughs> our crew down there, training people. So it's really exciting uh, to have him here in Seattle. Yeah, I'm super stoked. The last time I was with him, uh, he was wearing a veil with uh, Bambi <laughs> Cantrell and doing some posing. So I know we're going to get a lot of craziness just like that in these next three days. So I think you, you're going to have to post, <laughs> post that photo again to social media. Yeah, I think I, think I might have to. Um, so you guys out there on the internet, we want to welcome to our workshop here today. Um, we're just going to do a few minutes of pre-show, so please let us know in our chat rooms whether you can hear us and see us properly. And uh, along with you guys out there, we also have a fantastic in-studio audience. So we're going to meet them. I'm going to pass it around. So uh, if you guys could let us know uh, where you're from, who you are, where we can find you online, and a little bit about why you're excited to be here for this workshop. And kind of while they do that, yep. I'm going to go check on the internet. Excellent. Um, so if you guys out there, let us know in the chat room who you are, why you're excited to be here today, and where you're watching from, so I can give you a shout out. So Dina, we'll go, let's go ahead and start with you, please. All right, my name is Dina Finley, and you can find me at dinafinley.com. That's D-E-N-A. And I am from Northern California, and I'm excited to be here because who wouldn't want to be a 10K wedding photographer? <laughs> Ks are good for our bottom line, so we're going to figure that out. <laughs> There's a quote. I think we can use that one uh, throw out. Uh, Scott Robert really likes that one already over there, so nice, Tina. Thank you. I am Rachel Farner and with Farner Photography, F-A-R-N-E-R, -E and that's farnerphoto.com. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I'm excited to be a 10K wedding photographer with my husband. Who is me? Uh, <laughs> nice. I, <laughs> I'm Michael. So yeah, we're, we're a husband and wife team, and we're from Salt Lake, and uh, we're super excited to be here because I really think that um, this is going to be the workshop that's going to give us the, the confidence to become the like, luxury brand that we both have dreamed about and want to become. I'm so glad you brought up that word already, uh, confidence because I think we're, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about um, not only the business sides, the posing sides, but also what it takes to own that you are a luxury brand. So I'm excited to, that you're already thinking that way, and you're in the right spot. Krista. Hi, I'm Krista Welch. Um, I've been here before. I sometimes uh, am sitting over there with Jim co-hosting. Um, I'm based in Seattle, and I just finished up my third season of Weddings. Um, and you can find me at lovesongphoto.com. Um, this class was really fascinating to me because pricing just, uh, I just don't even know where to start sometimes. I spend, I spend hours on it and then I just end up not really happy or satisfied with what I've, what I've come up with. So hopefully Scott can help. <laughs> well, we're definitely, definitely going to be talking about that because of course, as you're, if you are looking to be a 10K photographer, where do you start? That's a big question that people have, and we're definitely going to be uh, addressing that uh, for sure. So awesome. You're, again, you are in the right spot, and we're so happy to have you in the studio audience, <laughs> Krista. Hi, I'm Jerry Hughes. Um, you can find my work at fjhughes.com, and I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm here because of Scott, and that sounds really strange, but about a, a little over a year ago, Scott did a three-hour seminar in Seattle, um, one of our local camera stores put on. And as a result of that, I followed him on Facebook and Twitter and saw that he was doing this workshop in San Francisco with this Creative Life thing. Had never heard about it, even living here. Really? And that's how I got to know about Creative Life. That's and really cool because you've been here a number of times. Now this is my times. sixth time that exactly. I've been here. And so it introduced Thanks, me Scott to Robert. <laughs> introduced me to Creative Life, but more importantly, it really gave me his lighting seminar just kind of freed me um, to being able to, hey, I can do this without having a ton of equipment. And um, it's awesome. fun until I'm doing it full time now. So. Congratulations. Thank you, Scott. 
That's amazing. I love that. I love that, and I love that you're here to also share that story because we hear that story a lot online as well, but having that coming back full circle. Very cool. Very cool. Hi. Uh, my name is Khaled Said, uh, filmmaker, photographer, and I would really like to start in a wedding business, and I have seen his critique before, and it was really the feedback was really awesome, and I'm from San Francisco, came all the way to just to attend your workshop, so I'm really excited about that. Fantastic, welcome. Yes, uh, we did um, an autumn critique series, and uh, Scott Robert was, well, like you said, an amazing critiquer, and it's, it's uh, truly is all about the spirit of learning and helping people take that next step, so it, that, was, that was wonderful. Hi, I'm David Green, and I also came up here from San Francisco with this guy. Um, we've been working together for a few years um, producing documentary films at BehindTheRevolution.com. Ooh, I like that. Yes. BehindTheRevolution.com. And over the years, I've done a lot of photography and videography, um, things in fashion, things in portraiture. Um, and I've also done some event work. Uh, and I haven't really combined the two. And I'm really interested in seeing how those mesh and what the business model is around wedding photography and ideally the technique and how that integrates. Fantastic. That is a hot topic right now as well. So thank you both for coming up in San Francisco. You will have to now be students in our San Francisco studio as well, because we're always looking for students. So awesome. Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Cam McTaggart. Um, I'm a Seattle portrait and wedding photographer. Um, my business is Red Sparrow Photography. That's redsparrowphoto.com. Um, I'm really excited about this because I need to gain the confidence to charge what I need to charge. I've been full time in my business for a few years and I'm still not quite making a living from it. I really want to have the confidence to take it where it needs to go and uh, believe in it. Again. So glad to have you. You are a key part of the Creative Life family, so to have you in uh, the studio audience is quite a pleasure. So Thanks, happy Dan. to have you. All right, Dan, we just have a, a little bit of time to find out who is joining us online and, and what they're saying. Can I, people are chiming in from all over the world this morning. We have Staj saying, good morning from Toronto. Thank you so much, CL, for bringing Scott back. I'd like to say good morning to uh, Risotto from Macedonia, Phil from Rochdale, UK, and a special shout out to Motion from Norway. Good morning from Creative Live. Awesome, what time is it in Norway? We'll find out. We'll find out. So good evening, perhaps. Uh, maybe. I would imagine. But here it's 9 a.m. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I love uh, seeing and hearing, of course, the people that are joining us from all over the world. That is what makes Creative Live so very special here uh, in that people are watching all over and participating, and you here can ask your questions of Scott Robert Lim and, and be a part of this. So welcome again, everybody. All right, hey, I am very excited to be here. Um, I don't, shoot, I've got so much information just like in my brain right now, I don't even know where to begin. Because basically, you know what this course is? This is three days, right? But putting my 13 year career into three days and trying to jam everything that I've been through and what I've learned to try to tell you guys um, and share my story and that's what I'm, actually, that's what I really like about this class, is I'm able to share my story and how I became a wedding photographer. And when I was listening to you guys, uh, you know, each, the, the position that you are right now with your business and with your life, I could identify with almost every single one of you. And I got a little bit emotional because I go, ah, I remember when I was there. I remember that and feeling that, that uncertainty and wanting more for my life and my business and for my family. And so this is going to be exciting because I'm going to get to share um, some of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, and it's taken me a long time to get here. I started my photography career when I was 37 years old. And now that I'm 50, 
I kind of feel like I'm really just getting into who I am and where I want to go. So it's been really a long process for me. But I can't wait. So let's get into it. All right. Who is this workshop for? You know, it says, you know, the title is Think Like a 10K Wedding Photographer. Guess what? This is for everybody, not just those who want to be wedding photographers, but anybody who wants to improve their photography because we're going to talk about portraiture, okay, we're posing. We're going to talk about lighting. We're going to talk about business. We're going to talk about life skills, all that kind of stuff. And so anybody who's interested in learning to be a better photographer, you know, this class is going to be for them because I kind of feel like Wedding photographers are the most versatile photographers in the world. Because why? We've got to shoot product, right? We've got to do detail shots. We've got to deal with uh, portraiture. Uh, we've got to deal with photojournalism. We've got to deal with the crazy mother-in-law. <laughs> all that stuff, right? And we've got to do all this kind of stuff. Uh, we've got to deal with lighting. And we've got to do it all in one minute. And so it forces us to be very, very efficient at what we do. And um, so if you're just, you know, any, just anybody who wanted to improve their photography skills, this is the class for them. People who want to make money, OK? This is about making money. Uh, too, right? And, you know, hey, you've had all those other cl classes with the, you know, doing all the collage and the fine art stuff and all that's great, whatever, right? This is about making money, okay? Improving your life, improving the life of your family, moving forward, wanting a artistic career. And if you want an artistic career, eventually you're going to have to make some money. And this class is going to help you try to get there. Okay, photographers wanting to get to the next level. Anybody feel that? Anybody feel like, oh man, I've just been stuck at this plateau and I just can't get to that next level? You know, and you've been trying this and you've been trying that and nothing seems to be working. We're going to address those issues. Artists who want more out of life. Do you ever feel like handcuffed sometimes? Just uh, you, you're going to work, and you just feel like you're doing the same old thing again. And you're just not doing the creative things that you want to do. And I, I'll tell you this. As a creative, if you are a creative, and you're going to work every day, and you feel handcuffed like this, I'll tell you right now, a little bit of your soul is dying every day. You guys feel that way? It is a terrible, I've been there. And it is a terrible feeling. And you just want to be free to express yourself and to create. And on top of that, to earn a living, uh, to provide for yourself, to provide for your family, uh, that, all that. What will we be learning during these three days? One, valuable photography skills that earn money, <laughs> OK? I'm going to tell you these things. Don't argue with me. Just do it, because I know it's going to put money in your pocket. Okay? And so I'm going to uh, create these um, very easy skills to learn that will actually earn you money. Where to start and how to start with your wedding business. Maybe you're just like toying with the idea. Maybe I should be, maybe I should try wedding photography. But I have no idea where to start. I'm going to take it from ground zero and build it up and show you how to make $10,000, $20,000, whatever, $50,000 with your wedding photography. And this it is, how to book 1K, 5K, 10K weddings plus. You know, I had a goal for myself when I started this business. I said, listen, I want to earn over $10,000 with wedding photography. Not because I wanted to be rich or anything like that, but because it seemed like an amazing goal to have. Like, wow, if I could do that, if I could unlock those keys to earn 10,000 plus for a wedding, that would be a really an amazing growth experience for me. And on top of that, it was always been in my mind ever since, I think, high school that I wanted to be an educator. And I go, listen, 
if I can charge $10,000 for a wedding, maybe I can get a chance to help other people. And it has, and that's why I'm here. That is my one passion. My one passion in life, really, is to help people, help creatives especially, to, to kind of reach that excellence in their life, in everything, in their art, in their business, and that's what we're going to try to do this week. Maximize your potential. You know, uh, when you want to make a lot of money uh, with your business, it's not about secret skills and this and that and, oh, wow, I know the Scott Robert pose and that does it. It's, it's not that stuff. A lot of it is, is we become confronted with our shortcomings. It's evident. Why? Because we're not making as much money as we want, and it just shows it, and it puts it right in your face, and it's saying, something is missing, and you become confronted with it. Now, you either take those challenges right on and say, okay, I know that this is my shortcoming, and try to overcome that, but what a lot of people do is they see that, and they realize that the changes they need to go through um, is uncomfortable, so they stop and they rather fail. But I don't want that to happen to you guys. Uh, we're gonna talk about those issues, and we're gonna learn how to get past them so you can have that extraordinary life that you've always dreamed about. What makes this workshop different? Well, uh, my unique experience, first of all, uh, I've been a photographer for 13 years as a full-time photographer, not part-time, as a full-time. When I started my photography career, uh, I put myself in a really, a real desperate situation. The situation was, I started my photography career, I started a family, and my wife, who made all the money in our household, quit her job. So I had to get it done. So in my mind, uh, you know, at that time, we didn't have a heck of a lot of expenses. But in my mind, I said, listen, I'm going to do this thing. There, I have no other option. I have to make this work. And um, so these things that I've learned along the way, I think, I, I am confident I can help you. Because I've been through so much through my 13-year career. Um, before that, for 12 years, I was an entrepreneur. And that by itself is really hard. So I've been, I have 25 years of experience of working for myself. During the, hey, the Reagan years when everybody was making money. Uh, during the internet years, you know, the Clinton uh, or Gore, right? Gore discovered the internet, wasn't that right? But anyways, right? That, and, then, and then through the down years too, during the crashes. And I've, I've kind of had my career through all that. And I can tell you one thing. Your business is never, never, ever dependent on the economic situation. It always points back to us and what we're doing. Okay. Wax on, wax off. Anybody see Karate Kid? <laughs> right? And what I love about that movie is uh, Mr. Miyagi, right? Is that his name? He kind of boiled down his philosophy into this little saying, wax on and wax off. And that's what I like doing. I like taking something, that's what I feel that I'm gifted at. That I take something that's very, you know, complicated like flash. And I bring everything down to one little chart, right? And that's how I got famous with my lighting. And that's what I do with everything that I teach, especially wedding photography. It's a very complex subject. But like for my posing techniques, basically, I have basically two ideas. And I just go off of that. You know why? I'm a person with a terrible memory. I can't, I'm going to probably forget your names this week. I can't remember more than four things. And as I get older, it's getting harder and harder to remember things, right? Uh, plus, you know, going to the bathroom more often, too. But anyways, uh, I have a hard time memorizing, like, 
a bunch of things. So I have to break down everything into very simple concepts that I can base my entire technique off of. And that's what I can't wait to show you guys. Um, ooh, it's going to hurt so good. <laughs> I'm going to affirm your potential, t but I'm also going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to just lay it out there and I'm going to confront you with some things. And it may hurt a little bit, but that's okay. We're family here. We can talk about it and we can get through it because it's about making us better. Okay? And sometimes that hurts. If you want to look back on your life and you want to see like the greatest areas of growth in your life, it's probably when you've been struggling with something and you've overcome it. So we can't be afraid of those moments of hurt. Hurt means that you actually care. So it's okay to hurt. And we should keep feeling that because that means we care. We still want to be in the game. We still want more out of our life. So feel the hurt. Accept it, acknowledge it, and move on from it. Okay, it's very personal. Everyone can learn from a good success story. And that's really, like I said before, that's what these three days is about. It's my story. My story on how I went from zero to 10,000 plus, and even my story on how I'm even here in front of, I mean, I can't believe it. I mean, I, you know, as I said in my crazy stupid light, as I introduced myself, I claim to be the one and only Asian college dropout. Okay, I am claiming that. <laughs> There was a lot of pressure being an Asian growing up and having professional careers and stuff like that. And then to drop out of college and to become an artist, oh my gosh, right? But uh, I love it. I love the artist lifestyle. And I'm just going to be happy to share my story with you. And I can't wait. OK. So let's get into it. Let's, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the industry. OK? How many weddings in the USA uh, I don't know about Norway or I don't know anything about it, but let's just deal with the USA right now. Uh, how many weddings do you think there are in the USA every single year? Anybody? Take a guess. Anybody? 20? 100? 1,000? 2 million. 2 million, okay. Anybody else? 800,000. 800, All right, you, you curious? <laughs> yes. yes. You have to know how many weddings, what this industry is like. If you're going to get into it, you kind of have to know these facts before you get into it. There's about 2.3, wow, awesome guess, <laughs> a year. What is the average cost of a wedding? Now, if you've been in the business for a little while, you probably kind of know this already. But how much does a couple and their parents <laughs> spend on a wedding? What's the average? What, what kind of money are they dishing out? Anybody? Take a guess. 27,000. 27,000, okay. I think around here it's like 35,000. 35,000, okay. Good. Any other guesses? Man, you guys are really good. $28,400. <laughs> That's a lot of change there. What is the average cost? of photography. <laughs> so how much does the average client spend on their photography and their video? Anybody know? Yeah. Take a guess. Six thousand. Six thousand. Wow. Average. Two Your thousand. kids married yet? I had one get married this year. <laughs> <laughs> how come I wasn't hired? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody sure else? What's that? Because you're above average. Because I'm above average, okay. <laughs> I would have gave you a deal. Uh, We've got the chat room is chiming it. Chiming oh, they in. are? Okay. And so uh, Schrader Photography says 2K, and Indy John agrees with the 6K. Whoa. And Max wow. Soto says 3,000, as does Rutger Photography. 3K. 2,800, okay. we're getting in. 2,500. Okay. Well, here it is. 2,379 for photography. And 1600 bucks for video, OK? So I guess if you add up photography and video, it's almost about that four, well, what's that, 4,000? Interesting. 
how, what is the average age of a bride and groom? Who are we dealing? What is our target client looking like? How old are they? Does anybody know? 25? <laughs> Under 25. Under 25? 27. Late 20s. 27? Late 20s. Late 20s, okay. Well, here we go. 25 and 27. And so if we're going to get into this business, we kind of have to think like a 25-year-old and a 27-year-old, right? We have to know who we're dealing with. What is the average household income of the bride and groom? How much money do they make? So we kind of have to know that. We have to kind of know like how much their household income is, you know, just to know general pricing things and how much they could afford, right? What do you guys think? Six together, combined. Seventy. Seventy thousand. Sixty thousand. Sixty thousand. Eighty-five. Yeah. Eighty-five. Wow. Okay. <laughs> You guys are great, man. I don't even need to have these stats up here. $60,000. How many photographers are there in your area? Now, I do not know everybody's area, but I just did my own area, okay? Too many, yeah. which I, I live in the uh, Los Angeles area, which according to Wikipedia is the second most densest city in America. Okay, so there's a lot of, there's like 15 million uh, people in my general area that I live in. Okay, there's a lot of people and it's growing. So I guess the trends are nowadays is that the most populated cities are getting even more populated. So everybody's moving out of the rural areas and moving into the cities. So it's getting denser and denser. That's what the trend is. Okay, so in my area, in the U.S. Census, oh, okay, how many photographers? The U.S. Census said that there's 152 full thousand full-time photographers. Okay, but it, just because you're not full, to, anybody here, who, who's here a full-time photographer? Raise your hand. That's what you do. Okay, so that's only three out of what, eight people? So if this 152,000 that we're going against is a lot more than 152, right? Would you not agree? A lot of times when I'm speaking and let's say there's a room of 100 people and I'll say, okay, who in here is a full-time photographer? That's what they earn their money. They support themselves and their family with their photography only. A lot of times only one or two people will raise their hand out of 100. So most of the photographers that are in this industry are hobbyists or serious uh, or part-timers. So I'm assuming, and, and those people we're competing against too, right? It's not that we're competing against just the full-timers, we're competing against the part-timers also. So if you think about it, I, in general, I'm saying there's probably a half a million to a million uh, photographers mm -hmm. out there, uh, maybe even more, but I'm just being kind of conservative with that, okay? So in California, we have about 10% of the po population, okay? So if you live in California, about 10% of the U.S. lives in the state of California. The state of California is huge. It's like, you know, seven states on the East Coast, but, <laughs> okay? And then I broke it up. There's about, uh, uh, so in between California, right, uh, maybe there's about 50,000 to a million photographers just in California. And then I broke it up even more. 20% live in San Francisco, and 40% live in the Los Angeles area that I'm from. Okay, so if I go back down, I would think that there's 10 to 20,000 photographers that I'm competing against in the San Francisco area, and there's about 20,000. Oh, okay, so if I broke it down, according to Wikipedia <laughs> here, and because of my, uh, I used to be a math major, I figured out that there's 20 photographers per square mile in the San Francisco area, okay? Now, let's go to Los Angeles, which is the second most densest city in America, and this is where I have to compete, okay? 40K in a 600 square mile area, there's 66 photographers per square mile, okay? So if I'm willing to drive an hour to go to a job, I am covering, what, 60 square miles? And so what's 60 times 660, which is almost 400 photographers. 
just driving an hour. But sometimes some people will drive two hours. Will you drive more than one hour to a job? Maybe you'll drive two hours to a job. I've, I've done jobs in Los Angeles where I've driven two hours to a job. Okay, now I'm competing against almost a thousand photographers. Okay? That's your competition. You have to understand what you're up against. Okay? And when I put it into that light, 66 freaking photographers per mile, I'm like, oh my. Either makes you want to quit. <laughs> Or really makes you want to, you know what? I need to up my game because this is serious here. I got to provide for myself. I got to provide for my family. I've got to get good. I've got to be above my competition. Okay, so how many weddings in California? That's good. So I know that there's 66 photographers per square mile, but then how many weddings are, are there? And let's figure that out. Well, there's 180,000 marriage certificates issued in California. So if I break that up again, uh, 35,000 roughly in San Francisco, 70,000 people in Los Angeles area are getting married. Uh, and then, so 35,000 weddings, 20,000 photographers, right? 70,000 weddings in Los Angeles, around my area and 40,000 photographers, what does all this mean? It means about two or three weddings per photographer. That's conservatively. Can we live off of two or three weddings? Maybe if we're making $50,000 a wedding or $100,000 a wedding, yeah, that's, that's cool. But two or three, that's average. So hey, pat yourself on the back. Anybody doing more than two or three weddings a year here? Okay, guess what? You're over average. <laughs> Congratulations. But that's not the point. That's not the point to get a like because you're over average. It's we need to be way over average. We need to make money. We need more than that to survive. Okay. So, hey, how would you like to know the top five wedding locations? This, I, this has really nothing. I just threw this in because I found this stat. I thought, well, it could it'd be interesting to know where, the, where people spend the most money on weddings. Anybody have any ideas? The top five. Go ahead. Go for it. Las Vegas. Las Vegas, okay. Hawaii. Hawaii. I think you just want to go to Hawaii, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and why wouldn't I? <laughs> Anybody else? New York. New York. Napa Valley area. Napa Valley area, okay. Any other suggestions? What about any, any, anything on the internet? Any people, anybody we're, we're, chime in? We're, yeah, we're yeah. chiming okay. in, chiming in. Okay, so we'll start off at number five, Boston. Boston. Wow. Interesting. Yes, $39,000 per wedding average that they spend there. So you can think of it, a lot of times they kind of say in general that the bride will spend 10% of their budget on, a wedding, on their wedding photographer. So if you look at that 39,000, oh wow, maybe Boston averages $4,000 a wedding there. Not bad. And Scott but Roberts? Also, oh yeah, go ahead. Well now we have them rolling in. <laughs> okay, so you gotta roll in. Before you reveal the, the next okay, four, yes. we have uh, San Francisco, Niagara Falls, Jamaica, uh, Jamaica. Mexico, New York, we got, Greece, we got Paris. Paris, um, San Fran, Mexico, yep, Rome. Oh, well, Rome. you know what? I only did United States. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to convert from the euro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't, that, that Jamaica one is interesting. You know why? Because directly after this workshop, I'm doing a workshop in Jamaica. So, oh, hey. hey. <laughs> All right. We're getting okay. a lot of Florida as well. Lower Florida. Okay. Well, Boca, let's, Miami. Let's yeah. find out. Okay. It, I mean, the suspense <laughs> is killing me now. <laughs> Santa Barbara, Ventura, California. How would you like that? That comes in at $42,000 away. I got to do more weddings up there. Shoot. <laughs> That's only a couple hours drive for me up there. Okay. New Jersey. Huh? $49,000. Chicago. Nobody said Chicago. I love Chicago. I was just, that's where I bought this jacket in Zara in Chicago. It's a great city. Um, number one, Manhattan. 77 
thousand. You know what? If you're a New York photographer, you, you should easily be making ten thousand dollars a wedding. It's not even fair. Because look at how much. The, of course, your cost of living is extraordinary. Uh, but well, probably not that much more than Seattle or San Francisco or whatever, right? But seventy-seven thousand dollars per wedding average. Oh my gosh, they got, make a lot of money over there. That is crazy. See all the money that's being thrown out in the wedding business? The wedding business is a six to eight billion dollar business. Okay? Do, do you have any idea of what six to eight billion dollars is? Well, I didn't. So I looked up on the internet what, what kind of businesses generate six to eight billion dollars, and one that I found was the National Football League. So what, that's the number one most popular sport in America for all you guys out there in Norway and uh, Australia, whatever, NFL. That's what we, our football is, a little bit different than we call soccer or whatever. Okay, anyways, uh, that, okay, our sport generates, that sport generates probably, I think it was in 2006 it generated about $6 billion, so now it must be more. So it's, it's relatively the, on the same scale. All the money generated, the jersey sales, the ticket sales, the licensing, the, the commercials on the Super Bowl, whatever, is the same amount of money that's in the wedding business. Okay, with all this money floating around like that, the competition is always going to be high. When there's high dollars at stake, that means everybody and their aunt is getting into the, trying to grab a piece of the pie. It's a huge industry. We have to realize that. You have to realize your competition and what you're up against. Okay, the lowest. That's a good one. Alaska, right? So if you get any weddings over there, you know, you want to try to be a little bit above average there. <laughs> okay? Okay, so. Oh, this is a good one. I didn't know this stat. How much does, do they spend, like if, if I was planning a wedding, let's say my daughter's getting married, how much would I spend per guest at a wedding? That's a good one, huh? I never, I really didn't know that, but what, what is the average cost per guest? And I'm going to use this information when I, when I talk to my clients or I pitch to them knowing this information. Right? Two hundred and four. Yeah, that's what I said. Average, Average cost per person wow. at a wedding is two hundred dollars. So what if you're a thousand dollars more? Just invite five less people, and then you can afford me, <laughs> right? That information is handy. Yeah. I just. I mean, that blows me away. First of all, uh, Scott Robert, I've never seen anybody teach this information on Creative Live, so that's really cool. <laughs> By the way, just thinking about it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, but to think that so many people are out there charging $200, $300, $500 even to shoot a wedding when they're uh -huh. spending $200 on each guest, yeah. that blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Yes. That actually gives me more confidence. It does. Doesn't it? It does. It's like $200 per guest. Man, come on. I'm only $500 away and you're complaining? Man, just invite two less people. But I kind of bring that into my business. I don't say it like that to sure, my clients. Of <laughs> <laughs> but I do, when we'll talk about business later, I do bring up, like, you know, I'll say something like, okay, well, you know, I know, yes, you like it, my style, and I'm a little bit over more than what you wanted to spend. But when you consider the totality of how much that you're spending on your wedding day, you know, to get everything that you want and peace of mind, it's really not that much more. So I do kind of use this information in my pitch to kind of reposition and renegotiate yourself because you know how much they're spending. You know generally how much they're making. And with that information, you could be logical in your assessments and um, have confidence about pitching uh, your wedding prices. But it's good information to know. Yeah. Okay, average cost of a wedding, we talked about that as well, 28,000. Average cost of video is, is 1,600. And actually, this is going up because I remember when I first started, uh, 
this average cost of video used to be very low, like $1,000. But now with these amazing DSLRs that um, can shoot, you know what, uh, major film quality uh, for people, that uh, people are really, uh, brides and grooms are really starting to get high quality video now and they're spending more money on it. Um, so this, this, this actually is taking away from photography too because it, it's becoming a must, but now you consider, can consider Combining it with your service, perhaps, right? The average cost of a wedding uh, photography is about $2,300. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an overview of things. Does anybody have any questions about these stats or anything like that before? Scott, we do yeah. have one question um, from BR Photography. Could you just let us know where, where the best place to research this type of information for the photographers out there? Where did you find this information? Um, you, give any hints to that? It's, you can look on the internet and whatever, but I actually, someone paid to get this information and loaned it to me to look at. So that's how I, <laughs> I found it. Okay. But you can, you know, on the Nod or sites, they'll mention that you have to put it together. Yeah. You have to, you know, be a math major. No, <laughs> just kidding. I also appreciate how you kind of you worked backwards, and so yeah. for the people asking, how do I find this out about the the number of people in my area? I mean, take a look at what you did and and look at just, those for your same yeah, area. just kind of break. I mean, break you down. know what? This is just general. I mean, don't like quote me on this or whatever. This is just gen. I, we just want to get an idea of the industry, and this is what it does. The, I hope, hope these numbers kind of help you with that. Okay, so the, the kind of wedding photography prices, you know, people say, oh man, it's getting worse out there, people aren't paying, uh, the, the brides want more, and uh, you know, oh man, it's getting bad, right? What is the cause of that? One of it has been better camera technology, quite frankly, that these things are making it easier and easier to get good exposures. Okay, so what the question that I, uh, digital made acceptable wedding photography very easy. And what I posed in the good old days when I kind of started, in the film days, how many of you would shoot a wedding, and I pose this to the audience out there, if you couldn't look at the back of your camera, would you shoot a wedding? Okay, that's what I was dealing with when I, you know what, this is crazy. When I first started my wedding career, I would not get hired if I shot digital. There was the, com the customer confidence in digital was very low. Film is better, film is, oh wait. I mean, I've got turned down on jobs that I said that I used digital. So I, I just said I used film too, and I just shot both, okay? And that's how it was back then. Now it's completely opposite. Well, not opposite, but it's different, right? So guess what? Back in the glory years, the 90s and the 80s, when there was no such thing as digital, everybody and their aunt was making money with wedding photography. I mean, it was a lot easier because all these people dropped out. But now, because of technology and making it real easy to get a good exposure, Everybody's coming in, and because that there's more competition, the lower the price. Okay? Most brides with an average budget do not demand world-class imagery. Okay? That's true. That's like, you know what? I have a lot of friends that come up to me and say, uh, Scott, you know, I am getting married, but I'm just going to let you know I ain't hiring you because uh, you're too expensive for me. I go, oh, pfft, hey, that's fine. Guess what? I can't even afford myself either. So... <laughs> Hey, whatever you got to do, that's fine. Hey, just that, don't worry about it, right? So um, if you got a Toyota budget, you can't expect them to buy a Mercedes, okay? So someone's planning their wedding, 
And uh, right, they're going to buy a car, right? And let's say they walk into a Mercedes dealership, and they got $15,000 to spend on a car. That salesman could go to them and say, hey, listen, you need a Mercedes. It's higher quality. It's got better resale value. You're going to be safer in this car. It's going to be a nice ride. It's only $80,000 for this car. Uh, this person only has $15,000. Do you want to force them to buy a Mercedes? We can't. We have to deal with what maybe the reason why they only have $1,500 to spend on you, the photographer, is because they're flying their grandmother in from Taiwan, and they're spending $3,000 for that. So we're going we gonna to get mad at this person? Hey, bride, you need to spend more money on your wedding photography. No, that is their choice. We don't have a right to tell a person how to spend their money. If they only want to spend money, $500 on the wedding, let them. We can't judge them on that. We can't judge the way people spend money. So if they got a Toyota budget, they got a Toyota budget. That's fine. That's, that's, let them be. Okay? Videos hogging up more much of what I talk about. Here's another um, reason. No industry standards. Okay? What does it take to be a wedding photographer? What are the qualifications? There's no certification. That's the thing. I even hear some people do it with an iPhone. You know, yes. The quality of, of digital nowadays, they can do crazy things. I would like to try to do that. You can hire me for $1,000. I'll go photograph your wedding in an iPhone. The iPhone 5S is the, really awesome. Have you seen that? <laughs> You'll even put like an Instagram filter on it for them. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 know, I saw that. It was actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no, that, it's crazy. But yeah. yeah, there's no certification. You know, my, my career before um, photography is, is actually an interpreter for the deaf. Mm -hmm. And we have industry standards. We have certifications. Mm -hmm. We have boards. We have yes. all of this to protect our profession. But in the wedding, uh, wedding photography industry, there's just not. College certification usually creates industry standards, and it keeps a price level there because they have standards. So we don't have any standards. And that's the reason why <laughs> the price is all freaking all over the place, right? Can't teach photography uh, in a college format, really. Uh, because the way we learn, let's say, engineering, it's like facts. It's like formulas. It's like real, okay, you know, this wall is going to fall down. You need to support it with this, R right? Art is completely different learning process. And the college format is not suited to really teach. You know what I kind of see? I wish it was back in the medieval times on the way people learn things. How did they learn things back then? Like making shoes or something like that. What did you do back in the medieval times before the internet? Apprentice. What? Apprenticeships. Apprenticeships, right? You studied under a master. And, oh, anybody see that movie, Dreams of uh, Sushi or whatever that one is, Jiro that documentary? Yeah. What's it called? Jiro, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Jiro Dreams of that's, that's awesome, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's exactly what it is. This dude is the master sushi chef of the world. I mean, it takes you six months just to even to, to get into his dining room to eat. The waiting list is that long, right? And that's, I mean, and so his apprentice, he's really hard on his, his uh, people who he's training and he's developing them. That's really the model, I think, for photography, something like that, not college. And we'll, and we'll see how the college has been failing in this area, bringing all the industry down. Okay, over 50% of the photographers are self-employed because to get paid, because um, we're not businesses, right? It's not like, oh, Hewlett Packard today, is, is, this year's hiring 1,000 photographers. That doesn't happen. If you're a photographer, you're self-employed. And which is actually, you have to become an entrepreneur. It's very, okay, so first of all, I gotta learn all my photography crap, and then you're telling me I gotta learn about business too? Right? A lot of times an engineer doesn't have to deal with that issue, or an accountant or anybody. They learn what they are and then they work for somebody, but photographers is different. Most of us have to learn the business also, which makes it very hard. 
Okay? Average salary. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> what are the national figures for the U.S.? If you said, if you wrote down on your income that you were a photographer, how much money you made. If that was your primary career, you wrote that down, and these are the numbers taken from that, how much do you think the average photographer makes in America? 25,000. Any other guesses out there? You know what? Uh, uh, Internet's saying 40. 40, okay. 40, 40K, that's their first chime in. 40K. Hey, does anybody know on average what the average person makes in America? Do you guys even know that? The average person in America makes $38,000 a year. If you have a college degree, you make about 48000 Okay? So, given that numbers, what do you think that is? Any other guesses out there? Okay. We're, we're getting Confucius Jones says twelve thousand. We've got fifty k. Uh, Jamie says thirty two k. Okay. Thirty five k. Glamour Lit Photography Wackadoodle. Thirty k. <laughs> Here it is, folks. A whopping twenty nine thousand dollars. You see, our current education system, the college system, did such an amazing job teaching photography that you actually earn $10,000 less than somebody going working at Home Depot. <laughs> wow. Don't, this gets me hot. I am very upset about this. Because you know how much money these colleges charge to earn a degree and say, hey, we're going to get you a photography degree, and then you come out? and you're earning $10,000 less than the average person, they're doing a terrible job. It's failing. That's why there's so much chaos in the industry, because there's no standard. But guess what? There's hope. The top 10% earn $62,000 a year. So what is that telling you? You got to be at least at the top. At, the top. at least. <laughs> I mean, if you want to have a family, if you live in a very, you know, uh, popular, populated place, like on the West Coast of San Francisco or New York or wherever, that's like you're still at the poverty level earning $60,000 a year, um, you know, in, in some of these places, if you lived in Manhattan. So what is that telling you? Wow. I've got to be good. I've got to be better than at least... If there's 100 photographers in the room, you got to be better than 90 of them, at more than that. Maybe in that 100, you got to be the top one or two photographers. So when you go, anybody go to these conventions like WPPI and PPA? Any of you? Raise your hand. Okay. You're walking around there. You're looking at all those photographers, and you got to say, hey, i got to be one out of 1,000 right here, all these people. <clears throat> That should inspire you. That should like put a little fire in you and say, hey man, I gotta get it going. All right. Is wedding photography worth the effort? <laughs> well, uh, just a great downer. I brought everybody down now. Forget this class, bloop. All these people just like, hey, learn about wedding photography. Okay, guess what? Wedding photography is great supplemental income. It's everybody. I would say there's a 99% rate on a success rate on those who want to earn money with wedding photography. Anybody can do it. Extra money here and there. It's not very hard to do. But it's very, 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 very difficult to do it full time. And guess what? That's my passion. My passion is for this crazy person here who wants to go and beat the odds and they just feel it in their gut and I go I don't this is sounds stupid but I think I can do this I'm for you that's because that was me and I that's my passion that's my burden that's why I'm here that's why I'm so happy that I'm here it's because I get to share my secrets on how that person can make it the middle is shrinking. And what I mean by that is there's low cost wedding photography, um, okay, which is like, say, $1,000 or left, less. There's the middle, which is average. So, what's the average cost of photography? 24. 20, okay, that's the middle. And then there's the high end. 
right, which I consider 5,000 and above, okay, which is luxury branding yourself. This middle part, it's dying. It's going away. It's hard to stay in this middle section. If you're a wedding photographer in this middle section, you've got two choices. You're either going to go back down to this level or you have to come up or else you're going to go out of business real quick. And I'm going to explain why this is going to be happening a little bit, um, uh, why this middle string, and that's why it's important. So if you're there, if you're at average level, you need to move quickly out of that area depending on, on what your commitment level is and how much time you have. You may consider going back down or going up, but you can't stay in this middle. I see it. I mentor photographers around the world, and I know that this is true. Okay, so is it the best job in America? Well, I put it to you this way, okay? If someone were to go up and offer you a job, and I said, you know what, your job is only eight hours a week, okay? And you got paid, all you had to do is work eight hours a week, and you got four weeks of vacation, and you made $36,000 a year, which is the average what people make in America, generally, 38,000. How many people would be interested in this job? Sora, especially if it was part-time. Couldn't you do your full-time job and do that? This is a nice little bonus, isn't it? Right? Okay, so um, guess what that is? That's doing a shoot and deliver wedding for $750. Okay? Guess what? So that's literally charging $750, shooting the wedding, wedding, and handing over the files. Is that possible to do that in this industry? Are people doing that? Well, I know it's possible because I charge $3,500, and so I know for a fact somebody can get $75, $750. What's the average cost of photography? $2,500. So there would be a lot of people out there for $750 that would do that. Has anybody, you, um, well, I don't want to put you on the spot or whatever, but has anybody done these types of shoot and deliver types of weddings out there? Yeah, okay, so how much did you get? I've done it for as low as 200 when I first got it started. Okay. 500 bucks, so yeah. Yeah, right? So you see that this is possible, yeah. right? So if that's possible, let's say you got good enough to charge $1,500 just shoot and deliver. Mm -hmm. You would be making $72,000 a year working eight hours a week. Yes! I feel that wedding photography is the best job in America. Despite all that other stuff that I talked about, there's some real opportunity here because it's out there, okay? And so I know we get this, well, to shoot and deliver degrade the industry. Oh, gosh. I get that all the time. Well, listen. The, t the market determines the worth of any product. The market does. It thrives or fails depending on demand. Okay, now listen, I have a Apple iPad. Okay, they're usually twice as expensive as the other brands aren't there. So are you telling me that there's not a place, oh gosh, you should just buy Apple because they're most expensive. Don't buy those other brands, they're, they're cheaper, right? Can you tell people that? No, the market tells you whether or not that other brand is valid. And so they, they just get rid of, hey, listen, you gotta, you gotta provide for your family, man. If it's there and it's available, you gotta do it. Sometimes you just gotta do things because the mortgage is due, okay? And we just gotta do it. We gotta put the pride in the pocket, and we gotta say, I gotta feed my family to this month, and go out there and do it. Okay? Never judge the way someone can earn a decent living. You can't do that. That person has to make money doing that. Let them do it. And if it's there, why not? How we earn money with photography doesn't have to 100% reflect our art. We're just trying to be an artist and stay alive. Okay? I mean, you know, we're not looking to be millionaires. We just want to provide for ourselves and our family and, and do this. And if this helps, 
I can pay my bills, and then maybe it funds me to do my creative jobs on the side that I might not make any money at, or I might have to do that for 20 years until I actually be recognized. I just need to stay in the game. Wedding photography helps you stay in the game, and that's why I love it. I mean, you don't have to look at it at all as this amazing art form all the time, but it really helps you stay in the game. Okay, full-time career as an artist is the hardest job in the world. It t totally is. Think of, if you want to think of prestigious careers and all that, think of all the doctors and the lawyers that you know, okay, in your mind, that you've run across, okay? Now think of all the full-time artists that you know. Very, 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 very few, okay? This is the hardest job in the world to be an artist, okay? So it's going to require a different mentality if you want to enter this field. I kind of feel like it's the same as if you wanted to be a professional athlete. If you wanted to be a professional athlete, um, well, what you have to do, it's the same process. Okay. Earning top dollar with wedding photography. Don't expect overnight ex success. The fairy sto tale story doesn't ex exist. I, I, you know, we see it on our blogs and we know these amazing photographers that go, well, that photographer has only been doing it for two years and they're making $10,000 a wedding. You know what? Guess what? That don't happen. Yeah, it happened to that person, but it's like winning the lottery. Do you know anybody who's won the lottery? Right? That's a special situation. It's not an overnight success thing. It's got to work really hard at that. For not, photography is not a second-class career, and don't treat it that way. Okay? The average cost of becoming a dentist is $450,000 with all the schooling that you have to take. Eight years of your life to earn an average of $145,000. Now, if I just told you that uh, being an artist is one of the hardest careers in the world, and you know that a, an, a dentist does that, spends $500,000 into their career in eight years, what do you think it's going to take with your photography? It's not, it's harder than that, okay? Respect the photography industry. Respect it. Don't just come in and say, oh, I'm going to try this for a year and I'm going to earn a living. That's disrespecting all of us who do this for a full-time living. It's difficult, man. It's the best job in the world, but it's hard. My story. Well, how did I get to be where I went? Well, if you, I think about my story. Twelve years as an entrepreneur making no money at all. Three years into photography before I started really being able to provide for my family. Somebody had to keep me alive, right? I just can't exist off of no money. So I, I figure in the bare minimum to get where I needed to go, 15 years of just being lost and a total loser, my wife had to support me. She is an angel. Okay? I don't know any other person that would do this. But she, I mean, I get emotional talking about this, believed in me for 15 years me not making anything. She invested me on an average, I would think, about $450,000 or a million because she had to keep me alive, feed me, all that stuff. That's my story. I invested a half million dollars into myself in 15 years of my life to get here. Okay? And that's going to be, you're going to see, I study success patterns and that is typical of of what it takes to be at a world-class level. Decades of work. It doesn't come overnight. It takes five to seven years being top in your industry, and that's with high-end knowledge, okay? Trying it yourself, it's gonna be longer, but that's why you're here in this course, okay? 10,000 hour rule, outliers, that book, they say that it takes you at least 10,000 hours to do something, to, be well, to do it well, which is what? That's five years, eight hours a day. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, me, since I didn't have a mentor, I didn't have Creative Live, you know, where you can hear all these amazing world-class lectures just tell you, do this, do that. I didn't have that. The internet was hardly even invented by the, when I was is in there. It took me 30,000 hours to get my act together. 
30,000. That's what it took me. Okay, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is don't be afraid to invest yourself. So if you're thinking in your mind right now, oh my gosh, I am $30,000 in debt because I went onto Scott Roberts' website and I bought all his lighting gear. Oh my gosh. If you're serious, don't worry about it. It's typical for any business, for any legitimate career. What would you do if you went to college, right? How much would you spend? All that kind of stuff. Uh, don't worry about it. If you want to keep believing in yourself and pushing forward, you will make it. But you've got to just pay your dues. That's all. Invest in yourself. Okay, so I'm going to teach you about targeting the fanatic, and that's where you want to go. There's basically three types of brides, right? There's the budget Bessie, what I call, which is around the $1,500 area, right? There's the average Annie, which is around that 25 to 35. And then there is Fiona the fanatic, <laughs> who wants to spend 5000 That's what we're talking about these three days, is how to get to that person there. What makes Fiona the fanatic tick? What's in her psyche? And how do you market to yourself to that person? And that's what we're going to go over. OK, so um, let's see here. Creating a luxury band, that's what we're doing, earns you five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 and beyond. Like, you know, I say 10K, but there's plenty of photographers who've been, who make $50,000 a wedding. It's there. It's possible. Okay? Um, the more profitable your business, the more perfect it must be. Okay? The more profitable it is, the more perfect that you must be. What? In your skills, in your posing, in your lighting, in your product, right? In your business and marketing, in your time management, in your life skills. So the bigger the goal, that's why I love, that's why I love people wanting to take on the challenge of being an entrepreneur. Because it's one of the hardest things to do it. And if we can do it, in the process of going and doing that, we become a better person. And that's what I love about it. Those who want to develop themselves into people who are better. Better at everything better at their job, better with their family, better with earning a living and giving. My whole thing is make as much freaking money as you can. Do it. If you don't need a lot of it, why don't you just give it away? It's better us giving it away than somebody else giving it away, right? Okay. Creating a great business is taking on a journey of perfection. That's what you're doing. It's I, the higher the goal, the more we're going to have to refine ourselves to be better. And that's what it is. I want to very quickly go, and we can talk about this tools of the trade. What is my wedding gear about? What, what do I have in my, what do I use? What camera should I buy? Full frame or crop sensor? Definitely full frame. Go to full frame. As, as fast as you can, and even if you have to buy used full frame, do it. Look it. You can get a Canon 5D for under $1,000. Guess what? I'm going to pose this. This is the reason why you can get involved with these chat room things, because guess what? Go in there, those chat rooms, and you got an old 5D that's amazing laying around your house. Sell it to somebody for 500 bucks. I'm going to challenge somebody to do that in the chat room, right? Get in there and start selling your older stuff that you have and allow people to buy this stuff at some amazing pri uh, prices. Go in there and have fun with that stuff, right? OK, look it. Under 5,000 of 5D, right? But the issue is the ISO quality is maybe around 800 
at most before you start entering into a lot of grain. Not a big issue, but it's, it's there. The reason why I say full frame is that they make different types of lenses for crop sensor and full frame. So if you start off with an entry level crop sensor and you buy a bunch of lenses for it, guess what? You're screwed. Because now you've got to dump all those lenses and you've got to buy new lenses. Uh, so that's why I said it's, it's a trap when they get you into crop sensor. Start off at full. And so the lenses that you buy, you can keep forever and use them the entire course instead of redoing that every year. Okay? The next level is, look at under 1500. I'm sure somebody in that chat room right now has an amazing Canon 5D that they will sell for under $1,000. I'm challenging somebody in that chat room to give somebody a break and sell their 5D for under $1,000. I've seen them for $900 out there, full frame. It's a great camera. Uh, you know, I, at one time I was shooting Canon. I had this camera. I could have probably used it for the rest of my career. It's, it's a decent camera. That ISO level is about 1600 or so. I love it. Okay? Um, and now you're going to get them the bad boys in 2000 plus. And you're going to have all these full frame uh, cameras out. Now they're getting lower, around $2,000 for a 6D or the Nikon uh, D610. I used the, the Sony A99, which is about $2,700, but they're giving these amazing, I'm not sure if they're doing now, but they have these amazing packages. So actually, the camera's coming out to be about $2,000 if you get it's bundled with all this other stuff. And that, I love that camera, the A99. And so the performance on this stuff is freaking ridiculous. I mean, like, you don't even care about ISO. 3200 and above, I mean, you can shoot in the dark with these cameras, and they'll still show something. It's amazing, this new, but it's going to cost you a little bit more. So that's what I recommend. Okay, so overall, you need five types of lenses, okay? And I, this, is what I, this is my suggested collection here. You need a wide angle lens, you need a medium range, you need a long lens, you need a portrait lens and low light lens, and you need a macro lens to do wedding photography. You don't have to have them all, but eventually you should have all these ranges covered. And so sometimes if you don't have, let's say in the wide category, I'm suggesting having a 16 to 35, those cost about $2,000. I'm sorry. Uh, you might not have $2,000. Well, there's other options for you. OK, you can get a prime lens uh, there, uh, 17 or a 24 millimeter that has in there. Well, 24 millimeters are very high. But there's options for you there. Same thing with the medium. There's all these different options that you can do. But in general, you should have all those five different types of lenses, OK? Um, then I can show pictures of these, right, this is wide. This is 16 millimeters, so you want to cap, hey, you're, hey, Jim, Hawaii. You get a wedding in Hawaii, you want to show that beautiful landscape, you got to have something wide. You want something medium, uh, so you could uh, be a versatile lens, uh, 24 to 70. Uh, these are the types of photos that you can get from that range. You also want a long to go in there. Let's say you're doing a first dance and you're standing at the edge of the, uh, the floor and you can zoom in and you get that nice blurred background zooming in. Uh, you should have that too. Portrait lens and low light. So 50 millimeter. There is no excuse why you shouldn't have a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. Why? It's like $100, okay? It's cheap. Just ha I'm going to show you some award-winning images that I took with $100 lenses, OK? Oh, in fact, actually, that one there on the right of the girl, uh, we were in, uh, where were we, the Bahamas there? Uh, or somewhere like that. That's a $200 lens, OK? So whatever. Uh, low light lens. We need to have that at a portrait. Macro lens. Now, what's amazing about my the new cameras in the Sony has this. I don't know if the other brands have this, but they have a macro feature. So my camera turns a macro lens out of any lens that I put on it. Also, what I love about this camera is that image stabilization is built into the body. So I don't know if you know that, but Sony bought out Minolta. Guess what? I can go online and nobody cares about Minolta autofocus lenses. For <laughs> 
I'm buying them on eBay. Oops, now everybody's buying them. But, uh, and putting it on my camera, and it's got image stabilization built into it already. Okay? And so that's awesome. Um, so anyways, but you've got to have a macro lens to do these types of photos. My camera is just built in whatever lens I put on it, which is a nice feature. Okay. What's my temp typical wedding equipment list? Okay, this is going to get lengthy here. I, you know, personally nowadays, I just like going to a wedding with a 24 millimeter prime and an 85 millimeter prime and shooting the whole darn thing, especially if the ceremony, if I don't have, if it's a smaller size venue, I can get away just shooting that. Or what I do is like, Tell my assistant, you put, this, you put the 70 to 200 on. You can, you know, like hurt your back. Not me. <laughs> I'm going to put the 85 and the 24 on. Make your assistant put the 70 to 200 on, all right? That's a good plan. They're younger than you anyway, so just they're all hungry and what? Go ahead. Put the 70 to 200. You'll love it. Uh, <laughs> and so this is basically what I bring to a wedding. Um, okay, and if you were to add up all the prices, I'll, I'll, I bring two of these, by the way, because I have to have backup. Okay, you want to add up, okay, it, you want to get into this game, it can be very pricey, and this is with using my equipment, which is a lot less than other people. I'm already at 14K right off the bat with my stuff. Okay, but you don't have to start off there, you know, if you're just doing $200 weddings or $300 weddings, they're free weddings to start off, you could start off with a lot less, and this is my recommended best value wedding setup. And bear in mind that I'm Chinese, so I'm very conscientious about cost, okay? So all Asian people like to save money. This is what I'm going to recommend you doing. I recommend you get a full frame Canon Mark II Canon or maybe a D700 because somebody on that chat room right now is offering one, a very good one for $900. Is that true? Okay. <laughs> and so maybe at most you're going to get one for $1,500. That's a good camera to start off with, right? You get uh, wedding. Okay, I have some of these kits. Uh, I don't have a lot of them, but I have three lenses. I've done research for about a month on the best lenses in the world for 200, around 200 bucks. I know what they are. I'm not telling you what they are because once I tell you, and there may be only 500, maybe only be a thousand of these lenses out there left. If I open it up to 30,000 people right now, they won't be 200, they'll be 500 dollars. <laughs> But you could go on to my creative live discussion group and on my uh, Facebook. I, we can talk about it there, and um, I have them. But anyways, wide angle, a medium zoom, to tele, and a long zoom, and a macro lens, right? Um, anyways, you could get those $700 for all that there. That you could, I would feel confident myself shooting a wedding with that. I could do it. Okay, so it's out there. If you look around, do some research on lenses, go back the old days to the film lenses that were, those are the best lenses actually. Those ones in the film, because when you buy a lens that was built, done in, in the film days, it's for a full size sensor. And they were made out of metal and they were good stuff back then, okay? So you can look in that area. I'm offering a special wedding kit, a discount. I've discounted uh, just to get you going. Um, so I've had a discounted price of $900, plus if you, if you register for the class, you could get the discount 10% off of that, so you could save yourself about $300. So you go to scottrobertphotography.com uh, in there. So if all totaled, for $3,100, you can get into the game to feel like confident that you can have. You could go in for less, but in general, for about $3,000, you could get into this game. And that's not a bad investment at all. Okay, um, and optional, maybe getting a 50 millimeter 1.8, but you can get those brand new for a hundred bucks. So, you know, buying it used, you're not going to gain much advantage, maybe $10. So I just say, hey, just buy it new, right? And a TTL fat flash, that's, that's one option for you. And those TTL flashes around 300 bucks to 600 bucks. That's an option. If you really get, like me, I don't even use TTL flashes anymore. I just use straight manual flashes. Uh, so anyways, that's kind of the equipment kind of needed to really get going. Um, 
let's go back there. Let's stop at this, and let's see if anybody have any questions about equipment right now. One, one, one question I thought was interesting from Curtis' photo was, do you need to have a storefront or a studio to become a 10K wedding photographer as part of your, I over, didn't. As part of your overhead? I didn't. Um, I, we're going to totally get into that in the next days and, okay. and unpack all that. But just a quick answer, I didn't do it. Mainly because I was being hired around the world. So somebody from New York is hiring me. They're not going to come to my studio. Right? So I, I did have one in Beverly Hills. And actually, I shared, did any, no, uh, are you guys familiar with Joe Busink? Okay, mm -hmm. so he was actually sharing his studio. Um, so I was one of the lucky ones who was able to share the same space of, as his in Beverly Hills. So I did that for a year. I never went into it one time. So I go, I think I'm wasting money here. So I got rid of it. But there is ways, if you do a lot of local business, it could be advantageous to have a studio, but we'll get into that a little bit later. I, I traveled around the world for my wedding, so I never even, sometimes when I met my wedding client, it was on their wedding day, and that was the first time I saw them. So um, it was different for me, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Do we have any questions in our studio audience? I remember when I was starting out, I got a D800 and not lenses. For, I was camera body broke, yes. and I had no lenses, and nobody told me that you could get a cheaper body with better lights and better lenses. So what do you recommend for people who are starting in? Do they go for lighting first? Do they upgrade their body? Do they get Okay, lenses? great question. My feeling is this. Um, the one thing that you need to be concerned with first is ISO, not lenses, okay? Because with higher ISO, you could use lower, because really that's what you're paying for. When you buy these fancy, you know, $2,000 lenses, you're paying because you want to you wanna shoot in low light a lot of times or you want to, like, use a shallower depth of field. But in my mind, if you really want a shallow depth of field, put the 50 millimeter 1.8, it's only $100 there, right? Um, so I, my main concern is when I recommend people is go for the, what you can afford, which gets you the best ISO performance. And that is the sensor size. There's physics involved, okay? The larger the sensor, the lower the noise is in your camera. There's a trade-off. That's why people don't use point-and-shoots for their weddings. Well, maybe some do. It's because that sensor on that point-and-shoot camera is like that big. When you get a full-size sensor, it's this big. It's huge. So the large size does matter. <laughs> size does matter, okay? So the larger the sensor, the better. That's why you got to go to full frame. Full frame is, is it because it gets one, then you, can, you don't have to worry about lenses buying and selling later. And two, you're usually typically going to get the higher performance lens. Anyway, so my, okay, so let's say you bought a Canon 5D Mark I. Okay, the noise performance in that is going to be basically the same as a crop sensor anyways. So you might as well just go up to the full frame. So if it's that's that's so that's my recommendation. Does that help with that issue? Great question. Any other questions? We have so many questions. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, we have five minutes to do it too. That's all right. We've got we have we have time. We've got three days. We got three you. days. Yes. That's right. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of continue to lay the groundwork of who this class is for, what we're talking about here. So a question from Raj Sawant is: When you say 5K, 10K wedding, does that price include the cost of the products that people are getting, the photo albums, the frames, or is that above and beyond that 5K or 10K? What are we talking about? Okay. Wedding photography is great business. When I, okay, so I, I was an entrepreneur for 12 years before becoming a wedding photographer. And I said to myself, if I'm going to get into another business, because my other business was in textile printing, so we were doing... Uh, we were screen printing and, and creating um, and printing on apparel for people all over the country, okay? Our margin was this big on every shirt, you know? We, we hardly made it, so you had to do everything in, by volume to make money. And if there's one little hiccup, 
you're not making any money at all. So it's very difficult. So I said to myself, I'm getting into an industry that has some high profit margin. Then whatever business I get into, it's got to have some freaking high profit margin. And so that's why I chose wedding photography, because in general, your cost in general for a $10,000 wedding, not counting travel, is what at most going to be $1,000. So that's a lot of profit. Charge ten. Cost you a thousand nine thousand dollars a wedding still ain't bad. I'll take it. So, you know, an album what costs three hundred dollars? So at most, the cost of something, if you provide something, prints are what nothing, right? Cents now. So the only main cost is in an album, maybe if a large print like that costs you a hundred bucks or something like that. So generally your cost for a wedding, five hundred dollars or less. Now, if you pay an assistant, maybe a couple hundred bucks or whatever. So I'm thinking at most, and even if you job out some of your editing on top of that, $1,000. But still, there's a lot of profit left over into it. Okay? So that's generally speaking, those, those costs. Killer headshots posing the groom. Um, I actually, one time a long ways back when, you know, when you're first starting out, you get on the internet and you start comparing yourself to different people. Okay, so I did that in the beginning of my career and I fell upon this one website and I was captivated by his photography and he wanted to get into the wedding business. Uh, and, but he was primarily a headshot photographer, a pretty famous headshot photographer in Hollywood, in Los Angeles. So he would shoot a lot of these up-and-coming movie stars and actresses and, and do their headshots. And um, out of the blue, he contacted me. And he said, you know what, Scott? I really love these slideshows that you put online. Can you teach me how to uh, put a slideshow together? Okay, come on, listen. This was eight years ago, so this is a while. Like, slideshows weren't as easy as they, were, they are now. But anyway, can you d let's swap skills. I'm going to teach you how to shoot a headshot, and you're going to teach me how to put a stupid slideshow together. I said, yes. Let's do it, right? And at that time, too, he's going to shoot my head, give me a headshot, too. It says, oh, no problem. And so some of the concepts that he taught me back eight years ago, I'm still using today. I've refined it a bit. I've added on to it. But because I saw his shot all on his website, it was just pictures of faces. And I was so captivated by it because eyes, they say, right? Eyes can really show that beauty in a person's soul. And I said, I got to learn how to do that, and I need to get some of that on my website so I could feel good about my portraiture. So just during the course, so what's been my tradition since then is that every wedding I try to get a nice headshot of the bride and the groom. Just a, a really good clean, and, and I try to do it within a minute or so, if that's all the time I get. And because I, I think it's such a compelling thing to have that close-up of somebody's face. So I'm going to start to tell you a little bit about how I do it and how actually it's not that hard uh, to understand the concepts. It may, I'm going to, hey, we're talking about the truth here. Um, I'm going to give you some, some um, kind of tips on how to do it. You're going to understand those quite quickly. But to truly master it, it will take you probably a few years of really hard work to feel like it's at a world-class level. I'm going to give you some solutions on how to do it like tomorrow and have good success with it, but to really fine-tune it and to have a shot that's like, wow, Sue Bryce would shoot something like that or whatever, right? Like really something that you feel proud of. It could, I felt it took me about three years to really feel like I was doing it decently, right? Okay, so let's get into it. Posing, 
hard to do well. Many don't even bother. You'll see a lot of photographers, wedding photographers especially, they don't even mess with posing. Because what happens is this. The learning curve to posing is really high. So they're going to start to uh, do their posing, and it's going to look terrible because they don't know how to do it. And they go, why should I even do it at all? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest to you, and I'm going to encourage you to learn it. Because once you do learn it, it's going to put you at that different level. I find a lot of times the best wedding photographers in the world know how to pose, know how to get that look. And it was the one thing that got me to that $5,000 level. Okay, so I'm going to give you the shortcut on how to do this. Okay, these are shortcuts. Portrait techniques. Every successful photographer has a few simple ideas that work in any situation. And if you look at all the world-class, whatever they do, world-class, it all comes down to one or two concepts. Albert Einstein. When I say Albert Einstein, what do you think of? E equals MC squared. <laughs> he spent an entire life, but he came, his, everything in his mind came down to that one formula. And so that's what I try. I mean, I'm not Einstein, but that's what I try to do. It's I look at my work, and, and I say, what can I, just a few simple ideas, can, techniques, my ideas that can actually achieve the way that I shoot. And so that's what I'm going to tell you how to do it. One thing, the first thing, is define the line. And what do I mean by that? Is that there's a line on the, on the face, right? If you turn the head, if you turn the head, right, and so to make this ear disappear, right, you're going to see a distinctive line on the face, right? And it's going to define the face. If, let, okay, let's say, let me just make myself fat and ugly, right? If you're looking straight at me, there's just like a lot of this stuff here. Yeah, I need to lose about five pounds or so, right? And you can't see the face because photography is what? Two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional. So it's all going to look as one thing. But once I turn the face you're going to get a line, and it's going, to dis, it's going to define that face. So look at, let's look at this picture here, right? So I turned her face, so uh, on the left side of her face, you see a line. That line is sacred, okay? You want that line because it defines the profile of the face, and it has a slimming effect to your face, because why? Photography is two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional. So you need to see that line. So you just turn that face to the side until it covers the ear, and you see that line. That's the first step. You need to see a line there. OK, so look at the, do you, where's the line here? Do you see the line on the face? Right? Right there. See a line? A distinct line right there. It defines that face. Okay. See it here? Right there. So I'm turning, see you, you don't see her ear, right? So I'm just slightly turning the face so you can see that and have that defined through there. Another thing is don't cut the eye off. So don't turn the face so much that that line splits that eye, and so you only see partial of the eye. You have to see the entire eye there. So you only turn it until, like watch, maybe I'll go to the camera, right? If I'll turn, I can't, it's actually, maybe, Dina, you can s tell me, like, how far to turn my face. Right, Wait, let me pose better. <laughs> what, what, right, right, right where? Tell me when. You're, you're, you're good. Right there? Mm -hmm. See that? If I go too far, no, yeah, that line sure. cuts the eye off, right? Yeah, you can a little, yeah. Let me make love to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't cut the eye off, right? Okay, here it is. You see that? Right. Don't let the nose break that line. That line is sacred. Don't mess with it. It's there. Don't let the nose, and I still do it once in a while, but don't try not to do it, okay? Keep the eye there, keep the nose there. 
Don't let it break. Do you understand that concept with the nose? Right? So, like, again, Dina, do it again. Let's, you, let's go to this camera here. Are you wanting right? it to I'm wanting to break. Well, I don't, I'm Asian. I don't have a nose. Uh, but anyways, go past? you could do it, right? Go past. Oh, shit. See? I don't yeah. have a nose. So <laughs> okay. It works for me. But if somebody had a nose, I don't have a butt, and I don't have a nose. But anyways... <laughs> Uh, so, Asian, hey, shoot Asians, they don't have a nose, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, but uh, you don't want to break that line. Believe me, it's just going to get worse as these days go on. Okay, here, did you see the line? You see how I turned her face? And I got this established that line, it didn't break, the nose didn't break the line, I got her eye in there. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's just so compelling when you, you have that headshot of that person and that tone and everything works together. And then also you can come in and, and while you're doing that is get that eyelash in there, have them close their eyes. You, know, you do that with a lot of brides. So since you're there, you might as well just have them close their eyes and then also take that shot also. And you can come around and do it this side too. I'm using an 85 millimeter lens here, probably about f2 or so, something like that. Okay, here's another key thing. One, define the line. Do you see the line on her face? You see where it is? Right? Define the line. Two, break the spine, which means this. The spine should never be perpendicular to the floor because that creates stiffness, right? Look at me. Okay, I'm going to do a headshot, turn to the side, hi, smile, <laughs> right? But all of a sudden, let's say, what, that's why I always like to shift the weight. Once I shift the weight, I, it, it breaks the line of the spine. It's not quite perpendicular. And then if, you know, leaning forward, breaking that. So the spine, which goes up and down, shouldn't be perpendicular to the floor. If you want to look, examine your photos, quite honestly, I did look at some of your, your photos at your website. And so I know that some of you have and look at that, and you'll see when you're posing people, that spine is straight up, and it's going to give that feeling of stiffness, not fluidity. So it always has to be broken wherever, forward, to the side, break it. No straight up and down. I know whenever a person has it, their mom has always told them, right, when they're in front of the camera, Johnny, stand up. That's the worst thing ever. That's ruined America photos for <laughs> years, right? Stand up straight. The worst thing pop so that's what you so listen your clients they never had a professional photographer a lot of them ever in their life so they're gonna get there they're gonna be like this because that's what the, their mom told them to do okay but it's got to be broken yes question uh, is that rule for male female yes anybody? I'll get into that right but yes that's definitely for everything spine should not be perpendicular to the floor floor so here right that 90 degree angle what did I do put her off to the side had her lean on something, broken it. Got the line, define the line, break the spine. Got it? So, watch here. You see the line? And then I had her leaning off to the side, and it gives that flow. And as you can see from a compositional point of view, in this particular flow, photo, doesn't the subject, kind of the flow of it, is diagonal across the frame? That is a great graphic design um, technique, is use the diagonal of a page, and it creates flow in your images. If you have everything straight up and down, it's going to feel stagnant. But if you use the diagonal of your frame, it's going to have a nice flow, so your eye will lead all the way through the entire frame when it's at a diagonal. It leads your eye across the entire thing. Here, I didn't really define the line too much here because um, her eyes were captivating me and I got thrown off because she was so pretty. Uh, <laughs> but I did make her lean here. So you can see that. 
And just that, that's actually exaggerated. That looks natural, doesn't it? But in real life, when you tell somebody to stand over there and lean on it, you're not going to get that. Um, you're just going to get a little bit, but so you've got to exaggerate it a little bit more. Okay? Can you see how I broke the spine here? You see where the line is? So here's the spine. I broke that off there. I probably had her pose like this. Right here. <laughs> it's to break, break that spine. That's why it's so, the easiest way to break the spine when somebody's standing is what? Shift the weight onto one leg. So if you have them lift up the other leg and keep it straight, then you can guarantee that it's going to be shifted. Right? So sometimes like it sends somebody just, they don't get it. And, and some people can lean better this way versus that way. And so let's say they, are, they lean really well this way, but you're posing them this way. They get confused because they're not used to leaning that way. But you just tell them to lift up their foot. Okay? And watch. When you tell a somebody to pop their hip and to lean, they're going to do this for you. Okay. You need it more. You need it super exaggerated. It feels uncomfortable to do this. But I know I look stinking hot when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is this, is you make them go there. Because they got to feel, because, OK, I get these little timid Asian brides. Oh, pop the hip, right, right? No, 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 you got to give it to me. You know, I need more. Bam, right? And then they, oh, then they feel it, and they get it. And then you turn around, you show them the picture. Ooh, wow. Then they just start doing it all the time, right? <laughs> OK? So it's something that you really have to exaggerate because it's not natural. But it looks natural. It's, it's weird. It's not natural, but it looks natural. OK, the shoulders should frame the head. So you don't want to turn a person so much that you're just seeing their arm. That doesn't look good because the head's just floating above the shoulder. And so you need to see both shoulders in there. And that will center the face. If you don't, it's just going to be flying into nowhere's land. It needs an anchor. Your head needs an anchor, so you need that triangle, right? See the two shoulders are in the, and on each side of the face, so you need to see a shoulder on the other side to give it balance, or else it's going to feel weird. OK, so here, even if you do it on the other side, um, you can use the other shoulder. Or some people use another element for that balance. Maybe they might use that balance with their hair or a hand. But that head should be balanced between two elements. Either you're going to do it by shoulders, or you're going to do it by hair, or by a hand. Um, but some way, that head just can't float out of nowhere. It needs to be look, look like it's resting on something. OK, so here it is. We're defining the line, right, which is there. We got one side of the face defined very well. Two, I'm breaking the spine, and I'm, I'm making them lean. And the third element that I love doing is, what do you think? Anybody know? Nose towards the light. So I have a light source. I always put the nose towards the light, because why? It's going to give me a shadow on the other side of the face. And now I've defined the face. See how important that is to know light? But you very easily is all you do is put the nose towards the light. And you will, that's it. Just remember that. That's my, that's the, my uh, E equals MC squared. Just put the nose towards the light, and you'll be cool. Right? When in doubt. Turn the, so, OK, now you're flustered. You don't know what to do. OK, first of all, I got to turn that head so the body and the head aren't the same direction. I got to break the spine. And then I got to put the nose towards the light. You'll be there. It may not be perfect, but it's going to be a lot better than if you're not doing it at all or if you had no idea. OK? It's going to take you three years to really perfect it, get the look, fine tune it. What I feel about headshots is, and Headshots, you're finding their sweet spot. You find the sweet spot, and you got to do it within one minute. So you got to assess somebody, right? So when I'm when I'm making them turn, let's say I'm making them turn their head, 
and I'm looking at them in the camera. I don't look through my camera right away. I look at them with my two eyes, right? And, okay, let's have uh, Joseph come up, and he can just sit here, okay? Let's say, can you just uh, sit here kind of like this? You're tall, right? And then just kind of lean forward. Okay, right. So, I'm going to turn his head here. Turn your head right there, right? He's leaning forward. Can you lean forward a little bit more? Right, good. Uh, okay, and then I'm going to put the light where? We're here. Because then I'm going to get this shadow here. So I turned his head to define this line. I'm making sure his nose is not breaking that line. I'm making sure his eyes is not breaking that line. I've got his spine. I got that broken. And then I'm going to put the light here. Oh, can you get me one of my video lights? Can somebody, one of the students, just grab that video light back there? I'm sorry. I'm not prepared here. And I'm wondering if we can kind of see this, this shadow. You might have to close your eyes because we're going to have to make this break. But I don't know if you can get this on camera, if you can see the, the shadow on the other side of his face. Do you get that? Can you start to see that shadow there? So, um, well, I can't. <laughs> can I get an assistant, somebody to hold this? Right. So if the light is by the nose, Right? It's not, it's too bright in here, but you start to see a faint shadow right there. If this light was darker, you could see it more. So if we're in stronger light, it would happen. There's a lot of ambient light around here. But that's the whole concept. And what they call, what you want to do is get that, create a little shadow loop right here on the nose. So if you get the light up higher, see, and then over a bit this way, you get that loop right there on the nose. And that's going to give you that definition in what you want. Thank you. Um, and so, do you understand that concept? Okay, and so it's just as easy as that. So let's say if you were standing. Go ahead, Joseph, standing, right? So can you place all your weight on one leg for me? Right? Good. And then, can you just turn your head this way a bit? Got the line? Right? Now, my fine-tune adjustment is the, the chin. Can you put your chin down? Can you put, put it up? So I make them follow my hand. So I got full control of them. So like this, see that? Look at that. I am just finding his sweet spot. <laughs> so, and that's what I do. I look for it. I don't, because if I'm in my camera, it's hard for me to find the sweet spot. But if I use my two eyes, I can see it. And so, ooh, well, he's got, this dude looks so good. It doesn't matter. He's got a sweet spot wherever. And bam, then that, thank you, Joe. Uh, and that's how I find it. I fine tune it. I generally know what I'm going to do, but every face is different, right? So um, I fine tune that head and the turd, and that's what's going to take you three years. It's not that you got this, this, and turn it and that. It's that sweet spot of finding it with that right expression and emotion. Bam. That's the three year process. Yes. Question. So sometimes when we do portraiture and we're turning the, the nose, we try to wait until the nose kind of falls into the cheekbone. If not, you, the nose gets too close to the lens and it's a little awkward. Do you focus on that at all or is it just kind of what looks good for the sweet spot for you? Um, I talk about that a little bit. What millimeter lens are you using? Uh, 85. 85, okay, yeah. So you have to use a lens. If you don't want to make a person's look, head look too distorted, you have to use 50 millimeters or greater to do this type of shot. Uh, it'll be in the next slides, I think. But so that's going to make it not look distorted. And every face is a little bit different. Um, if they have an extremely narrow face, sometimes they may even look better just straight on. And they've already got the line defined. And if you turn it, it looks too much because they're too skinny. Uh, which is rare, but I would say 90% of my clients and 90% of just general people, it looks better when you turn it and you get that line and you get that shadow. Uh, I would say most of the people look better that way. Um, and, but it's all by kind of your own assessment right. of how they look good. Right? Yeah, I was just wondering if you try to make sure that you get the nose to fall into the cheekbone instead of the uh, nose There's no real rule for me. I just make sure that I don't break it, the line. The line is sacred. Don't, don't mess with it. It's there. Just don't break it, and then you should be good. But, yeah, whatever works for you and, and you find that that's great, then good.
Okay, so here again we can see that, define the line. You can see all the principles here. You, you break the spine, right? And see that shadow? Nose towards where? Light. The light. And do, don't you see the shadow on the other side of her face? There? This is just using that video light that I use. This is inside a bar. I'm having her lean on the counter. I have some nice lights in the background. Um, I think I'm using a 2.8 lens. Yes, I am using a 2.8. I zoomed out to 70 millimeters, okay? And so I went back more so I could blur out that background, keep her in perspective. I, for portraiture, I love using the 85 millimeter. That's like my favorite lens to do portraiture. A lot of times when you're in um, a wedding, sometimes 50 millimeter is good because then you don't have to step back as far. And sometimes when you're shooting a bride, you, you're in a confined space. And sometimes 50 millimeter, that's, that's all I can use. But in general, I like using an 85. You have to step back a little bit further. But I love that as a portrait lens. OK, and that's the other line. So you define both um, ends there of the face. And some people ask me, well, what's your secret, like uh, shooting, you know, heavier set people versus skinny people? Like, it's all the same to me, man, right? Everybody likes to look like they're less than, everybody look, likes to look like they're 20 pounds lighter, right? Uh, most of us are whatever, five pounds, or if you're, right? We all look to li like to look slim, and the, that's what these principles do. That's what they do, and so I, in general, just use it with everybody. It's, you know, you may, some, like, poses might not be appropriate for some body types, but in general, all these basic principles are going to work for everybody, and what you're doing is making a person look better. So it doesn't matter to me their body type. I'm making them, I'm finding their sweet spot, and I use these techniques on everybody, and it works. I like to keep it just very simple, right? And when you put that, and when you define that, well, okay, so you're, let's say you're photographing, uh, you know, someone who's a little bit heavier set, right? For sure, you want to define that line, and then you put that shadow on that face, and you turn her around, and they've never seen a portrait of them look that beautiful before ever in their life. You are their hero at that point. And that's what this does. This enables you to show a person's beauty regardless of what they look like. You're just maximizing it. And when you do that, it's, it's kind of overwhelming sometimes for a person. They look, I go, wow! And that's what I love about photography, is like, look it. You're a beautiful person. Let me show you. And I use these techniques on everybody. And if I can give them, my goal is when I'm shooting somebody, it's like I'm going to give them the best photo they've ever seen in their entire life. They don't know how beautiful they actually are. But my job is to show them that. That's what this does. Right? That's why it's worth it to spend three years mastering this. Because how would you like to make people feel beautiful? That's like more than whatever money, 10000 or whatever. That's really what turns us on, doesn't it? That's, that's, that's what really the bottom line of what we do and why we kind of become artists is, is the beauty factor. Right? That's why we're, we photograph people, is we want to show their beauty. Now another tip is, and I just did it with Joseph here, is a lot, of, I'm short, right? I'm a short Asian guy. It always looks good to shoot down on a person. So what happens if, A, they're taller? What do you do? I always sit them down, right? And what happens if the light is from above? You have to sit them down. OK, why is that? The nose goes towards what? The light. OK, let's say you're photographing me, OK? And the, no, the light, let's say the light's right here. Where's my nose going? This way, right here, right? You're shooting right up my nostril. That's not very pleasing, right? 
So if you get them below you, when they put their head up, you're not going to shoot straight into their nostril. So that's my technique I use a lot. I just did it with Joe here. It's like got him down. And if the light was above, the nose goes towards the light, it gives me that nice defining shadow right here. This photo is really important to me because this guy has a story. This guy has a story that has been on national television. Anybody watch Dancing with the Stars? Okay. This guy was on Dancing with the Stars, I think, last year. And his story was he was a famous dancer. When I took this photo of him, he was dancing with Gwen Stefani. Anybody familiar with Gwen Stefani? Yeah, he was on their Harajuku team or whatever. He was one of the four dancers that was on there. It's amazing, uh, you know, break dancing. Like all these dudes in this whole, this was the best wedding to be at. I mean, all these guys, they danced for everybody. They danced for Madonna, Michael Jackson, you name it. They danced for it. This was an amazing reception. I'm going to tell you that right now. But anyways, he had a brain aneurysm, and he became paralyzed maybe three or four years after his wedding. He couldn't move. So he had a guy that was vibrant and was full of life, and he, that's it, he was paralyzed, and he worked really hard to get back into it again and to move and to get to the point where he could dance again. And they found out about this story and they put him on Dancing with the Stars. And so a lot of these guys that were in this wedding were there with him dancing again, right? And so like I follow his, his wife on um, Instagram and... Uh, it was great because just a few months ago, he showed a picture of um, him driving again for the first time by himself. It's an amazing feat. Your job is important because you're going to capture these moments, and you don't know what these people are going to go through after you shoot these photos and what's going to mean to them. All right, important tips to remember. Shoot down on your subjects. Okay, so a portrait in general looks better when you're shooting down on your subjects. So that's why a lot of times, I don't know if you were here or you saw on Photo Week when I was shooting, and I had Joe, Joe's taller than me, right? So I was doing some examples with him. I was using my live view in my camera to frame it because I was shooting up here because I didn't have a chair or anything. So I, I sh a lot of times I'll bring up my camera like this and shoot. Good thing that I have live view, right? So I, and to look at it because I always want that angle down. Some people actually bring little stepping stools or you can be creative in trying to find areas where you can actually get up a little bit higher. Um, but I find it's very easy to find somebody to sit down, even if it was like straight on the ground. You could do that. And then you're always shooting down on somebody. So it always looks better. I'm trying to figure out why that is, and the thing that I could deduce is, is when you're shooting up, okay, and you have the chin slightly down, the forehead is going to look better than the chin. Is that not correct? According to the angle of the camera? So it slims the face down. So that's the only thing that I could do, because you hear it all the time, like shoot down on your shoe. Okay, well, why is that? And I think it slims down a person's face every time you're shooting down. And if it's just a little bit, the chin is a little bit uh, lower, then it will magnify that angular look on a person's face. Okay, so that's, that's, let's talk about that, face plane and camera sense. Can I have Joe come back here again? Can you sit down there for me? In general, to keep a person's face not looking distorted, the face plane has to equal the camera plane. Okay, so turn your chin all the way up. Okay, so n let's say I'm shooting him here and he's doing that. His ch chin is out of, it's looking distorted because it's larger than his forehead. Now put your chin down. Now let's say he's going down and I'm shooting like this. 
Now his forehead is larger than his chin because it's not equal. So move your head up a little bit. Okay, generally you want to keep that position because it's keeping his face in proportion. But if you want to cheat a little bit, then this, this guy is very skinny. I don't need to do it. But let's say he was a little bit heavier set and I wanted to create more angle. I would actually push his chin down just a little bit more. Or vice versa. Let's say I wanted um, his chin, it was too skinny, and I wanted to give it a little bit more, I would raise his chin just up a little bit. I don't know, every face is different, so I'm finding a sweet spot. So that's why I'm going like this, that's why I'm going like this, that's why I'm going like this, and that's why I'm going like that. And I'm just finding something, bam, right there. Ooh, love it. Hear how I say that? It's like when I find it, I get excited. Because that's going to have a reaction to them, they're like, ooh, I'm doing something awesome. I look good, right? <laughs> and so, and I get excited when I find it, and I let them know when I find it, and then they hold it right there, and then I take the shot. All right, thanks, Joe. So you understand keeping that, that plane the same? I love the, I love the idea of, of, you know, that cheating, you know, having it up or down. If in doubt, would you, I mean, film's cheap nowadays, you know, take a few. Uh, yeah, oh, few yeah, down, you know? yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I used to do that a lot. I didn't even know what the heck I was doing. Uh -huh. I knew, gen I mean, okay, I'm, I didn't know a lot of these things that I'm telling you. That's what's great about this class. It's taken me 13 years to figure it out. You're doing it in five minutes, right? I didn't know. I'm, so this is trial and error. Check, click, 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 click if you don't know. But generally, I'm giving you a general place to start. And when in doubt, and when the the mother of the bride is screaming at you, and you don't know what to do, and all chaos is breaking loose, and they're like, okay, I got one minute to give to you. What do I do? <laughs> Fall back on these rules, and it's going to at least get you something that's going to be presentable, okay? And it's going to get you in the ballpark. And it's, and it's not like you're gonna, it's going to be bad. It's going to be better than if not doing it at all, okay? And that's what it's all about. Use low f-stop to blur the background. That's why it's good to use, um, I don't like to go past 1.8 because if you go to, anybody shoot at 1.4 before? I mean, literally, one eyelash is in focus and the other one is not, you know? You got about that much area before things start to go out of focus. So that's why I, I generally keep it at F2. Um, and then I know that their face in general will be right there and everything in focus. So I don't like to go below F2 or 1.8. So I like to keep it around there. And so that's why if, hey, shoot, I don't go below 1.8. You got that lens. It's 100 bucks. Fine. Do I need 1.4? Well, it might focus a little bit differently at low light and et cetera, but if you're shooting in bright light all the time or whatever, hey, man, use that lens, it'll work. It'll work, it'll get you there. Okay, 50 millimeter lens or greater, we talked about that. And let's go over the review. Define the line, break the spine, nose towards the light, that's it. That's my EMC squared right there. Just follow those rules, practice it, and um, you're going to get a decent headshot. Okay? Any questions at this point from the chat room or from you guys before we move on to posing the groom? Yes, sir. We always have questions over <laughs> here, <laughs> as, you, as you quite know. So um, one of the questions from a uh, pro photographer is, how do you keep the subject relaxed while you're posing them? Because they're in some pretty strange positions. And yeah, movements yeah, and, yeah. And they're getting married that day. And they're getting married that day. Yeah. Uh, just tell them to relax. <laughs> well, um, the subject will mirror you. That's very important. I get into this a little bit later. But basically, the energy and the kind of feel that you bring to a session is what you are. Mm. So if you're coming in and, um, can you sit down on that chair over there? Um, turn this way, that way. Mm, uh, wait. Oop. How do you think this client's feeling right now? 
Bruce was like, come in. Hey, man, you're looking good. Hey, can you sit down on that chair right there? Oh, yeah, okay. Lean forward a bit for me. Okay, ooh, man, you're looking good today. Okay, turn your head this way. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, wait, 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 go back there. Put your chin up just a little bit. You look awesome right there. Hold it right there. How do you think they're going to feel, right? It's all about the finger always points at us. Mm. There's no excuses, man. It's all on us. Cool. And so whatever mood they're in or whatever they're feeling, it don't matter. Hey, literally, I had to go into a session and photograph brides literally one minute after they're freaking bawling their eyes off because something's going wrong with the wedding that day. And <laughs> so I, went, I did this one wedding, right? And she was upset at her relatives, and she was so screaming at them, and she was, like, you know, just going off about it. And she's like, how come you're not taking pictures of me? I go, well, um, I was going to let you <laughs> calm down a little bit before because I could see your little, no, 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 let's go, right? What do I got to do? Got to make it happen, right? She's paying me a lot of money, you know, flying me all the way out to the East Coast and all that. Sometimes we have to make it happen no matter what. That's when we rely on these rules. These rules will get you through the day when chaos breaks loose. It's taken me a lot of years to figure these rules out and to organize in my brain. And I can guarantee you, if you use them, they will work fine-tuning it again of getting that create right emotion and finding that sweet spot and doing it immediately making that person feel comfortable and engaging okay that may take you three years but at least this is going to get you in the ballpark right now tomorrow okay any other question yeah scott robert a follow-up again from pro photographer yeah how, how often and under what circumstances do you break the portrait rules do i break the portrait rules yeah only when I have a lot of time okay. that I can experiment. Mm. But typically on a wedding day, I got one minute. Yeah. Got one minute to do everything. So when you got, oh, this is A, this is a great point when it comes to wedding photography. You can't afford to be messing around and experimenting. That's on your own sessions. That's on your own time. I come in and I'm like, I do these rules. It may not, may not be the most amazing photo, but guess what? It's like going to bat and I hit a single. That's fine. I'll try to hit a home run later, but now I need to feed my family, so I'm hitting a single now because I got one minute. And so I follow these rules and I do it, and then till I get more time and they're looser, and then, hey, let's try this, and I set up four lights and I do that and whatever. But during this time, I got, if I, I usually, most wedding photographers, okay, guess what? That little schedule that you get, itinerary that's like 10 pages long, don't believe it. Throw it out the window because 99.9% .9 of the weddings, they always what? Run late. Always. So if you're all feeling good about yourself, oh gosh, I got scheduled a half an hour to shoot that bride. That's awesome. Don't think it. That's a lie. Because that, that's just going to put you in a bad mood when you get there, and now you only got two minutes instead of 30 minutes. You're, ah. I just take that schedule. I just throw out the window. When do you want me there? And that's when I begin. And I just forget about that stuff. But following up on that seriously, um, as part of putting together a you know, quote-unquote $10,000 package, I'm assuming that this is a very, very important shot. I mean, for me, it was. You know, yeah. I mean, in terms of what the bride's anticipating for a deliverable would be, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, as a couple very nice individual portraits. Right. You say a minute. I mean, but really, it's ten minutes, five minutes. No, it's literally a minute sometimes. I mean, I've been in that, but yeah, you know, okay, but yeah, you know, you know. Uh, it could be five minutes or whatever. But, but in, in the planning stage, are you going to try to tell them you need twenty and hoping yes. to get five or ten? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. You, you know, well. See, okay, it's a little bit different now, before than after. I, in, in, ex, when I was not as experienced, I would say, hey, I try, I, can you get me this? Can you get me that? Can you me, right? But right now, I kind of play it off as I'm Mr. I'll do, hey, just give me whatever and I'll do it. That's, that's my persona. I want to portray myself as a, a professional e expert. Mm -hmm. I, 
hey, you know what? It'd be great if I get there a couple hours beforehand and I can shoot you guys. And if I can get 20 minutes with you alone, that would be great. But if not, whatever, we'll just go with whatever. Right? And so uh, I'm confident that whatever, some, whatever time somebody throws me, I can get off something. Um, but in the beginning, yeah, I was very like, want that. But then I realized that when I was hoping on that, when I was hoping on that 20 minutes and I didn't get it, it was throwing me off for the whole wedding day. And I was like, ah, oh, man, it's ruining my psyche here. I'm just going to go in and let's have fun. And whatever happens, I'm going to make something fun out of it. If I get 20 minutes, I get 20. If I get 10, whatever, let's just go with it. I can't, you know, wedding, it's, it's, shooting a wedding is very much like playing sports. It's like, let's say you're playing basketball, right? And your shot is off. And you just feel like all day, ah, oh, man, I haven't got one good photo today. And it's putting you in that mood. And you start to lose confidence. And until you get that shot, then you can start feeling yourself again and confident again, right? I don't want anything to make me feel like down. Because I'm so absorbed with the wedding day. And so if I'm expectation is huge. So if I'm expecting a certain amount and I don't get it, it's going to throw me down. So I'd rather not I suggest it, but in my mind, it's like, I'm just going to go with whatever. And if you're, if you're feeling that you're off and you're whatever, guess what? Your client's really not going to know it. You just fake it, right? And you just say, I'm, and you will yourself to have a good time and having fun. Just in your mind, we're going to have fun because then you're going to keep positive. They're going to keep being positive, and then it's going to flow for you. Okay? So don't get down on yourself. Three go-to go to poses for the groom. Every successful photographer has a few simple ideas that work in SEO. Okay, these are it. This I'm going to show you right here how you can pose a groom and how to do it. It's very, very, very easy. Okay, here's the first step here. Okay. Um, one, straddle the chair, lean forward. Okay. So basically, you get a chair, because there's chairs all over the place. Um, we may be able to use this chair. It might be a little bit high, but he's tall. I like to get something a little bit lower. Perhaps if we could uh, use one of these chairs here. OK, let's see what the, oops, we won't get into that. But that, that's another type of situation here where we're doing that. Uh, let me see if I, gently lean forward on chair and keep neck elongated. OK, so how I do it is. I usually get a chair like this, okay? And people are most comfortable when they're resting on something. So the rule is this. If somebody feels uptight and, and um, kind of not into it, get them to sit or lean on something. And then they'll feel it'll be a lot easier for them. So they're, they're sitting here, and it's a natural rest. Okay, now if I have him sit here a lot and put all his weight, guess what? My neck starts to uh, get in there, right? But if I just have him gently lean on it like this, it, he's going to keep that neck elongated and forward. It's going to look a lot better than hunched like this, okay? Um, and then another rule, nose towards the light, of course. Uh, and here it is here. He's sitting, this is what I had him here doing, like that. Lean forward, nose towards the light. Shoulder toward the camera, knee towards the camera. Okay, so this, let's say we're doing this, okay? If I'm doing this here, what I like to do is, what looks masculine is the head pointing towards the lower shoulder, okay? So if I have him leaning, and if I have him leaning up slightly to the right, doesn't this shoulder go up? So if I go here, oh, it's kind of like feminine, right? This is what you do with a woman. It's like This is what I call the cutesy, right? Oh, you look cute. Don't women do that all the time? But you want to look masculine, 
you go opposite so you can have them either. So you could just turn, okay, so here's the camera here, right? If I just turn the, my body this way, doesn't this shoulder look higher than this already? Right? So I could just slightly turn it to the camera here, leaning gently forward, and then my head goes down this way. Right? So let's get Joe, because it looks a lot better than me doing that. So I slightly angle the chair, right? So that way, this, automatically, this shoulder is taller than this shoulder when you look at it through the camera. Right? Let's exaggerate it. So, right? So that, it'll give an appearance, especially if you're shooting down. So let's just move it just a little bit right there. Okay, now if I have, now this is not very much room on that chair. So if you kind of lean up this way, like just put all your weight on this leg here, just lean a little bit, but look down that way. That will even exaggerate it even more if you want to. Now you're going to run into the problem with the jacket and all that kind of stuff. But right, and so he's relaxed, right? He's, his head is angled down towards the lower shoulder. I'm getting this line right here. I'm going to get the light, and I'm going to put it right by his nose so I can divine this other shot. He's going to look very masculine. This will work every single time. All right? Thanks, Joe. So this was about the angle of the head, not the direction of the face? Uh, the both, because the nose goes towards the light, and the angle's down there. Okay. Okay, so let's try. Let's see if you can sit on this chair. Let's go. Okay. Let's, let's pose. All right? So you're going to sit, that, that doesn't give it much room. But if, if you can sit as far back as possible on that, because I want to get you leaning forward, right? And just turn your head this way, that way. Can you kind of lean a little bit more on this, on that way? Yeah, okay, turn your head that way. I've got to break that line a little bit more. Right, right there, relax, close your eyes. Okay, and just open them, look at me, and just breathe through your mouth a little bit like you're breathing through a straw. Right there, and smile a bit. Bam, right there. See that? He looks good, doesn't he? You guys want to look at it? I'm telling you, he looked that right. He looks good. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's cheating. I looked at the start. So. <laughs> and so it works no matter what. Okay. So that's what you do. That's the first one. Let's go to the second one. See that? Same rules there. See that? Okay. Standing. Okay. This is how you do it. Pop in the hip. You just tell him to pop the hip. Feet 45 degrees to the camera, pop the hip away from the camera, lean towards the hip. See how his head is leaning? Okay, so you rotate the hip, pop it that way, and you lean towards the lower shoulder, and he's going to look masculine. Okay, so if we have, where's the camera at? Here, right? So if, if um, you're rotating the hip, right? So if I'm popping the hip out like this, I, I slightly, here, here I am towards the camera. If I rotate slightly this way, doesn't this shoulder look higher than this shoulder already? So I've got that edge, shabam. Tip my head down, lean forward. Works every single time, okay? So, so you got that? So here's the camera. You tilt them off to the side, you pop that hip. Well, actually, you know what? My good side's the other side, because you're shooting into my part. Okay, so <laughs> everybody's got another good side. So here it is, that's my good side, right? So I'm slightly off to the side, bam, tilt down. Head is going to the lower shoulder, okay? And what kind of trick, I kind of pretend as if there's a table here and he's leaning on it, and pull back the hand. There it is, like that, okay? So, let's bring Joe in, right? No way. Okay, yeah, let's bring him in, and let's, let's pose him. So, he's standing there, right? So, can you turn slightly that way? So I'm looking at him, okay? I want to shoot him here because I could see his face because his part is here. If I had him turn the other way, right, I'm not, well, he looks good that way too, but in general, like for a woman, Right, her hair may be covering his face here, if it's that way. But so in general, I like to shoot at the part, and so that way I can see all of his face. Right. So if you can just pop out your hip this way, good. Oh, he he just naturally does it, right? And then he's he's got a slight lean. Can you just lean forward just a little bit, right there? Perfect. Back up this way, right there. 
right there. And I'll just experiment. Turn your hand up just a little bit. That's strong right there. Every single time it'll work. Okay? So you just pop the hip out, rotate this shoulder a little bit more in front of the camera so it looks higher, and you lean the head back, bam. This is actually is the hardest for the groom to do. So I usually don't, thanks Joe, I don't even get to that point because in general it's really hard for men to pose, especially standing. So that's why I always have them sitting in a chair, and I'm going to go to the next uh, slide and what else I do. Okay, oh, head tilt. So I think these are other examples. Okay, this is examples of the same thing. Look at the same principles. Isn't he leaning off to the side? His shoulder is on the lower one. He's tilting the head there. This is what I do. I lean him up against the wall, okay? This is, every guy can do this. Okay, and it looks good every single time. So what's happening here? This is the third one. This is actually the one I start off with if I can, or sitting down. Okay, but usually there's a wall everywhere. So you pop that hip out, okay? Nose towards the light, or towards the hip in this way, okay? Look at it there, right? He's popping that hip that's opposite of that wall, turning towards the light. It's got that lean down. Looks masculine, it's perfect. Okay, so let's go back to this and let's do it. So let's take this gentleman right here and let's kind of, can you, is it possible to follow me to this wall here? So this in general, you can just stand right here and listen to me. In general, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna tell somebody to lean against this wall and they're gonna do this for you. That doesn't look good. The secret is, to making it look natural is whatever the hip is opposite to this shoulder, which is this one, this one has to go out. Okay? So they're leaning. This hip out is this way, right here, right? Um, I can step back a bit to raise this shoulder higher, right? So if I turn out this way, this shoulder looks higher on camera. I can't see myself, so I, I'm kind of taking a guess here. And then if lean back this way, it's that same thing as if I was standing and doing this. I'm just doing that. But it's a lot easier for people to lean on something. So let's try it. So uh, go ahead, lean against that wall there, right? Um, exaggerate that hip a bit, right? Man, you're looking good. Okay, let's try this. Let's rotate your shoulders back this way a bit. Yeah, that's even better. Right? Good. And just lean your head just back a little bit this way. Look at me. Right there. Smile. Looks good. Works every single time. <laughs> it may not be, thank you. It may not be the most creative thing, but guess what? It gets you freaking paid, and you move on, and it takes one minute. Okay? There's a million things that you could do with a guy. But sometimes you've got one minute, just do these things, and shabam, it's going to work. So that's the three poses for a groom. Um, base hits are how you win games, right? What's that? Yeah. Base hits are how you win games. Definitely. Hit singles, singles. So, hey, I don't know. Maybe you came to this thing, and you're thinking, oh, 10K photography. It must be the most amazing photography in the world. i got to check out this guy, and then I'm showing you this stuff. And go, that's not that creative. No, but it's posing techniques, they're singles. And if you can be consistent, this wedding game is being consistent from one client to the next client, no matter what situation. That one's in bright light outdoors, this one's at nighttime. No matter what, you'll still be able to do your job from wedding to wedding. Consistency is key to being a great wedding photography. It's that getting on base every single time, yes. And I also think to add with that, when you have these, even though they may be basic, there's something you know will work every single time. Yeah. That, that gives you the confidence mm -hmm. to say, yes, pay me 10000 I will show up, I will do this, and you will look good. I'm, I'm telling you right now, most wedding photographers don't even know that. They don't even know this stuff, right? And so if you're doing it, you're ahead of the game already because it's basic portrait. People are afraid of portraiture. 
And so a lot of wedding photographers don't even get into it because it's hard. It takes years of practice. But I'm giving you some go-tos right now that will help you. Yes. Uh, something I think is interesting, I see a lot of photographers say I have to go to a wedding to know how to shoot a wedding, and this is stuff you can practice not at the wedding, so when you yes. go to the wedding, you're prepared. For sure. Yeah. You know what? All that photojournalistic stuff that you shoot at a wedding, it's easy. Just turn your freaking ISO up to 5,000, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need any light. Just shoot it. By. Okay, whatever, right? This stuff, it really, this for me, personally, I don't know about everybody else, but for my story, is the more I did this stuff and I posed people and I was consistent, the more money I got paid. And it was very evident. And the rave that I got, everything. It, it was this stuff. The art of portraiture is being lost. Regain it. You do it. You put it. It makes you money. But guess what? You can evolve your career. If you know what portraiture, you don't have to do wedding photography the rest of your life you could do something else. And so I find that the photographers that don't know portraiture, they have to be wedding photographers for the rest of their life. Okay? But if you understand and you, and you know this and you go through that process of working hard for three years to get it down, you're gonna have, you can do anything. You can go into fashion. You can do into families. You can go to seniors. Sky's the limit for you. And it opens up your career opportunities. Okay? Make the groom look strong and confident. That is the main thing. I got to make the, this group, he's got to look like a stud. He's got to be strong. He's got to be confident. Guess what that means you have to be? Strong. strong. Yeah, <laughs> very good. <laughs> so if you're not, fake it. Just, I don't know how many times that, I, you know, that happens, right? You're just feeling down, and you're just feeling, I'm not getting any good shots. The, the groom just hate me. I'm not getting good vibe. I mean, I got to be honest. Can I just be truthfully honest about the real world? I'm going to be truthfully honest. A lot of times when I don't know the client or the client has just heard the hired me because this wedding coordinator suggested me and I hired me, and it, let's say I get into a situation where I've got a lot of, I'm, I feel, I, I, okay, this is a personal story. So I, this, for example, there's a, a, a Caucasian males there. They're a lot taller than me. They look at me. I look like an airline pilot or something. <laughs> I am different. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sensing any love from them at all. In fact, I've had grooms make fun of me while I'm shooting them making jokes about me behind their back. Uh, yeah, you're really a dude or whatever, right? But I've got to go in there despite that and do my job, okay? So if I hear that, and I hear that murmuring and stuff, and I start to feel this, and I don't block it out, I, there's no way, there's no way I can pose this groom and get him to look good. There's no way I can do it. So you've got to really have confidence. Because that's going to happen. And, and, and you know what? Maybe that's the reason why maybe some women feel uncomfortable shooting men. Because maybe guys are, you know, you sense that being a woman trying to shoot a guy. And like, oh, she doesn't know what she's doing. She's having me do this stuff. And I don't feel like, you know? Right? And I'm sure everybody, it's not just me. Everybody else feels that way. But we've got to get past that. Keep that confidence up. Because it's going to reflect. It's a mirror. Your photography is a mirror to your soul. So whatever you feel and whatever, that's what you're going to get back. So if that's what you want, that's what you got to get. All right? So anyways. Scott? Yes? Uh, in some of your other workshops, you, you talk about when you want to create an image, you start with an emotion. So with, with grooms, do you talk to them about an emotion? What are some of like yeah, your, your go-to words right. for emotions? Just, oh, man, I just want you to look really strong and confident right here. So you use That's strong it. and confident? Yeah, I use strong and confident. Okay. Right, so like, if you're like this, and like, okay, I want you to really look strong and confident. Can you pop that hip out? Okay, yeah, right? And so I, I use that words, those words a lot. 
Any so other questions? So one of the one of the things we got from Phase Con was these three rules are wonderful and a great start. After a few shots following these rules, what next? Do we we you know, we don't want to end up with this, these same lines? Where would you go after you get those go to for the posing the groom? Um, what varies the pose? Okay. If you look at my wedding photography, you will not think that it looks the same, but if you analyze it, it actually does look the same. Mm. But the person looks different, their expression, the, the wall that they lean on, the background that they use, it all makes it look different. You change the expression. So a lot of it is the expression, right? Especially with the bride. But a groom pretty much wants to look the same way all the time, strong and confident, and then I just get him to laugh. There's only two things for a groom. It only should take you five minutes to shoot the groom because we're really easy. Because we get the serious, confident, and we get something smiling that mom's going to like and grandma. Okay? And then, but the bride... Oh, gosh, a woman is so complicated, right? <laughs> and so wonderful at the same time because she wants to look demure. She wants to look sexy. She wants to look confident. She wants to look elegant. I mean, there's all that stuff in there for a bride. And that's really when I use the emotion for that. But for a groom, there's really only three looks, and then there's different locations. And so that's how you vary it up. But you know that's why I go back to the basics. The basics are, oh, you can experiment with things, but I know I've got to get that weight shifted, and I've got to get that look. And so what, what, what okay, let's do something different. I'll just turn them off to the side and put side light on it. Same pose. It looks completely different. Completely different. So don't feel that these, these are building blocks. That's what I'm teaching you. You put the building blocks together, and then you create different emotion. It's a different, it looks, your work will look entirely different than mine. Great question. So what are you doing with a guy's hands? Is there any sort of, you know, fists, no fists, in pockets, oh, out of pockets? Do you have any sort of, like, rules there? I don't know. There's a lot there, of, like, rules sort of there. Like? Whatever a lot, what they feel comfortable. Some don't like this, you know. And generally, if you're going to put, maybe if you did this, I don't know. Some people don't like this. They do this instead. Or, oh, never put the hands in pockets. I don't know. So what they're comfortable I, with, What probably. they're comfortable with, what they feel. Uh, another one thing, too. Let's say if they've got a little bit of, of a tummy, you can also have them fold their hands so this part kind of covers their their so you shadows. could do, chat It'll right so you could do this here right and then let's say they got a little bit of this right here you can have them go like this to draw attention away from I can make myself look <laughs> fat too much Thanksgiving right and I can just do this here so that's what I'll do is is here it's not as important as the woman in the hands I have a whole section on a woman on on her hands. It's like <laughs> we're going to go in an hour into the hands part. But for guys, it's very basic. All right, one last question before, before sure. we go to our lunch break. And that is from pro photographer who says, what percentage of your shots have those serious expressions versus smiling expressions? And how do you best transition the client from a serious to a smiling mood? So maybe exa especially with the men here, I what tried, would you say? Right, I try to get a variety of, of things. Um, and so I like that I, I mean, I actually, well, they, your photography is a reflection of you. So I basically shoot what I would, how I would like to look because I'm a guy, right? Shooting a woman, I had to learn how to be a woman. <laughs> Sounds weird. <laughs> but I, seriously, I had to learn how to be like a woman posing. And I had to learn that. But it was very easy for me to be a man because I know how I wanted to be portrayed. And like a lot of it is, we just like to be strong, confident, and then a smile. And I find that that has taken me all the way to $10,000, so I know it can for you, too. It's not, it's like, it's, it's not some magic over-the-top thing. It's a consistency. You know what? Okay. It's better to do something simply but 100% correct than try to do something avant-garde and, like, creative and do it 80% correct. Why? Because when you do something 100% correct, it turns into classic. What is classic? It's enduring. You can look at that image over and over. It's like sculpture. If you want to learn how to pose, look at sculpture. 
because they're taking an inanimate object like stone, something as hard, and making it look lifelike. They're not doing all this crazy. Whenever you see the famous sculpture, Nick, you're not seeing them doing high fashion poses and stuff like that with culture. No, right? You're just looking at basic stuff. Why? It's enduring. You know, I remember some, I always ask my client why they hired me or why they like your images. And a lot of the clients would tell me, you know, I don't know what it is about your photos, but I could keep coming back to it over and over and over again. Your photography is like, a, it's like a, a good book. A good book can be read over and over and over again. And that's what these things do for you. It gives you a classic look that's enduring forever. And yeah, it don't look spectacular and avant-garde and whatever, right? But it's solid. And it will earn you money. Positive energy flow in how to create positive energy. The reason why I came up with this lecture was when I was doing workshops, I was watching the students pose people, and I'm going, ah, they need to learn how to get some positive energy. So that's why I came up with this lecture. These are the po if you want to kill all the energy out of a posing session, do these things. Hesitation. Don't you feel uncomfortable right now? <laughs> That's what your client is feeling when you're... That is uncomfortable. Do not hesitate. Talk to them. Continually to work with them, okay? Idleness, you're not sure, okay? No dialogue with subject, okay? So if you're a shy person, I'm sorry, you're going to kind of have to come out of your shell a little bit and you're going to have to talk, be engaging. It's just part of the job. <laughs> Give stern injection. Sit over there, right? <laughs> go, can you go over there? Right? That's just killing the positive. There, how would you like it if somebody was telling you how to do that? Just hey, stand over there. Ugh, you're going to feel, who's this dude, man, telling me what to do? Uh, that's not going to work. Do not compliment. Your subject has no idea if they're doing something right or wrong. So when you tell them to do something and you shoot it and you don't tell them anything, you know, they don't know. What do you think I'm doing after I get out of here when we go on our break? What's it going? How's it going? What's the chat room like? What's going on? I want to know. I have no idea. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> you have to compliment. You have to tell that person what's going on. Do not be appreciative. Always thank them, right? Um, they're providing and giving you a living, man. Be thankful for this person. It's putting food on your table, feeding your family. Be ho hum. Uh, yeah, can you just, yep, yeah, that looks good. Right, yep, yeah, that, that should. Ah, what's that? That's not going to bring anything. That's not going to make your clients happy, okay? Those are positive energy killers. Don't do that. Here's some potas of energy creators. Be prepared, which means just don't look at these slides and then do them at your next wedding without at least practicing it in the mirror or something like this. You should have seen me like preparing these lectures all week last week. I'm like looking at myself in the mirror and testing my theories <laughs> and I constantly, right? Practice it before. Have a plan B and C and D for the groom. Okay, I'm going to get him standing. Oh, shoot, I don't know what's going on. It's not working. Okay, I, at least I can try to get him sitting down. And, oh, at least I can put him over the wall there. Right? B, C, ready. If one doesn't work out, that's okay. Okay? Now, I don't re recommend saying this early in their career, but now, well, you, maybe you can, but I say this all the time. So I'll do posing a client, I'll look at it, I go, well, you know what, that didn't quite work out. That sucks. They start laughing. Because, because you know why that works sometimes? Because my clients, they feel a lot of pressure. They see all these people on my website, and the first thing they tell me is like, um, Scott, you know, you have a lot of beautiful pictures on your on your." Um, website, but I just want to let you know we're really simple people. We're not like beautiful people. So they're thinking that, you know, 
they feel like they have to compete with the people that are on my website. And so when I tell them I screwed up or whatever, oh, wow, yeah, okay, it relieves some of that tension. Now, that's a, that's a choice that you have to make to see whether or not that works for you. But in my case, it works a lot of times. It just breaks the tension. They're laughing. They feel like, oh, I'm just, we're at the same level. He's messing up, and I might not be doing things right. And so, hey, let's just go forward with it, right? So have plan B, C, constant affirmation all the time. I'm always affirming them. Oh, move that arm there. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Continually, that kind of stuff makes them feel good about you shooting them. Be pleasant and charming, okay? Communicate what you are doing. If there's some idleness, I will say this. I'm posing them. Let's say I'm working on the light and I don't got it right. It's like, okay, you know what? This looks really great, but I'm trying to get line the light up right now. So if you can just hold on for a second, I'll get this going. I'm always explaining to them what my vision is and what I'm doing, which leads to the next one, share your vision. It's like, hey, you know what? I got this really good shot. If we can go over there. And if you stand up on that pedestal, I think it'd be really cool because, um, you know, just explain what's in your mind and what you want. You, if you share your vision with them and you're excited about it, they're going to be excited about it. So if you're not excited about it, they won't get excited about it. Who, who wants a, a, a couple that's not excited? Right? Nobody. Nobody. So guess what? If you want an excited couple, it's all on who? Us. We got to be excited. There's no way they're going to be excited. That's why, like, when you go to these workshops, it's so easy because these, these people at these workshops, if you're shooting models and whatever, they're giving you everything. You don't have to do anything. And they're just giving it to you, just laying it out right there for you. But in the real world, you're going to have to generate it. Generate what you want. Okay? And uh, be excited. That's about it. I think, be funny and entertaining. I try to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Show them your good images. That's huge. So after I take an awesome shot with them, I show it to them. It gives them validation. It, It proves to them that the work we're doing here, it's paying off. And they keep trusting you. So every time you show them a good image, guess what? You're, you're, you're filling up your bank account with trust. Then you, that's why I start off small, and I keep building it and building it. By the end of the session, they will do anything they want you to do. You could tell the dude, take off your shirt or whatever, he'll do it, right? But you have to build up, you have to build that up. You have to build that trust going in. And, and it sh- you have to prove yourself. Once you start proving yourself to your client and showing them what you do and doing these basic things, by the end of that session, they will do anything that you want them to do because they're so excited at that point. All right? Um, thank them. That's very huge at the end. Always thank them, no matter what. Uh, they need to hear that. Okay? So, anyways, that's it. Um, I just Some people were asking me about all this stuff, but I'm going to list it here. Uh, where that group that I was talking about is called Scott Robert Lim and Creative Live, or you could subscribe to me at Scott Robert Lim there. I, I, I've reached my friend limit, sorry, um, but you, you can follow <laughs> everything that I do there. Don't even go to my photography page. I don't even, I don't have time to like update that and this and this. I just go with my personal page, but you can always subscribe to me there, or you can join that group, Scott Robert Lim and Creative Live, and we can talk about stuff. Great. Okay, so we're going to get to the bride now, and we're going to really start moving because the groom, um, like I, I say when I shoot the groom, it's like there's very little options that you can do for the groom. Make him look strong and confident. Give him one smiling shot for grandma and uh, mom, and bam, you're off and going, whereas the bride is a completely different story. There's so many facets and ways to pose and emotions and feelings There's a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Okay, Um, this is my main philosophy. Make a woman look 
like a woman. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is what makes a woman look different from a man? Can I give you a hint? Look at this picture, okay? Now, this is when I was in my Bahamas workshop last year. And let me give you a hint what makes a woman look like a woman and not like a man. There's kind of two areas. There's this area. <laughs> and then there's this area. Okay? So basically, my posing a woman is to make a woman look like a woman. What is she? She's this and this. Make it come out. Show that beauty. That curve, that's what she's about, and that's what I'm trying to accentuate. So when I'm looking at bridal photography, let's say I'm critiquing it, I'm going, well, does this woman like a, like, look like a woman? The, the photos that I like the least, and I know that we all do them because we need some variety in our shots, is when the man, the groom, looks exactly like the woman. Like, you know, the holding hands one, right? Or they used to do this a lot, is holding a tree and looking <laughs> at it, right? So whenever the man looks exactly like the woman, I don't like it. Because as a wedding photographer, I want to accentuate both their different qualities. So man, I'm looking strong and confident. Whereas a woman, I'm looking more like whatever. She, I mean, there's so many things a woman is, right? Demure or sexy or whatever. And so that's my general philosophy. And there's another one that's a little bit different is what? Heels, right? <laughs> so whenever a woman wears great shoes, um, then you got to make sure that that's somehow featured in some because she spent a lot of time choosing out those shoes, and sometimes they're very expensive too. So those kind of three things, I mean, this is if you can get it in general, but definitely this and this, that's, that's what it's all about to me. Okay, so let's see go-to poses for the bride, okay? One, I've got two that I really, this is all I do really, and one is the same thing that's popping the hip, but there's an added way on how, there's an extra way you can pop the hip on a woman um, because you can make a woman look feminine and masculine, and it still works. And so that's why there's a little bit more variation. And then there's the roll over or the lean, and that's when you have the bride either sitting or on the, uh, or on the ground. In this case, we won't do too much of that live because the dress that she's wearing is so form-fitting, it's hard for her to sit and lay down, but that's okay, that's fine. This, that's a real-world situation we'll have to deal with too. But I'll show you how to do that through the lecture slides. Okay. So, this is the one way to do it, and it's popping the hip towards the light. Uh, it's very similar to the groom pose, right? The head tilt, uh, the hip and the head in the same direction. So, whenever, this is basically whenever you tell a woman, oh, give me something sexy, this is what they do. They pop their hip out, and they do this, right? This is it. This, that's what happens. And so generally what you want to do is you pop the hip out, the head's out. It's kind of like the same as a guy, right? And it gives you, but it could be a little bit more curvy to it, whereas uh, more aggressive in that curve and that pop the hip. And let's do this. And it creates that curve. That's what you like. Watch. Let's see that curve, right? So actually, let's bring Hannah, Hannah right? That's Hannah, right? Look at how beautiful she is. Get ready. Wow. Okay. So let's try to have her do this. Okay. Why don't you come over here? So what you're going to do is you're going to pop out your hip this way. Oh, you can do it this way. Okay. Yeah, do it this way here. And then kind of look off to the seat. See that? And then look to me. Right? See that curve that she has right here? Um, and it's very much like a guy's pose. She can look off this way. If she looks off this way, I could put the light that way. If she looks more towards me, I could try to do it, define the line so I can shoot her wide. I can come back, I could shoot her wide, then I can shoot her tight. Whenever you've got a great pose, wherever you shoot it, it looks good. So if you want to judge your photos, look at the pose, and wherever you zoom in, if it's on the hands or if it's on the ear or wherever, it should look beautiful then you know you've got a perfect pose. 
no matter where you zoom in on that. All right, thank you, Hannah, for demonstrating that. Okay, so that curve comes out there. Okay, now look at this. This is interesting. Um, you can make somebody popping that hip more masculine or feminine. If you have the hip, okay, here's the camera. Where's the camera? Right here. Okay, here's the camera. If I have the hip going away from the camera here, I'm looking more masculine. But if I move the hip forward towards the camera, I'm looking more feminine. But it's the same pose. So you can vary masculine to feminine. It's just you can use that to your advantage how you want that person to look. And so here it is, the exact same pose I did for the male. Does she still look like a woman? She looks great, right? Head, nose towards the light, head lean to break the stiffness. So that's the same. It's the, that pose is exactly like the guy's pose where I'm off this way and you're breaking that, just breaking that head tilt that way to get that curve, right? But it's the same pose I did for a man, but maybe now you have the variation of doing the same thing up here like this. It's the same pose, but just the position of this hip makes it look different, okay? So you can experiment with that. I, I recommend the light source is always going towards uh, the face. You could actually do that with your bride. You, let's bring Hannah in again and let's try that. So I'm going to have you, what I like to do is I like to demonstrate first, and I don't know what's that saying about me, but <laughs> I like to demonstrate first. So um, I'm going to have you, you like to lean this way. Well, does it? See, she's talented. Let's just go this way. So we're going to have you kind of like, a, if this is the camera here, you're going to kind of position this way, and you're going to bend your hip away from the camera like this, and then I'm going to have you come up towards the camera. But your head is always going to be, so why don't you stand right there, right? So you're going to turn that way. Yeah, you just follow me, right? And then you pop your hip this way. Okay, now let's look. See, she has a very masculine feel. Turn, turn, turn your head like this. Okay, towards me, just bend it just a bit. Right there. Okay, can you exaggerate that hip a little bit more? There you go. See how I made her do that? Just that extra little oomph I need from her. Okay, now let's rotate. Keep your head where it is, kind of, but let's rotate that hip up. Yeah, and do that. Too much. Let's go back here. And then do that same thing, pop the hip, and then you can bring the shoulder up like, like this, and then look. That's going to give me something more feminine. Turn your head more that way. It's the same thing, but it has a different feel, but it's the same thing. And you can see the look is quite different. But it's the same pose. But this to the position of, thank you, Hannah, uh, of the position of the, of the hip. So there you go. You've got a variety of poses with the same pose right there. Something very simple. Okay, so look at the difference. That one, that picture there, the first one posed like the male is very masculine. Then I brought her hip forward, and then I was able to do something more girly with the arms, and it looks a totally different. Don't those two look different? They look completely different, but it's the same exact pose. It's just between where the hips are in relation to the camera, and then because this is more feminine, it gives you license to do more feminine things. When you're doing something masculine, your options are list limited. When you're doing something more feminine, there, now I could do this, I could do that, I could do this, whatever, it's all there for you. But it's the exact same pose. Questions on this? We don't have time for questions because we gotta keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Hip away from the camera. Hip towards the camera, okay? See her hip is away, and that one's towards it. And it has a different feel to it. That one on the right has a little bit more feminine feel to it, versus that one on, on the left has a little bit more masculine feel to it. So if you look at this, it doesn't that look pretty much identical, right? Whereas you still get that curve from the guy, and you still get that curve. It's, it, it looks like the same thing. It is the same thing. They work for both. So if you learn one pose, you could just do it for both. OK, so here's another one where we can also do is a same thing. Lean. Isn't this look familiar? Didn't we do this with the guy? 
where we're leaning her against uh, the something. Doesn't that look the same there? Right? And you can see that it's the exact same pose. Whereas with the gentleman, we could remember, who was that? Did I pose you? Yeah. I pushed, I just angled his hips back. Like if he's leaning here, if he's leaning here like this, I put his hips back further so that shoulder would look higher. Right? But it's exactly the same pose. So for the guy, you can maybe push the hips back a little bit, whereas the woman, you could put her hips even towards the camera too, um, and it will look okay. And we'll get into it. Well, maybe we'll, we'll try that. But see that? Now that's exaggerated. If you were going on the Bahamas uh, workshop with me right after this, she's going to be there posing, so that's going to be great. So see how exaggerated that is? That curve that comes out there, right? The head tilt uh, towards the hip, right? Arms away from the waist. That's another thing what you want to do is get your arms away from the waist so you could see her shelf. Let's bring Hannah back into here. And let's have her pose the same thing, the, just uh, your hips this way. Yeah, right, and you're looking up that right. Now let's put your arms close to your waist. Just, right, let's do the wrong, yeah. I'm gonna purposely do something wrong. Okay. So exaggerate that hip like that, and then you're just gonna keep your arms like, she's so darn skinny, she looks great anyways. But, <laughs> so what you wanna do is make sure you can see this space in here, so there has to be space here. Why? Making a woman look like a woman. What is a woman? It's that hip there. So if you've got your arms there covering it up, you're not seeing what a woman is. So that's why you have to kind of accentuate that. Some people make them put their hand behind that there, or see how she moves her arm in, um, and, or she can kind of put her arm up this way, and you're kind of leaning to put your chin down. Exaggerate your hip a little bit more, right? Uh, and so you're accentuating that waist, thank you, Hannah, is make sure those arms are away from the waist. It's probably better that I do it because I'm not wearing a mermaid <laughs> outfit. So watch, right? I'm popping the hip this way, looking this way. And you can't see my waist. So if I move my arms back, you're going to see that space in there. And it's going to accentuate that curve, curvature in a woman. Okay, here's again. I'm popping the hip. The nose is towards the light. So basically, it's like if I was posing right here, right? Let's say if I was posing right here, I could have her look towards this area here. And I pop the hip. And this is when you're having a little bit of trouble with the bride. She's not natural. She's not like Hannah. She's, she hasn't posed before. This is the first time she's ever posed in her entire life. She's feeling like a little bit uh, nervous, lean them on something. It's a lot easier when somebody is leaning on something to do, to do a pose uh, because they don't have to support themselves the right way. So lean them up, up against the wall, pop that hip out, put the nose towards the light, and you're um, uh, going to get a good shot every single time. It might not be like super fabulous, but it's consistent. And even a lot of people don't even do this. So you're ahead of the game. <laughs> okay, arms away from waist. There's that curve right there. That's what you're going for, that curve right in. Same thing. Nose towards the? Right. right. Okay. And it's a little bit more feminine because the hips, the way she's, she's leaning and the hips are, are a little bit more towards the camera. That pose will not work for a guy. I'm sorry. Because the hip is towards the camera. And it, it, when that happens, it's more feminine and not masculine. Hip has to be away from the camera for it to be masculine. So that's why if you bring the shoulder up at the same time, it's going to have that feminine feel. So look it. I, I turned her face. Right? Do you see that line defined? And then the light, her nose is pointing towards the light. The other side of her face is defined by shadow. Perfect. Right there. And what I always like to do is when, especially if you have bright light, but it works in this case too, is that 
especially if they're wearing a white dress, is the body always goes away from the light. The body away from the light, the face towards the light. Why is that? Anybody know? Shadow. You got it. Shadow. Look at now in this particular photo here where you're going to get all this shadow in here and it's going to define the shape. Make a woman look like a woman. So if you don't see a shadow here, you're not going to like see the best part of the woman or, you know, one of the best parts. <laughs> so that's why if you turn the body, especially if this was really bright light coming in, then you have to get that shadow or else you're not going to define the shape. Shadow defines shape. Without shadow, you're not going to get shape. So that's why it's important to have that too. And it also has that slimming effect on people, especially on the face. Her face is a little bit wider. I had to put shadow on her face to, to me if I'm photographing her because her face is wider. So it's a must. So when you see somebody, you know, they can be very pretty, but it's just that they have a wider face. You've got to get that shadow on them. Okay. There it is there. Okay, this is the other end, where I call it the more of a classic, traditional, okay? Um, and this is uh, what I used to call, like, the walk-away pose. And why I called it the walk-away is I was walking away from the what? Light. So I was walking away. So um, what, this camera's on here. So what I, happening here is, let's say the light is coming this way, how this works is that I'd be walking away from the light so I could get shadow here, popping this hip, and then looking back at the camera. Okay? This is very classic. This is probably the number one pose in the world because it pretty much works on every body type. And so it's a very long, elegant pose. And you're getting this diagonal line here this way because the curve is not as accentuated as if I were to do this. See that? Versus this is longer here. So to really see the difference of poses, let's say I started, I'm going to show you the two. Let's say my light, I mean my head is pointed this way here, right? And I wanted to keep my head there but do the different pose. If I shift the weight on the other leg, don't I look longer now? Right? So that's completely different versus this. So I could have the light coming from one direction. I can have them do both poses because I could do this long look this way, right? And then I could also do this look this way. Those are the two different types. This is more kind of modern and, and sexy and fashion feel, where this is more elegant and kind of... Uh, you know, um, just elegant and confidence and sophisticated. So you can look at your bride and you can see how they are, how they're dressed, what type of person they are. You can kind of sum them up. Maybe if they're a little bit older bride, they might not be into this kind of thing, you know, if they're in their 40s or something like that. But everybody looks good in this. It's not as over the top, this, ooh, that stuff, right? But it's classic. It earns you money. It's solid. It looks good. And so that's why I usually start off like teaching people this pose here because it generally works for everybody. If you look through the fashion magazines, you'll see it all the time. It's there constantly. A lot of times now when they do it, they do it like this and they just drop this arm down. But they can hold some flowers right here. And the key to that is, is you're popping this hip out like this, you're putting this knee in here like this. So you get this mermaid. She's already wearing a mermaid, so it's, it's kind of giving you that right there, like this, and long. So let's have her, Hannah come in and let's have her do that pose where you're going to, say, I, let's say I'm the camera. Right? So um, the camera's going to be over here. So she's going to uh, come here. You're going to pop out this hip this way, and you're going to look off this way like that. Right? And you can just exaggerate it a little bit more. Right? And you're going to look off that way. 
right? And so instead of, it's a, it has a little bit more elegant feel to it. Let's turn your body this way. So the light would be coming in this way, and she's looking off this way, here, okay? And look at me. Put your head this way a bit, too much down, over this way, right? And then exaggerate that hip a little bit more, right there. See, I can tell by the way she's posing that, and she's uh, interacting, that she's used to doing this pose because she naturally wants to go to this pose. And maybe that's her power pose or whatever. <laughs> so I'm actually having her do something a little bit different than she's accustomed to. Um, so you have to take that in consideration too when you're posing somebody, uh, especially if you've only got one minute. Sometimes I'll just scrap it. I'll just, okay, let's just stick with the curvy because that's what she does. Uh, but if no one has, but I'm telling you the person, thank you, Hannah, but the person who's never posed before in their entire life, I actually don't go to the curvy, I go to the, to the walk away diagonal type of pose because it's not as aggressive and everybody looks good in it. Okay? Does anybody have any questions about that? Versus, see, this is, this is the, the curvy here. This way, and then this is the more, and then you, if I'm switching, I'm keeping the head the same, but I'm using this diagonal instead versus this curve here. This is more diagonal, okay? Um, so let's, we can break it down a little bit. See how traditional that looks? Okay, it's not something over the top. The hip is away. So basically the hip is away from the camera. At that point, uh, the head is towards the light. Scott? Yes. How about a quick question from the internet over here? Sure. You have, you have for a question? Cool. So a lot of people are asking about what your workflow is to get your models, your brides, into the proper positions. Do you talk them through getting into them? Do you actually, will you touch them a little bit to get them into that right look that you're um, looking for? I don't touch them right away, <laughs> but maybe if, you know, we're going through the whole day and I, and I feel really comfortable with the bride or whatever, I start that. Um, but I, in general, I, I don't move. Sometimes I do, especially if we had an engagement session before and they know it, I, I feel comfortable with it. I was like, hey, pop that hip out. I usually, this is my method, I yeah. show them. That's my method. Great. I show them first. Perfect. So if I was going and doing something uh, against uh, a pose, I would say, hey, I want you to do this. Pop your hip out this way and then look over here or whatever, right? Uh, look back that way. And oh, I just want you to feel like you're really cold or something. You know, I, so I actually get into it. I go into <laughs> character, right? And I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to feel like a woman. And it was very foreign to me. Very, very. I'm like, this is weird. But the, the strange thing is, is that I kind of like it now. <laughs> I mean, it's like I, I have to pose that way. I have, so like when I, like I'm in a, in a, in a I'm over here right? And I want to pose there. I can't tell the client to go over there. You know what I have to do? I have to feel it. So I go, oh shoot, I'm in this chair here. If I was a woman, like what would I do? Uh, uh, something like this. So I get into character, right? And I show that, I, can we do something like this, you know, where you're looking across? And I show them and I go to that place. They laugh at me and they go, wow, that guy's pretty good doing the poses. And then it allows them to go there too. So that's my method. Everybody has to come up with their own way of dealing with things, but that's how I do it. I find that it's easiest. Yes. Uh, what if you ask them to do something and you feel like they're not comfortable with it? Do you pull back or kind of tell them, okay, trust me, it's going to work? Or, I mean, how we do um, it? Usually the reason why it doesn't work is that our technical skill is not high enough. It's our fault. Oh, okay. It's always my fault. So, and, that's, and that's the way I, I do it because if I can't break it down to where it looks good, it's something about me. I'm not telling them something correct. It's never the model. In the real fashion world, it's always like if you ever watch the America's Top Model and everything, if I talk to her, just sits there, clicks away, they set up the light, takes them four hours to set up the light, and they just click, 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 and it's always up to the model, right? Because that's what it's about. The model giving the look, the model. As a wedding photographer, I have to generate all that. They're not models, so it's all on me. 
And so if they're not looking right, it's we need to get better. That's my thing. It's like we don't have it down yet. But that's OK. You just get up and go to something. That's why I always start with something that I know that I can do first. And then I break into the other side. And if it doesn't quite work out, that's fine, because I at least have something. And you know, we're going to do that. We're going to go through weddings. A lot of times, where it's not going to work out, that's OK. We'll get it next time. But we're practicing. And you get to the point where you get better and better. So don't be afraid to fail during the wedding day. But the one thing you want to do is you just don't want to have it experimental time. You've got to get something first. OK, you've got to hit that single first and then go ahead from there. OK, uh, let's keep going. Nose towards the light, but the opposite direction of the hip. OK, if the base and foundation of the pose is correct, everything else will look correct. So look it. I went back. I shot this photo, but I'm just coming in closer. Right? Just change it, and it all looks beautiful. When you get the base correct, everything else looks correct. You can shoot it anywhere. Just change the emotion or change the look off or whatever, and, it, and you got a completely different look with one pose. And so that's what you want to do is that you want to be able to do one pose but get a bunch of different looks at it because you only got one minute to shoot the bride. Okay, I want you to get that in your head. Okay, you've, whenever you're practicing or whatever, I got one minute to knock this out of the park. I got one minute. Practice it that way. Get it into your head that way. That way you're going to uh, feel a lot better about going into your sessions and not realizing, thinking that you have all this time. OK, so see that diagonal feel that I'm getting with that? And that's what this shot is doing. And it's creating a diagonal across the screen. It's breaking the spine. And it's looking, everything is looking natural. But I 100% posed her. Almost all the photos that you see, I am 100% posing, tweaking, making it look the way I want to do it. Um, same kind of thing where she has that diagonal across there. That way, uh, a very elongated. OK, here's another thing that we talked about. Here's the same like walk away. She's walking away towards the light so I can see shadow on her. That light is above her. Her nose is towards the light. light. So for example, let's say the light was here. OK? Don't put your subject here and look towards the light. You'd be like this. Doesn't look good, right? So if the light was here, I'm going to either pose my client out this way. So now when I look up, it's not as strained like this. Or I'm going to pose them out this way. right? And so the strain is not as great as if there was the light. So here's the light this way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk away from the light and look back towards the light. And that's going to be the pose and put the this, or we could do the cutesy or whatever that she's, I made her throw out her dress. That's that pose right there, OK? It's the nose towards the light. She's walking away from it so we can get the shadow. See the shadow here? Getting that and then putting her knees together to create more shape. Um, but, and then look towards the light. It's a very basic pose. Nothing special about it, nothing over the top, but it gets you paid. And you can master it. You can master it by going out on a few sessions and just working with people. I suggest you just don't get models, because models give it to you too easy. That doesn't sound right, right? <laughs> <laughs> models, um, yeah, it's too easy. No, I got to use not. Well, anyways, you know what I mean, right? Use normal people uh, that haven't modeled before. And then you really have to work them, because that's the real world. So get some really good looking friends, and just take them out and work these things, uh, and you'll learn a lot from it. Okay, So that hips out that way, the nose uh, towards the light, knees together. Here it is again. When OK, so she had never really modeled before, uh, or posed before. So I realized that she was having a difficulty doing some of these poses. So I just leaned her on something. Right? So you can even have a chair, right? So if, if they can't do it this way, right, you can have them lean on 
something just to support them. Or in this way, uh, let's say the light was coming this way. You could have them lean here, and they have support here, too. Okay? Leaning on something. A diagonal feel to the pose. Okay, here's another one to create the diagonal, is they're simply just leaning back and doing something like this. So a lot of times if I'm doing a, let's, let's try it with Hannah. So if you're just, I want you to kind of lean back on this, on this rail, but kind of put your arm, uh, let's just do it like you're resting your arm this way. So it's not, see that? And then look towards that light that way. Look, put your chin up, right? And then exaggerate your hip this way. Yeah, you can put your hip out that way. Yeah, okay, and you're leaning back and you're looking up, right? And, so, and then I'll have the light right here. Keep looking up. I have that light coming right down on her face that way. And it gives me that long, elegant diagonal feel, but it's the same thing. I'm just breaking the spine angle with it. All right, thank you, Hannah. And so that's what you can do a lot of times. You can try this lean back pose, and it's giving you that diagonal feel to it. Here, same thing again. I'm breaking the spine. That's all I'm doing. And whenever I do that, you know, you have the nose towards the light, and it's very dramatic. So when you have the head, you know, I told you that you should have the head different from the, from the body direction, but you can have it the same, but it has to be exaggerated. It has to be like, oh, wow, right, Cleopatra like this. Um, so when you're going to do that, you have to sell it. It's an event. When you do a lean back, it's more like a sophisticated, elegant, royal tea type, type of feel to it, right? Um, and that's when you use that pose. So here's some bamboo here, and I just have her leaning back there creating that diagonal long nose is towards the light. I had a, a flash with an umbrella right above her, and that's how I created that light there. Okay, so another thing, so she's leaning against the, um, the wall, right? She's leaning back, having her close her eyes, looking up. Um, I probably should have got created more space in between here, but she's never posed before in her entire life. Uh, so she was a little bit uncomfortable. So, um, but I would have created a little bit more space there. See how this is I mean, parallel to the wall? That's what's kind of, see I started to critique my own work. Oh gosh, why did I do that, right? Pulled her out a little bit more, that would have worked a bit better. Also, oh yeah, when I first did this, I had her shoulder squished up behind the pillar, but then I brought it out so she's leaning. Here, let's, let's bring that over here. Can we use this wall over here? And I can show what you mean. So let's try to copy this bow. So if you're, I'd say what I want you to do is I want you to show a difference. Like you can lean back like this here, and then I'm gonna have you lean here in front. So let's start with like smashing your shoulder against the wall, okay? But you're going to turn your body more that way and you're going to look up. So you're like at an angle like this. You're just leaning back, right? And just like put your hands over your heart and you're looking up like this and close your eyes. See, I have to get in here and actually physically mold it, but I don't really mind touching the head, but when it comes to that stuff touching, I'm like, what? <laughs> I have to kind of feel it out, right? And so like, you put your hands over your heart, then you're looking up, right? And so depending on what it is, in this situation, or depending on the column, if it's round, you might not be able to see the shoulder. So I could do the same thing again, come up this way. And now when I put the shoulder there, I'm going to see it. Same thing with a guy, too. Is, okay, so lean back, same thing right there. He's just, yeah, good. And then hold your hands over your heart and look up straight like there, like that. Bam. Right? Okay, thank you. So this shoulder position is important, too, because it could be scrunched up like this, but if you bring it out this way, you can see it. And that's what I did with her. I brought that shoulder out in front of that so I could see it. That's a really, really great tip. Is it? Yeah, okay. I, I hadn't mm. 
even considered that bringing the shoulder out yeah. back around the corner. Thank you. You got it. Okay, so see the diagonal there? Okay, now look at the difference, right? So now we have the diagonal versus the curvy. It has a different look. Look, it depends on what you want, a more sophisticated, elegant, or you want something a little bit more fashion forward. Um, and you can use those two poses to do it that way, okay? The, the thing that also, now what do you do? Okay, that's standing or leaning. What do you do when they're sitting or on the ground? And what, I, you know what? I'm just going to have to go ahead and pose these things because our model can't do it, so, right? So, okay, so this is what I call the rollover. And the easiest way to do that is, let's say this is the camera here. Um, I sit my client out. He, let's say it's on the ground. So I, ha I turn him on the side and I just have him roll over and put this leg in front and see how my hip, I don't have a butt really, but it's doing what it can. <laughs> let's have Krista, right? Let's have you do it. Just, you got way more hips than me. Aww. You look way better. And so let's have her roll over and demonstrate this. Oh, yeah, look at her beautiful hips. Okay. <laughs> Can you lie down? And then, uh, okay, let's put your legs like this, right? Per okay, right here, maybe. Okay, and then just roll over on that hip and bring this leg in front. There. Ooh, man. See that? Okay. Now, actually, if you go down to your elbow, there. Ooh, yes. Right? <laughs> and so now, and then look off this way. Put your chin, yeah, and then if I had that light right down on her right there, that'd be beautiful. And what you're trying to do is you're accentuating this area, and you can see this hip. So either it could be kind of behind or forward, but you want to see this. And that's what that does. And when you roll the leg over, it's creating this, this line here where it's narrower here than her hip. So it's accentuating her hip. Thank you. And so that's why that pose works all the time. Every single time. If you don't know what to do with a woman on the ground, that doesn't sound right either. <laughs> you can roll her over. Okay. Okay. Well, whatever. You can do this. <laughs> yes. So is that also a pose in which you'd want to create space between the arm and the hip to expose that curve? Um, well, it just depends, right, what's working. But for me, I just want to create this shape here. That's what, whether it's behind or what. Sometimes if you lift it up too high, then it's going to get in the, it's going to, it's going to confuse this line. So keep the arm away from the yeah, hip in case Yeah, I like would this. in general, yeah, and forward, right? Mm -hmm. Well, anyways, let's look at some pictures and see what I did actually. So roll the hip over to create, bring out shape. Nose hip, uh, nose and hip towards the light area there. Okay, so this is the same thing, but she's sitting down, doing the exact same thing. She's rolling over. Okay, I'm glad you brought that out. It's because even though I scar scored very high in competition, I'm looking again, I don't like it. Why don't I like this picture? At, the arm I, the yeah, because I'm not, I go, well, make a woman look like a woman. I go, well, I didn't right there. I'm like pissed off now. So. <laughs> I would bring that in more so I could see that hip a little bit more, right? I probably would have got a higher score if I would have did that. Uh, but that's the same type of pose. Look back, so I had one flash over here. That's it. Roll over, look back towards the light. Same thing here. She's rolling over. This, but she didn't actually cross her legs all the way over because it was uncomfortable for her, but she's just rolling over looking back towards the light, and it's accentuating this curve right there. You want to see that curve. You want to bring it out. Same thing here. She was a dancer. She brought her ballet shoes. So uh, I go, hey, you know what? Let's, we were in New York. And let's go, hey, let's get on this truck and roll over. I can see the shoes. I was using a wide angle lens. But you still feel that shape that she has there, and it's very elegant. She's looking back towards the light. Same thing here, where she's rolling over, looking towards the light again. I guess it looks okay because it's black here, but 
because um, even if she were to move her arm over, maybe I would have had her arm come out a bit because I would like to see some space right in there. Say, so look at my photos right now. I hate them. It's like, ugh. <laughs> okay, but she's doing the pose, and if I could create a little bit more space there, that would be better if I could see the hip, but it's the same principle. So she's leaning up and then looking back towards uh, the light. See what she did with her arm there? She put it back um, so you can see that. It's a very simple pose, but it works for a lot of things. Okay, so if she can't roll over and she's like sitting, she can just definitely lean instead of uh, doing the same thing. So for example, if I were to do it, shoot like maybe this chair right here, so I could definitely kind of, let's say I want to kind of do this, but I couldn't, um, I couldn't roll over for se, per se, but I could just lean like this and I could look back, right? So my hip is coming out this way. I'm moving this arm out of the way so you could see this curve <laughs> and then you're just looking back this way, right, towards the camera. And they don't have to actually roll over, they could just lean. And it looks good. But it's, it's probably better if there's something hard that she's um, leaning on. And here's another thing. It's the same pose, creating different emotion, and then doing the same thing, but varying it. Those photos all look different, don't they? It's the same pose. It's the same thing. She's rolling, she's leaning up and putting, making that hip higher on this left hand side and looking back. Uh, this one she's closing her eyes looking back all the way. This one she's just looking at me. The light's coming this way. You see that nice shadow right there in her face? And then I just reversed it. I have her do something. I reversed the light, but I had her do the same pose. And I, and I, but it looks completely different. It's one pose. It's the same thing. Just leaning. It's basically just leaning up on something. Right? Oh, I could do it in this chair. Right. So it's just basically leaning up on something and looking back, and then maybe putting this arm forward like this so you could see that area there, that shape. Identical pose, change the motion, change the light direction. Uh, make sure the arm doesn't cover the hip. That's very important. So see how I brought her arm all the way forward? It's not natural to do that. It doesn't feel right, but you make her pull that arm through so you can see this curve there, okay? Look at this. This is two poses. This is the curvy and the diagonal into one where she's rolling, she's making this hip higher. She's, see how she's leaning this way and her head is more that way? So it's creating this curve here. And then she's doing the diagonal where the hip away is from the camera, looking back at the camera. And it has, so one has a little bit more uh, classic modern feel, and this has a little bit more modern feel to it. Eight things to do with hands and arms. This was one thing that it was hard for me to figure out doing earlier in my career. Um, and this is like I could get the pose down or whatever, but I had no idea what to do with these, these things and how to do it, how to, you know. So I'm going to give you eight suggestions on what to do now there's many more, but I'm just gonna give you eight, and I actually don't use a lot of these, but I do once in a while. The first one is what I call the cigarette. And it's as if you were smoking a cigarette. All right, so everybody do that. Get their arm up, and you're smoking a cigarette, right? And this is with the palm up, right? 
And so that's kind of the feel, but you're just touching your face. I'm smoking a cigarette. <laughs> right? And that's the feel. The palm is up. And that's this, what I call the cigarette, but the palm up. This is the incorrect way to do the cigarette. Why? Yeah, because there's a stiffness here, and that wrist is not broken. OK? And so that's why I say palm up, because I break that wrist. So let's actually let's bring Hannah in so she can kind of demonstrate and what I do. So, if, so what I want you to do is kind of uh, put your hand like this. Right? And so if she, what I, sometimes they'll just do this. They'll keep this wrist straight. And so what I do is I just say, it has to be, you have to feel this. Shake it out. Get it loose. And then, yeah, right? And so it's going to be really loose. I'll just like, say, break it this way. Right there. She ha they have to feel that. You go like this and then feel that break. See that? Feel it? That's what has to happen. So it's either palm up or, and then kind of touch your, Chin this way with your index finger, or you could do palm down this, and she could do the same thing, whatever chin or right here. But they're both this, it's what I call the cigarette feel. It's that, that feel to it. All right, thank you, Hannah. So breaking the wrist is very important, it needs to be broken, okay? Another huge thing is, what, when I was doing headshots, didn't I say that the line that she created on the headshot was sacred? Don't get near it with the hands. Where is her hand? It's on the shadow side. Because where's the line? That's the sacred. This is sacred. Don't mess with that. Because that's defining the face. So you could put all the other stuff on the other. Now, if you look at this, what happens if you didn't have light to create that shadow? What could cover up this area? The hand right there. So you could use your hand as a slimming feature too, but don't do it on the line side. So if I'm doing this and I'm posing and, and you tell me to turn here, my line is here, then I would do something over here. I don't want to mess with this area here and throw off that line because that's defining the face. Okay? Palm up. So now you can do palm down. The line is on this side here. And it, believe me, trust me, I've got a lot of photos where the hand is on that side. Ah, darn it! Why did I do that? I still make mistakes even to this day. It's like, you know, uh, you're going to keep making them, but you just get better and better as you, as you do them. Lightly touch the face. Another reason why you want to lightly touch it is because you don't want to distort it, right? So if you're touching it and it's like this, like di it's distorting the face, right? So you just want to lightly touch things because you want to keep that, that face. Tap the shoulder. You see that all the time. They're tapping that shoulder. They've got the bent wrist. The head usually, oh, usually always goes towards the shoulder that she's tapping. So if I'm doing this pose and I'm tapping this shoulder, I'm looking this way. Because it keeps it. So that, what it's doing is that hand is drawing attention doing this, right? So if I have the face looking the other way, then I've got attention here attention there and it's kind of split but if I keep it this way all the attention is here so the hands really just magnify the face see that tap the shoulder she's leaning her head towards that way same thing here now, this is the sort of the same thing, but I call this the necklace. It's like if you're, you're playing with the necklace right here. And again, it's on the shadow side because that line is sacred. You don't want to mess with that line. And so you keep everything away. And so it's a natural, you're looking like this. Right? And so if you put the hand over there, it's cluttering and it's like, ugh. 
Right? Same thing here. What are you looking? How are you looking? There. Shadow side. Same thing, but this way it's more of a side view. Right. This is what I call the polite clap. <laughs> <laughs> So you're posing and you're doing things as if you were clapping politely. <laughs> and so you can, you know, right? So now this one, right, I actually did it on the wrong side. If I were to do this again, I would do it on the other side because that's the line right there and I'm messing with it. So I would have probably done it on the other side. Okay? So that same thing too, is that, that it's on, that's wrong, it's all wrong. Whoop! But I couldn't find any polite clap where I did it right. But anyway, so I'm showing it, right? And so, but it still looks good. Still looks good. That's the polite clap. And then another one is the hold my heart type of feeling, right? A lot of times that works where they're closing their eyes. And anything in there, you can always do that with your, your hands too, right? Has that certain feel to it. I made sure this arm was away from that. There. Oh, now, look it. This is my hold my heart with the polite clap together. It's like, <laughs> wow, she's got some talent there. I found out that she had done some posing before, and so I'm like, no wonder why. I, see, I didn't even tell her to do that. She just automatically did it herself. I go, oh, that looks good. Let's take a picture. Uh, but so that's two in one there, boy. That's some talent. This is what I call the V-frame. You see this a lot, where the arm will frame the head. OK? This V here creates a framing of the head. And that's why it works, because it frames and centers that head, because the head's all over the place. And that's why you see this pose a lot, because it helps frame that head. And what has to happen, let's see if I, there's a V there. And what has to happen is if there's a yin, there has to be a yang. And what I mean by that is, let's say I'm posing. And if I have this pose and I tell this person to stick this arm out right here, it doesn't look right. That looks awkward. It looks like it's going to be like this. So if there's a yin, there has to be a yang. So I can create yang by doing this and this. It starts to balance. So whenever you look at your hands, that's why they never say to keep your hands on the same level. One's higher than the other, because there, if there's a yin, there's a yang. And so when you're posing, if you say have some, somebody posing and they're reaching out there, you know this principle is like, oh, maybe I should pop this, this um, elbow out a little bit more, because I got a lot of motion this way. I got a, oh, then maybe she has to put her hip out more if she's leaning that way to balance it out. So if you remember this principle with your arms and the hands, that there must be some balance. So a lot of times when you see this, you're going to see this too on the other side. You're creating two Vs. That's kind of like a V, but I call it, oh, I didn't, call, but it's like, oh, I got a fever. <laughs> okay? Oh, look at this. This is a V with a polite clap. This is in Paris. Um, and actually, what was funny was doing this workshop. She's actually a student. Uh, she's very pretty, but, and she bought her wedding dresses, and she wants some shots of her and that, which is fine. And so we were, wa we were uh, going through the subway, there was this ballerina, and she did this pose. And so every time we would go to our hotel, we'd pass by this poster with this ballerina doing this type of pose. And so, actually, so she did it there, and it looked great. You got bright light. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the light. But what you nose towards the light. 
light, right? Put them in there. Now I got this beautiful shadow here. I got this line here. I've got this V here, right? And I've got the yin, and I got the yang there. And I just did this other shadow in Lightroom. Okay, very easy. <laughs> that other shadow wasn't there. So actually, you, let's say you didn't even have this shadow, you could create both shadows if you wanted to. So that's something for you to remember. You just get, if you have extreme bright light, you have no idea what to do, you could just pose her like that. Now, you don't make her look into the bright sun. That's why their eyes are closed, okay? And put two shadows on it in Lightroom. Bam, there you go. Okay, the chin pointer. This is almost like the tap the shoulder, whereas, you know, the chin pointer I always almost do at a profile like this. I never do the chin pointer like this. <laughs> Doesn't look right, right? But you could do the chin pointer. And it's usually that elegant, it works with the diagonal a lot, that elegant feel, right? See how I did this to profile? and I had the side lighting, and I got that nice shadow across her face there. Okay, this is the Ravage, uh, hands into the hair, s slightly squinty eyes, and I actually don't even have any photos like that, so we're gonna bring Hannah up. She can demonstrate this shot. Where you got this Ravage, so Hannah, what I want you to do is, um, I'll be right here, and you're gonna just like, Put your hands in your hair, and you're going to kind of give me that squinty kind of, <laughs> oh, well, you could just kind of fake it, right? See that? See that little squint in her eyes there? Look at me right there, and then just kind of push your hair up a little bit, right? And then try to keep one hand separate from the other, right there, like that, that kind of feel to it, right? Giving that kind of squinty look, hitching down, look at me, right there, ooh, see? That right there, love that, see that? That's, what, that's the feel, that slightly squinty feel to it. All right, thank you. Um, and that's the eight things to do with the hands. That gives you, so you could actually, you know, do the same pose, but you could just change the position of these hands. And you've got a lot of material. They actually, okay, if you're going to do the kind of ravage me feel, that's completely different than the cigarette feel, but it's the same exact pose. So depending on these hand positions, so whenever I say, uh, let's say chin pointer, oh, already in your mind you're thinking elegant and this feeling, right? Uh, so the hands have a lot to do with the expression, or always like um, hold my heart, right? What do you feel? This. So the emotion can be expressed with these, and this is the final piece, I feel. When a photographer gets to that world-class level, they know what to do with these. That's it, because it can add so much to the photo, but you can screw it up so easy, too. So it's really difficult, but that is the final, that was my final step. I don't know about everybody else. But I, and then just judging photos, I can tell good hands or not. A lot of times, you get great hands when the model knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, but you're going to be you're going to work with normal people, and they've never done this stuff before, right? And you're going to show that to them, and they're going to be amazed about uh, what you can do with how you work these hands. So these are the eight different ways to do it. Um, any questions on these? Yes. So uh, these all work with a female, uh, with yes. a bride. We're all talking but none about of bride. these would work at all with a man, I assume. I don't know. Do I look good doing this? <laughs> well, you look fabulous. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you can try and not. Sh uh, oh, there's another thing that I forgot to tell you. When you're doing this head thing, if if you can come back over here, I'm going to film over in this way. Okay, so let's say you're doing the lean thing, right? You got the, this out and you're looking this way, right? Um, don't put your arm this way because it's very natural to use the arm when you're leaning on something, okay? So whenever you're doing this thing, it's always it's leaned against the wall because that's what looks natural. That's what we normally would do, right? We'd, we'd do the, oh, maybe it got, yeah. Guess what? 
You can do it with a guy, if that's like this or something, right? I don't know, does that look good? I can't see myself. But <laughs> if, I, if you give me split lighting, I guess it would look good. So that's the one thing to do with that arm there. If you're gonna do this and it's next to the wall, make sure if the wall is here, make sure you're doing it against here and not there because it doesn't look natural because what are you leaning on, right? If you wanna do the back pose, okay? The important thing about doing a pack pose, it's the exact same thing, but you're just you know, turning around. So let's say you're doing the curvy like that, right? It's actually the exact same thing looking back, okay? But the important part about this pose is that you need to see what makes a woman a woman, right? So you need to see this, the chest area and the booty. So, it's always, so if you look in the magazines, um, they're always gonna, when you see that type of pose, you're gonna always see that feminine feature come out. So you can do it, but just make sure that you see both there. Okay? Okay, this is um, uh, doing the poses with wide angles so you can capture the locations uh, of it. Okay? Okay, this is very important. You can predetermine your unique pose if the location is iconic. Let's say you're going to New York or you're going for the Eiffel Tower. If you think in your mind of a unique pose in that iconic location, that picture could be one of your signature images. Okay? If you're in a very um, iconic location, but you think of a pose that's different or creative, that pose you could be famous for because you're combining two things. You're combining a very popular area and you're combining something that's unique and done properly and it could put you over the mark and that could be one of your signature shots. Uh, so just remember that. I, so this, this is a very important picture to me because this is the very first time in my life I imagined that exact thing in my mind three months before I was there. I knew I was going to do a session in New York City, and I go, what's New York City? Times Square. Okay, what can I do in Times Square that I've never seen before? I could do the death bride pose and put her on the ground and make it something different. And that taught me about the power of having vision. So if you're gonna know you're gonna go somewhere, um, think of something, it's the same thing with this picture. This picture has been seen all around. So w whenever I, like magazines contact me and say, oh, can you send me some imagery? They always pick this one out, every single time. But I had this picture in my mind before I even shot it, before I went, okay? And so that's the power of having vision. So if you're gonna do a portrait, you're gonna do it in an iconic area. This is in Hawaii with the diamond head. That mountain's very famous. I had that shot in my mind even before I shot it. Use wide angle to capture the environment in it also. That's in Spain. That's, you know where that is, Louvre, okay? Mix some raw emotion into your portrait session. So just don't do all these things. You also have to have some raw emotion with it um, and blend that into uh, your posing. And that reflects on you. If you can't generate that positivity, or that lightness and that funness, they're not gonna give that to you, it's not, or it's not even gonna look natural. And they're, or there's, uh, they just, they won't buy into it. They have to buy into you first, you lead them there. You're leading them there into that particular emotion. I know for a fact that that's one of my strong points. I can do that, so, um, and it's something that I learned. I didn't even know it was my strong point since some, someone pointed it out to me but I have this natural positive energy and I can make people feel relaxed and that they can give me this raw emotion. So I always try to have that part of my um, shots. So this is what you can do for people, okay? I did this session, she had never taken any photos in her life before and she literally, this is who she is. This is what she felt doing, going into that session. But after working with somebody, you can actually, not that this is not beautiful, 
of course this is beautiful. But as your job as a photographer, you're supposed to show them different sides of their beauty that they've never even seen before or that they never even seen exist before. They didn't even know. Sometimes you shoot these people and you make them look gorgeous and, and sexy and I go, I've never seen myself that way before and they're almost like in tears because it's such a different type of beauty. Right? And so now I'm, I'm doing this, working with them. See, look at the look on the face there versus that. Right? You need to bring your clients into this area where you get the look. And that, okay, you could have the posing down and the hands and everything, but to bring a client from here to give you that look could take you several years to master. And that's the difference between world class, that's the difference between being good and being world class, is bringing somebody through that process of doing that. That's the special sauce, I call it. Now look at your photos, look at your portraiture. Does it have that feeling of that special sauce in there consistently? And that, that will show you where you know, we need to work at some things. <laughs> Most important rules, your subjects will mirror you, okay? I say it over and over again. They're going to do what you are. And so you have to go there. You have to get through that baggage or whatever that you're feeling, and you have to just go to that area, okay? So anyways, now we can go for questions. Uh, but that's from Dim Sum Girl, whose question is, how do we know what style or feel to use for each of the brides? Like, when do we do sexy? When do we do elegant? Ah, when do we do the innocent? That is both? good. And sending love from San Francisco. Uh, what I do is I, I kind of quickly assess who they are, how they're dressed, how high their heels are. That'll tell you a lot. Isn't there a difference between a, a woman walking in that has heels that high versus wearing flats? Right? And so I've kind of assessed on how they're dressing. And, and very quickly, you're going to kind of discover their personality as, as you go. And so I start them off usually what I feel that they are. But if they surprise me and do something different and really get into something sexy, I'm like, I get, whoa, OK, we can go there too. And you have to first start off thinking, feeling. And it, it just takes practice. It's not something. It's kind of this innate sense of reading people, OK? There's no like rules. Is there rules on how to read a person? Not really, right? There's things that can tip you off. And that's what dressing is like. You know, somebody, the way somebody dressed tips me off to the person that they are. But it could be wrong, right? So, but it's just a clue. So I go there. I start there. They start gaining trust in me, and I see what they're capable of doing, and then I go from there. Um, and 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 it's the it's just a, a learned skill that 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 you pick up. But what makes allows you to do different things is this trust that they feel that client has in you. Um, and so the more they trust you, the more they're willing to try different things. So I hope that answers that question. That's great. All right, Scott, we're going to do one last question before sure. we go to break. This is from uh, ADB uh, Photographix. Um, do you plan your poses based on the dress the bride will be wearing, and how much does the dress come into those situations? Um, yeah, because if, if the dress is very huge and you can't really sit them down and do the rollover type of thing, right? It's not possible. So you're going to have to like stand them up and do something more elegant. Uh, mm. For example, it was very hard for Hannah to sit down, so I didn't have her do any of the rollover type of poses because it's difficult. So you do have to kind of assess that. And that's why I gave you those two kind of curvy versus the elegant, you know, the, the walk away type of tall pose versus this type of pose. So you can kind of go from there. Uh, you can expand on that, of course, but that'll give you something to start with.
I know there's been talk about uh, what do you do with a bride that's curvy or thin or whatever. I basically do, I give you two options. Um, you know, I give you the curvy and I did give you the more diagonal um, shot, you know. So if, you, if I have a bride that's a little bit uh, more curvy, I'm not going to have her, I'm not going to be so aggressive with my posing and have her do a curvy type thing. I'm going to do more of a, like, elongated diagonal feel to it. All the poses will work with anybody if it just depends on the degree of that hip popping and all that. So I would be, for a person who is a little bit more curvy, since they already have curves, you don't have to exaggerate it as much and you just have to just do it slightly and they still, the same principles will work, leaning forward, um, shifting the weight, Everything works the same, exactly, but just don't do it as aggressively uh, for somebody who's a little bit more curvy as if somebody who's thin. Somebody who's rail thin might be, have to go a little bit more aggressive to what? Accentuate that shape. And lighting is very important for a person who's uh, maybe a little bit more heavier set because it will define their body more and you can see that shape and dimension more so lighting is very key on top of that okay so now let's get into posing the couple uh, this is a long section this is actually there's even more slides here than in the last one so let's kind of just screen through this a bit these are my go-to poses and what I call this one is called the Modify Prom Pose. Anybody been to the prom, right? Okay, so uh, you guys are a couple, right? Why don't you come on up? And let, let's pretend we're at the prom, okay? So what is the prom style? Like this, right? <laughs> okay, so I do this. Okay, you can go ahead and sit down. I do this exact same pose but I just slightly modify it. And this is how I modify it, okay? If bodies are in the same direction, which it is, the prom, right? My body's going this way, her body's going this way. What I do is I make sure their heads are not doing the same thing too. And that's what makes it cheesy. When the body and the heads are doing exactly the same thing, you get cheese city. That's just like when you do the group shots and all the groups are all lined up like this, the groomsmen and all the brides are lined up like that. It's like very, when they're doing the exact same thing, you get, so what you gotta do is change it up a bit, switch it up. And what you do, uh, see the bodies are together but the heads are different. And so what they do is the heads create a T. So the one person will turn their head, okay? That's exactly what's happening in this pose. Does that not look like the prom pose there? What's different about it? Her head is turned, so her head is parallel, going parallel to her shoulders, and it's creating the T. So you could do the prom pose, but you just modify it. Same thing here. Prom pose, who's turning the head? The female. Right? So now I'm getting that T going. And what you want, what really kind of makes it is to see how she's tilting her head back? It creates that little triangle there, and that's what you want, that little space. And how you get that little space is you have to tilt her head to create that triangle there. Okay? Here's the same thing here, modified prom pose here, face towards the light. And the reason why I love this pose is because I can feature one person. And who am I featuring bride. most of the time? The bride, okay? And so that's why I love it. This is like a, a go-to pose. I love it. I, I could just live by this all day long. I mean, sometimes I never do anything else but this. Uh, because it allows me to feature one person. And I used to be a graphic designer before I became a photographer. And in graphic design, you wanted to have one, when you designed a page, basically you had one central idea and then all those elements complemented that idea. 
okay? So when I want to be a 10K wedding photographer, I am featuring mostly one person who, the bride. So I'm featuring her, and then I'm using the groom to kind of highlight her also. So that's what creates impact. Impact is created in your photos when you see immediately the main idea. When you're confused, so when you have a page and it has a whole bunch of stuff in it and it's not organized, your eye has no idea what to look at first. It has no impact. But if you, and the same thing with posing. If you feature one person first, it creates more impact. And I usually uh, pose the, I have the bride as the main feature. Um, also, if you notice, how many of these photos do you see of the bride and groom looking at the camera? None. I rarely show the bride and groom looking at the camera at the same time. I do once in a while for grandma or whatever, but my whole philosophy is this, is that every bride and groom comes and they tell you, oh, you know, I just love those photojournalistic shots where we look so natural and beautiful and whatever. Yeah, they don't know that I pose every single one of them, but I create that look. And so when you don't have, when the person, the subject is not aware of the camera, it has more of a photojournalistic feel to it. And that's what they want. And that's what I like. It has that certain feel um, that the viewer is just kind of like the fly in the wall. And we happen to catch this scene here. OK, so make sure you pop the bride's hip. Okay, and we'll get into demonstrating this after we go through this section. We'll bring the bride and groom up and we'll demonstrate it. But that hip is the same. Oh, ooh, ooh, yeah. This is another important to remember. You can't pose a couple together and you can't do it well if you can't pose one person well. Okay? You need to be a master at posing one person well in order to have couples posed well, because you can't put two mediocre things together and make it great. There's no way. So if you look at your couple posing and you're not happy with it, it doesn't move you, you don't feel something about it, it's because probably you haven't mastered posing one person right. And so when you can pose one person right, then you can add another element and it's still going to look beautiful. But if you get two mediocre things together, two mediocre doesn't make amazing. And so that's very important to, to start with one person. I can live by this pose. And so uh, basically, she's leaning in. He's leaning this way. OK? It's the prom style. But she turns her head. She's featured. I can just live with this. She can look at me, right? I can change the emotion. They can both look at me. They can both look off that way. They can both look over there. Um, I can shoot it wide, and you can see, look it. It's one pose, right? But basically, it's wide, right? And I can alter it. I can go in close. I can do something like that. Um, so you can get a variety. Then I can have her open her eyes. I can have a, a variety of things. I can live off this. Sometimes I don't even do anything other than this pose because I only got one minute. I got one minute. I know this works, and I know that the bride is featured first with it. So I start off with this pose, and it's very easy to do, and um, we'll kind of get into it uh, uh, after I get through this section. So there it is again where I am, what? Pose the bride as if she was alone, then throw the dude in, OK? That's been my philosophy. That has gotten me very far. Once I realized that philosophy, I started to make more money, a lot more money, OK? Because in general, whose wedding, I mean, the wedding is planned by who, right? Like, the bride is all into weddings. I'll give you an example of this. I'm driving my daughter to school. She's five years old. She says, Daddy, I have a problem. Oh, really, honey? What is it? What is it? She tells me, I'm not sure who I'm going to marry yet. She's five years old, OK? 
Girls have been thinking about their wedding day since they were very, very young. When do you come across a guy and he's like, right, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about my wedding day a long time, ever since I was 10 or whatever, right? Holy cow, it's completely different. And so when, I, when it comes to weddings, it's like the woman, she is fully invested in all, I mean, she loves it. She's planning the details and the invitations and all that kind of stuff. She is totally engrossed in that wedding day. And so to me, weddings, a lot of it was featuring her. Of course, I'm going to have pictures of the groom and all that kind of stuff, too. But in general, it's all about her. Now, let's do something different. This, I did, did something different. I'm featuring the guy. But it's the same. Po- look, do you notice this pose, what I'm doing? Does it look eerily familiar to that same pose we were talking about? OK, change its expression. Throw her in. It's the same thing. You can do this, too. So you could do both. So you could feature the guy. You could feature the girl um, uh, with the same pose. Okay? You have, but that has more impact to me when I see one person versus what I call equal billing. Equal billing is you're making the bride and the groom equally important, and the, and the viewer does not know what to look at first. It doesn't quite, to me, have as much impact. So if I had just the bride facing each other and looking at each other like that, and really there's no beauty of the bride being accentuated, um, it doesn't have impact to me. I need to know what, just like when I was in graphic design, what's the idea here? If you're going to do the groom, fine. Then accent, do, if you're going to do the bride, that's fine. You can also have those together shots, too. And some you can't do all like this. You could do some equal billing ones. And of course, you don't want to do the holding hands, looking out, or whatever, or looking back, of course. But really, this is the meat and potatoes that I really like, that I really feel gets you to that next level. Because it takes a lot of skill involved with this. It's not easy. That's why a lot of people don't even do it because I don't want to bother with it because I tried it and it looks terrible. It's better if I just have them naturally do something. Okay, there it is again. Um, yeah, we're in uh, Brooklyn there. I can feature her. She's the beauty here. You can also do it laying down. The same, it's this, isn't this a prom pose? It's the exact same thing, his, but his body is going this way, her body is going that way, but they're on the bed, the nose is towards the light. 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 I get this nice shadow here. I'm coming in here, I'm featuring her, she's not looking at the camera, I could shoot like this, and then I can tell her to look back at me. And then another thing that you've got to remember is that you've got to try to not mess up the groom's profile and hide it. So try to, I mean, I'm looking at all my pictures, I don't like them now. It's like, ah, I, the groom's profile was too squished into her face or, or kind of covered by the hair. I said, oh, shoot. I should, he is important too, okay. Uh, and I try to creep his profile in the face. And you can see it. Great for couples that are the same height. You can do the same thing. It's the prom pose, but they're sitting down. Her head is cha- turned. His is not. And she, if they're the same height, you can scoot her booty down a bit and get her lower. And different heights create a more pleasing picture. Why? Because a height, different heights will organize your brain onto what to look at first. If, you, if, if something is at the same height, you don't know what to look at first. Whereas if it's different heights, it's forcing your mind to choose. Are you going to look at the lower one, or are you going to look at the higher one? OK? But if they're at the same level, you'll, uh, so try to, if you can, create different heights. Uh, the problem, you know, not a problem, but a lot of times if they are the same height, or if the bride is taller than the groom, oh well, I, I guess it's different heights, but then you can't, it's a little bit different that way, because usually the taller person has a more masculine pose. Okay, same thing. Prom pose, instead of her looking that way, I just had them both looking this way, because of the light was going that way, and her arm is going up. She has a lean, see how she's leaning? It's, it's, it's a subtle thing. 
It takes a lot of effort to get somebody to actually lean like that, but on camera, you hardly notice the difference. But when you look at your photos, those subtleties, that's the world-class photographer knows those subtleties, and they can see it right away. And what happens is your client sometimes can't. But they look at your overall photos, and they go, there's something about that photographer that I like. I don't know what it is, but I just like his photos. They can't describe it. But once they start looking at your work, and they're serious about it, and they go over and over, and they're thinking about hiring you, so they've been to your website 10 times, it will make a difference. It will. Same thing here, uh, right, prom pose. But she's kind of looking forward, and I have him looking this way, OK? Now, in this particular case, oh, I'm sorry that these photos are kind of, I think I adjusted them, and I shouldn't adjust them. <laughs> so they look posterized. But anyways, she was taller than he was, OK? She, if you kind of look at how long her legs are, right, you can kind of tell if she stands up, he, she's going to be taller than him. Right? And so what was great about her, I loved her. She was taller than him, but she went ahead anyway since I'm wearing these darn heels that are three inches tall. And she's like going with it, right? And so what did I do in this case? I got, it's the prom pose, but it's sitting down, faces towards the light, right? But it's the same thing. Face to face, okay. So let's do that. Let's, let's, let's go back and do that. Now, this is face to face, but we just did. So let's come and let's do a demonstration of the prom pose here. Uh, so, Hannah, so what we're going to have you do is you're simply going to lean this way and look over this way. Okay? So I want her, maybe if we move over here outside of the screen, would it be better? Is that better? Okay, so you're going to come in, uh, stand right here, Hannah, and you're just going to lean that way. Right? And then you're going to look this way. OK? Or look out over here. And then, Joe, you're going to come in here. You're going to put your feet under here, like this. And you're going to lean in this way, but you're going to be right here looking at her. So you're going to put all your weight on that left, left and, but you're going to look back at her. Right? And so now his face is generally forward, and her face is a diagonal. Right, and I can close him off a little bit more. Can you accentuate that lean a little bit more? This way, Joe? This way? Yeah, okay. And then you're going to come back right here. She's going to turn this way. And you can actually put your forehead right where her, your chin where her forehead is. Can you do that? Can you come in closer a little bit? It's hard because they're actually not married, and I know how uncomfortable that feels when they're not married, but anyways. Okay, and so he's kind of, kind of put your head down, and then look towards that way. Good, and look down this way. Don't look at me. So see what I do is I have their eyes cross each other. When their eyes, when their heads are close together, they can't look at each other because it looks not natural. So if you could tilt your head this way because her hair is kind of in your way. So I don't want to mess this. Oh, I like that right there. So that I've got a profile there. She's turned this way. Now I can have her look past my ear here. Hannah, can you look past her ear? Right? Can you move in a little bit closer there? Uh, yeah, your hip this way. Yep, good. Turn your face this way. Look a bit, but look past my ear here. So I can see her. I could focus on her. And I have him. Behind. I can live all day on this pose. It works every single time. It's simple. And you can, you know. And so what happens is, now try to look at each other. It looks very uncomfortable, right? So when you get the heads that close, they can't be looking at each other because they would have to actually be apart this much in order for them. Now you could, now let's try looking at each other. What you could do is accentuate, stay there. You're going to do that same pose. And it's almost like you're dipping her. So you put your arm around her waist. And you're going to put your, uh, OK, so you're, you're going like this. I want you to have, be more of a stronger base okay. behind her. Like you're going to support her. And you're going to turn more this way. Nope, the other way towards each other, right there. Put that hip in. Now look at each other. See that? You've got the distance. You could do that. So it's the same. OK, but you can also look this way. Now look at her and look past my ear, right? So I could shoot that right there. I can move this arm out slightly to show that shape. I can give him the hero pose, 
like this. I could shoot in tight. I could have her look down this way. Close your eyes, close your eyes, kind of touch your nose to her forehead. Just whatever's closest to that you can get at. Get at, uh, move your head this way, because this hair is kind of going into his, close, close your eyes. So bring him out here. I don't want to ruin his profile. There it is. Like So if he turns his head this way a bit, then I can see his profile there like that. And so what I do is if I want them their heads to touch, I don't make them kiss right now because they would be straining because there's too much distance there. So his nose is closest to our forehead, so I try to get it right there. Of course, they're not married, so it's a little bit difficult. And I move into there. So whatever's closest, like it, depending on the height difference, Right? If the forehead's there, kiss the forehead. If whatever, it's the nose or whatever, I, I try to just work with whatever's there. Okay? So thanks very much. So that is the, pro any questions on that? We can still maybe have them here if they have any questions. Any questions on the prom pose? Well, I'm going to do it to you two. You guys are married? Let's go. Okay. Who want? Anybody want to pose them? Who's scared out of their mind, have never even done this before, and wants to try to, you know what? Take off your jacket. <laughs> Sorry. Who wants, to, who wants to step up and take it for the team? You want to try it? And, and if you're scared, I like that, because we're going to work through everything for you, OK? So come on up. And I'll try to be as difficult as possible. So. <laughs> uh, you can go a little easy on them, OK? So just stand like, yeah, uh, you're together like, and you're going to do a shot like that, OK? OK, if I listen to you correctly, we yes. should uh, start posing with her first and then bring him Good. later. OK, perfect. So we're going to get you to stand over here, please. Get uh, me to stand yes. over here. Roger, and Roger. Um, can get you can pick any hip. It doesn't really matter. Uh, which one you're comfortable with. This there one. you go. And. Uh, you're gonna come. Okay, wait a second. Over here. Let's stop there. Okay, she's put, putting her hip out, but to me, she hasn't not... sold me yet. Oh, you want it more? Yeah, because that just looks come normal. Come on, you make right? me look bad now. <laughs> so uh, you need to sell me. So push that hip out a little bit more. There you go. Does that oh, there he goes. Oh, yes, that's. Key. Okay, go back that's to normal. Good. Then just slightly do your hip. That's what a normal person will do for you. Uh -huh. They don't understand it needs to be exact, go more, exaggerate. That's what it needs to be. That's the difference. Why That's you're nice. going to be so successful. It's because you are going to know you've got to sell it more. OK? Cool. Now we're doing like the curvy. So look off that way. Right? Perfect. There she is. And then we're going to bring the groom. She can and put her knees together a little bit more, side. too, if she wants on to. On the side behind her. Behind her a little bit more. And you're going to hold on her. But don't cover her like that. And you're going to be looking down here, and you're going to be looking to her. OK. That's good, but you didn't really even pose him. Oh, OK. So what I'm going to do is pose him. OK, take your hands away. OK? And so I'm going to show him what to do. So he's going to see me. So right? Go so i got to tell him to do the same thing, right? I'm leaning in so this way, uh -huh. right? And then I'm here, like that. So, cool. <laughs> okay, yeah, right, good. He's selling it, okay? And look towards her, right? And get a little bit closer. No, with your bodies. Okay, but I gotta see some distance between. Uh, well, no, don't be afraid to put your hips together, man. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have the hips together. That's another thing. OK, turn this way, that way, right, right and then right in there, right? So she, you could do this, but she could come back. This is what I like when he, she's back here. I got to create some sort of connection between them, right? And so like, I like that a lot, right? And oh, I give him a hand, right? Perfect. That's the prom pose. Thank you, guys. You did great. <laughs> see, see how easy that That wasn't that difficult, right? That but that, I like what you did. You started with her first. And the only thing that you didn't quite do was him. You just had him. You just, well, you literally took what I said, just throw him in. Uh, but <laughs> we kind of have to mold him a little bit, too. But very good.
Yes. So one thing that changed the energy in this was that there was an audience here watching. Do you usually try to do this in an isolated environment? Oh, good question. A lot of times they'll get nervous with the bridal party around, and sometimes I'll tell the bar bridal party to go because they're making f jokes and doing this, yes. and they're like, uh, right? And so a lot of times if they're, if, uh, I will tell them to leave. I like to just have the bride and the groom because they can't get intimate and close their eyes and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and, okay so let's get going. Any questions on that? Okay, so let's go to face to face. Okay, so when now they're back to back, what do you do when they're face to face? And so what you do here, uh, it's the same thing. In some of the back to back, you just got to create a T with their heads. So if you look at him, her head is turned, right? It's the same thing here. And the key to this is, see this uh, T that we're forming with the heads? So their bodies are kind of like together parallel, but their heads are perpendicular. And that's what makes it interesting. Okay, now the thing, don't, I can see the profile in his face. I didn't cover it up. I can see her face. Is that correct? And what really kind of makes this work here, too, is um, that head tilt for her. Because that head tilt is going to create the space there. That little triangle in there. You need that space. The worst pose that you can have a couple do is two sticks together. Okay? You need to create that space by tilting the heel. Let me show you how powerful this is. I am going to pretend to be the bride, which is nothing new. <laughs> but I'm going to pretend that that wall is my groom. Okay? So let's come on over here if we can do this. So here's my groom, right? And I'm the wall, and hi, cheesy, right? That's, ah, right? But now, if I'm here and I'm here, like this, <laughs> that triangle that's here creates that space. I can look down here, like this, see? <laughs> Wall can be your best friend sometimes. That's all you have sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can make uh, a wall look good, then you're doing pretty good. But it's that. <laughs> A <laughs> little space that you've got to create in there. So just don't press two people together to create that space. You've got to bend that head to create that little triangle in there. Okay? Even, uh, even light or directed light uh, towards the groom's nose this time, actually, in this particular case. Okay, so there it is again. Do you see the space there, that triangle in between them? And see how his head is leaning forward there? And one important thing to do with this pose is look at how he's posing. Okay? Is his weight on both feet? It's on one foot going forward like this. Okay? He's selling it. When you, okay, so it's, there's a certain kind of energy if you lean towards each other. Okay? If I'm just standing here, you feel zero energy. But if I actually lean towards you, it gets you a little bit excited, doesn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you, that energy is being transferred just by that lean forward. So I have him leaning forward, right? She's actually there kind of back, but, and, but I still have that space in there. And they're face to face. Her head is turned to the side. They're not looking at each other, so when her head is turned to the side, who's being featured here? The bride. the bride. I've got impact. When you look at this photo, who do you look at first? Bride, immediately. It tells, it conveys what I'm trying to convey. Bam, immediately. And so, and, and that's, that's that little space, turning the head, even though their bodies are together, one turns the head, and it, and it creates a nice look to it. And I'm featuring one person only. Hips together, that triangle. Heads tilted to create space. You need to tilt the head to create the space. Weight on one leg. 
In this particular pose, when I'm doing a face-to-face, -face, it's almost like I'm making the man the statue, the wall. And you know how I kind of cuddled against that wall? I want that man to feel that way, like I, I am the one here. I am the foundation. I am the pillar of life. And you're going to lean on me, and I'm going to lead you through life. I know it sounds cheesy, but that's romance, right? That's the romantic feel. The man is strong, and the woman is. I love you. Lead me. Take me somewhere. <laughs> right? In my case, my wife did everything for the first 12 years because she supported us the other way, so she did all the leading. But anyways, well, she probably does all the leading now anyways. But strong, right? I am the rock. I am a pillar. Woman, oh, hug me and kiss me and hold me. You know? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to... I want complete opposites. That's the key to posing, is the complete opposite. And it must be reflected on the way you pose somebody. It, look at your photos when you go back home and how you pose couples together. Do you feel that immediate, I'm strong, I'm this, and she's this? Then you're doing something right. But if you can't really tell, a woman isn't being a woman and a man isn't being a man, then you can do better. Okay. Here it is again, different angle. Who are they looking at here? They're not looking at me, they're looking past my ear, right? I can do one shot where they're um, looking at me, but I take uh, the shots that I like, that I have a feel to it, because you know what? When they're kind of looking at a way, I get that photojournalistic feel to it, um, and it doesn't, you know, if you had a huge portrait on the wall and everybody was looking at the camera, looking at, don't you feel weird? Like, oh gosh. Do you ever go to those, do you ever go to those houses and they have the huge family photos, right, and their face is big, and then they're looking at the camera, you feel like, whoa, wow, right? You kind of feel like this. But when they're doing this, you can make this, I could make, I could blow up this picture, I could put it right on this wall, you'd feel comfortable looking at it because it's not directly in your face. So you can sell larger photos when it has this more type of photojournalistic feel to it. And, and you can do more artistic things to it when it's that way. Like I used to do a lot of these things adding textures. I always add a texture when they're not looking at the camera because I want it more fine art, okay? When the couple doesn't have to look at the camera, photographer gains more freedom. I can go to different angles and things like that. Okay. okay. These are, they're not actually a couple, but I was doing a workshop and I didn't have a guy and a girl, so here, let's do here, get together. Uh, and what's great about this photo is that this was the first time that they met each other uh, at this workshop and we took a cruise uh, to Cozumel, Mexico. We started in Florida. We had a great time. But what I love about this photo was they became really, really good friends during this workshop. And they were like husband and wife because they were inseparable. So this actually photo means a lot to me, but this is the same type of thing. They're face to face. Notice that head bent there, right? Creating that triangle there. Touch foreheads to create space if couple is equal height. And so that's why you're getting that triangle in there. See that? Triangle in between them, that space there? Okay, so let's move on to the head and shoulder, creating romance using the T method when a couple is face to face. And this is very popular. When you have a couple face to face and you want them to use the head on the shoulder type of feel, Right? And so it's the same thing where they're coming together. Who am I featuring here? The bride, right? And she's putting the head on his shoulder. They happen to be the same height. 
and you don't see him, but this photo still works to me because I'm still trying to feature her only. If you get confused and you want to do this type of thing and you're trying to feature both people, you're going to have a problem because it's just not going to work. So you have to make a choice. Okay, so I've chose to, to feature her. If all I see is his ear, oh well, that's okay because I'll maybe do another pose featuring him. Okay, so they're coming in, right? Their heads are forming a T, aren't they? His head is going this way, her head is going this way. She's leaning on him, I have her close her eyes. Instead of them shoulder to shoulder, maybe I open her up a little bit so you can see, so let's try it. Come on in here, let's try this. Right, so I'm gonna have, Joe, you're gonna be leaning in this way, like this, looking this way, okay? He's gonna be the rock, so you're gonna, yeah, right. Hannah, you're going to come around this way, and you're going to be like this, okay? And so you're going to kind of, no, well, actually here. You're going to want to rest your head on his shoulder right there, and he's looking that way. You've got to look this way a little bit more. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe, right? And you come in right there, okay? They're about the same height there, um, possibly, but that pose will work. It's the same concept. Okay? All right, great, thanks. And so let's look at different things to do here. That's exactly, we just did that right there. Now they have a, a greater height difference there. So that's a different height, so I can actually see his profile a little bit more defined. Uh, but sometimes you can't. Depends on how tall they are, but you can cheat. You can use stairs if you happen to be by stairs, right? Uh, so you can create height differences if you want, or if she's really short, you can get her up on something, right? Here, the, her head is, well, it's not quite, but it'd be leaning on his uh, chest right, area, right? And then his just chin is on her forehead, but they're face to face. Um, and so you can, but there's a height difference there, so it tends to work, okay? Sometimes if there's not a height difference, it's not gonna work, so you can't do it. Uh, so that's why the back-to-back, -back, the one where he's doing the back, that'll work for everybody. That one, not necessarily all the time. They have to be a certain height level. Now I love this pose here, right? And it works because there's a height difference, okay? Uh, or else you would, do you see his profile? Yes, do you see her profile? Who am I featuring here? Her, right? And so they're face to face, he's leaning down, and then I've got that T, right? He's, his head is this way and her head is this way, so it's creating a T there even though they're parallel there. And I just kind of love that feel where he's just holding her, you know, looking off to the side, but this will not work. So this is the key. This is the problem that we have. When we look through all the pictures and we try to get ideas, and we go, oh, that's awesome, I'm gonna try that. Well, if they're the same height, your couple, it won't work. It will sort of work because maybe you'll see half of his face or you just see his eyes, um, and you'll see her. So a lot of times, these poses that you see in magazines, they only work for certain body types or certain um, types of, of physical dimensions that you have. I, there was a very, <laughs> I was doing this one wedding and I had this assistant, okay? And I'm doing my thing and she is just bugging me. Oh, I shouldn't have said she. Well, this assistant was just bugging me, saying like, Scott, I want to try something. I want to do this. I want, like, I saw this thing in the magazine and I really want to do it. I was like, okay, chill. Let me get my shots first and then I'll give you a shot at it, right? So I'm going through, getting some shots. I wasn't quite finished. And she goes, Scott, I want to try something. Okay, I let her try it, right? She saw this ad in the magazine. And she had this, this lady doing, you know, the bride doing this arm thing, and her arms were really long, and it didn't work at all. And so what happens is, is that you can invest in yourself into a lot of poses, but if you don't know that they work, you're going to waste time. And if you have one minute to do it, 
don't try it because you've got to make sure you hit the single first. So that's why a lot of the poses, the earlier poses that I told you, they work every situation and you can start there. Then you can start doing the head shoulder stuff and things like that of that nature and get more aggressive with your posing as the time goes on. Okay, this is another pose here. And this what happens is, is you see how the bodies create the T this time, okay? So in this case, the bodies create the T instead of the heads, okay? And I use this all the time. So in this particular case, I like this because generally they were about the same height. So what I did was I put him towards the camera first, so he's going to be appear be larger, right? The women love that. They always love to feel like they're smaller, right? I don't know. That's just in their makeup or whatever, right? So then this, then if I put her here, and if I have her lean down, she's going to become shorter. Is that not correct? And so there's going to be a height difference there when there is none. But I use this T a lot. See that right there? Their bodies are creating a T. So if you're not having the heads, so if they're face-to-face -face or prom pose, you have their heads create the T, but then in this case, you can have the bodies create the T. Same thing here, right, where he's kind of moved over to the side. And it's the, what does she do? She do that same thing, hip thing, right? But instead of him behind her, he's just slightly in front of her a little bit, okay? That's creating the T. Here is this classic case of the T here. Uh, another thing that's important is that you must have the couple match the same emotions. Because it doesn't make sense if one person's smiling and laughing and the other one's just straight-faced. You, you can't really buy into the photo, so you have to match. So if she's smiling, he has to be smiling. If, if they're both not smiling and closing their eyes, then have them both closing their eyes or, or whatever. But it, really, the expression must match. So this has, even, you see he has this slight smile there? And she has that kind of expression. Who's being featured here first? Bam, she is. You know who I'm trying to shoot. Creates impact. Right? Her body is at a slight angle. He's taller than her. So, hey, you know what? His head is closest to her forehead, so that's where it goes. I don't strain his neck or his body to try to get to kiss her or whatever. It's just, just kiss or whatever. Whatever is right next to you, go for it. That's where it is. Make it look natural. Same thing here. Now I have them both look away. They can look at me. See, there's a whole variety here. You know, he can look at me by himself, right? They can both look away. He can look down. She can look down, close her eyes. He can look down, close her eyes, and create that cross. So you can just live within this little area. Then you can shoot it. You can change the direction of the heads and shoot it wide, and then switch back to, let's say I shoot that wide. And then I should get closer, I turn his head down this way and have her looking down this way so their eyes, eyes cross and they're both closing their eyes and I shoot it tight. I got that too, all in one pose. It's just to generally pose them, switch the emotion, change the head position, um, and you've got a variety of looks just within one pose. Another thing I like to do is steps. Because when they're sitting down, I can make the groom taller than the bride. So if he's sitting up, this these weren't steps. These were like rocks. We were in San Diego somewhere. And um, he was higher than her. Uh, but it's the same thing. Isn't the body, see the body is creating this T right here? And the, who's being featured here? It's the bride. That one, she's actually looking at me. OK, now look it. You can always do this with two chairs. Okay, so for example, if, it, if, if they're taller, if the couple's taller than you, can I actually use a couple chairs as somebody? Is that? So what you can do here is, what you can do is you can have, 
you could do something like this. All right? So if I can have you come up here. Joe, if you could just kind of straddle this chair this way, like this. Okay, and Hannah, if I can, oh, you're, it's going to be difficult for you to sit, sort of. So go ahead, straddle that chair first, All right? And just go ahead, and we're going to try to do that pose where you're sitting down this way. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Yeah. And so she's looking this way here, right? And you're creating a T. And your head is coming. Now, what we're going to do is that she, now she, it appears that, it, that she's a little bit taller. So if you can stand up a little bit straighter. Tall, no, no, no. Sit, keep in your chair. <laughs> but what would you need to do is she needs to push her booty all the way to that edge of that chair if she can't, so she can get lower. You see how that works? Right? And, well, actually, I did this bad because her open area is this way here. So I should have him coming this way. But in general, if we moved her hair out of the way, right, and I create the T here like this, and these chairs already give this to me. So if I have you looking off this way, right, and I can, ooh, get in a little bit closer, put your nose right by where her chin is right there. She's looking at me there, and it's kind of like she's giving her cheek to him a bit, and I take it and I shoot it, that would be perfect right there. So I don't know if my camera's tethered, right? But I can actually do that. Let me see what it looks like. I have no idea what these settings are, so we're going to see what the story is. Five, six. OK, so go ahead. And it's like you're giving him your cheek there this way. Right, and just kind of come in and right there, yeah. Okay, both close your eyes, right there. Getting closer there, <laughs> they're not married. So if you can kind of just lean in a bit and sell it a little bit more for me, right there, perfect. Now with your eyes, look at me. Right there, just look down that way. And then give me a smile, ha, 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 both of you. Yeah, don't look at me though. Give me a little bit more smile, Joe. Give me something. There we go. Right there. Now, with your eyes, look at me. There. Perfect. All right. So um, you can get all that kind of within there. Thank you very much. But you've already created the T with the chairs. And guess what? I'm shooting down on them. They're taller than me. And it's just got two chairs. That's it. All right? You got some nice light. And shabam, look at it. It looks like they're a happy couple. You guys are a good looking couple. Beautiful life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we switch back to the. Uh... All right, use two chairs. That's a great way to do that. Here's two chairs again. You got a table, you see this all the time. Do you see the T that's creating with her head and his head and the bodies that are right there? Right? Their heads are facing where their bodies are, but what's creating that T is their body position is creating the T. Same thing here, but they're on the bed this time. This was another case. She was taller than he was. What is the case when she's taller than him? Get them down, sitting, something like that. And so I got them on the bed, and then I you know, had her look towards the light, and I created a T with their heads and put his nose right there by his forehead. So her legs were going this way, his legs were going that way. Same thing here, OK? She's doing the rollover. Her legs are going this way. His legs are going this way. He's just coming in for the kill right there. Bam. Looks beautiful. This was this mansion. You guys should come to me. We're going to go to Paris in June and going to do some amazing photos. Actually, we have access to shoot in Versailles. You know where that is? Yes, we've been there last time. Yeah. We, get, we, we have permission to shoot in there. It's amazing. <laughs> so it's going to be great. I can't wait. OK, anyways. OK, look at this. 
It's that T, and I'm, what I'm doing is body away from the what? Light, face towards the light. This is what you do when you have extreme, this was like, okay, this was in Vancouver, so the sun doesn't set until like 11 p.m. at night or whatever, right? And so it's got, this is a situation that happens to you guys in the summer, right? The sun stays out forever. What do you do? It's bright light, you're going out somewhere. I, what I told her was like, make sure you let, you feel the sun on your face. So that's what she would do. She's like turning it, right, and feeling it until she had that sun on her face. And then I've kind of moved him in position once she kind of felt that sun on her face. And that creates that T there. She's being fixtured. He's, doesn't he feel like I am a pillar of strength? Lean on me. Don't worry, babe. I'm going to take care of you. Nose towards the light. Feel the sun on your face. This is opposite now, okay? This is where you're doing, uh, a, uh, it's the same T, but I'm, stead, I'm using the back. So I'm using the shoulder back here versus the, the angle here. So this is the T, like this here, okay? All right, so tips for posing couples. Um, create a T, either with the heads or the bodies. That's simply it. Where's the T? Is it down there? If you're doing the prom style, then make the heads do the T. If you're doing, um, you know, if you're doing, or you can make the bodies do the T, either way, but you gotta create a T some way. Create different emotions with it, okay? Just don't set them up there, just like how we did here. They're looking down, I made them smile, I took a few shots, that took literally, what, one minute. Right there, got some great shots. Match emotions. Limit couples looking into the camera. I mostly do shots with them not looking into the camera and then a few of them looking into the camera. To make a couple look natural, make them lean or some, sit on something. If you're having a hard time and they're just stiff, get them sitting or leaning on something. The easiest thing that you could do is like put her right here do this thing right here like this, and bring him in right there. It's a winner every single time. You can't lose. Plus, it's so easy for a person to lean. They're going to get the pose right. See, now, if I'm leaning here, I can exaggerate that sucker. Man, I can make that hip pop because I'm leaning against something. So you could really bring out that figure doing it this way, and then just bring him in this way, leaning towards her. and leaning forward like this, and um, be easy, okay? What you want to do with the couple also is you want to take a wide angle landscape with them, okay? And what I mean by this, here's the technique. You frame a beautiful landscape as if they weren't in the picture. So you look and you find something as if you're a travel photographer and you don't have anybody and you take a picture and you go hey this looks beautiful okay just by itself then when you bring in a beautiful couple it's gonna even look better on top of that so you shoot the landscape first and then you bring somebody in and you see you look at it and you see you know it'd be great if I had the couple right here okay place a couple to complement the landscape Create action through the landscape. So what you could do is frame the, the landscape and then have them hold hands and walk through it or run through it or whatever. And that's a very uh, easy thing to do. And that's actually one of the very, very popular trends nowadays is to take a beautiful landscape and make the couple about that small. Okay? So... Land, in these particular photos, really, the landscape is the main feature here. And the couples are just kind of accenting that. So it's complete opposite. So let's look at this. So I completely set this up. They are fake walking. They are just leaning. I directed every single aspect of that photo. But because, you know, so, so I, I'm leading her. I'm having him 
lean on one foot, looking out over there. And then she's, I told, hey, look down. And I told her to look down, but I picked the place first. I went into my camera. I said, this is great. I like that backlight coming through here. Okay, you guys stand right over here. So I did the landscape, and then I throw them in. Same thing here. I picked out the landscape. Go, hey, this would be great. Threw them in there. And the one thing is when you make your subject small like this, you got to create more space between them or else you're not going to see them. What happens if you had them posing close together? They'd be like one person there. So therefore, when the farther away you are, you have to separate the couple more or else you're not going to distinguish between the groom and the bride. That's the same thing there. This, I had him go close, and then I had them step away from her. See how she's feeling the sun on her face? He's looking at her. Uh, it's a wide angle shot. Here's a wide angle shot. If you, okay, if you took them out of the picture, wouldn't this still look, be like a great shot? Even if you took them out. So adding it in is going to be something even more special. Where's their face pointed towards? The light. Right? So their faces are pointing towards the light. Here, this is not Vegas. This is a real thing, the Eiffel Tower. Uh, I've got that in my viewfinder. What, look, at, look at their faces. They're doing the face-to-face, -face, but don't I create a T with them? I'm featuring her there. That's that shot. I took a bunch of series, but they start, I started with this shot first. I went back and got all that beautiful... Um, landscape, and I love those windows that were there. I made them stand up on top of that thing. So I was like, ooh, can you stand up on top of that table? Um, and the whole theory with that is, is you're kind of putting your subject on a pedestal, like a, a statue or something like that. So that's the feel that I wanted, and it was like kind of like the perfect pose that, that happened with that feel. Going wide, Actually, um, I didn't actually take this picture, but my assistant did. But my assistant knows to do opposite of what I'm doing. So I set up the pose. I, you know, did everything there. And I'm shooting more tight. But then, if, so if you're a second photographer, you go, OK, you know what? That photographer's got the tight. I'm going to go back. And, and so then you get a wide variety of things here. Here's how you create an action through a frame. So I just, you know, shot this, and then I'm having them walk through the frame and take the shot. Same thing here, uh, where I saw this road, and I was above, and it took a little bit of doing, but I go, oh, man, that'd be great if they're holding hands walking through this way. And so I, you know, um, so I'm setting up this shot, and then I send my assistant down there. I say, hey, dude, don't let any cars come through. So somebody was holding back the cars while they were uh, walking through here. But it's that same concept. You take a wide-angle shot, and then you, then you walk them through. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Anybody familiar with WPPI? And then they have their awards. They used to make these really beautiful uh, books that had all the award-winning shots. They don't do it anymore. But this was actually on the back cover of the, of the last time they did that album. I think it was like 2010. So if, if you ever happen to see that album, that's the back cover of that picture. Of this picture is the back cover. OK, here's another thing where you're setting up a scene, but you're creating action through that scene. They're doing something. Here again, I do it even more pronounced, where I set it up, and they're walking through that scene. Well, actually, I fake walk it. I just placed them in the position, and I told them to lean and whatever, look back. Uh, but I'm shooting this like this, because I have my live view, because I want to go way above. So when I'm shooting them, I've got this turned down, and I'm actually shooting it. Doesn't it look like I'm like 20 feet tall there? And, but I'm shooting it like this. So I love the new technology nowadays with the tilt screens and stuff like that. You could take advantage of it. So uh, walking through here, right, a scene. He's coming up. I had this idea. Oh, climb this mountain to get to her, right? So that's that feeling that I had. 
This is opposite where it was something moving behind them instead of them. So there was movement here, but it was opposite. It was like the train. So I would just open up my shutter and create that. You know, wind and hair flying around always suggest romance. So wind, hair, flying, romance. Choose a high angle. Okay, I have them running here. They're running through a, through a scene. If you make a couple run, their only response is to laugh. This is great with Asian couples because sometimes we're a little bit, mm, we don't show, well, I'm different. I show a lot of emotion, but a lot of the times if you shoot Asian weddings, you'll find that the couple, it's hard to get emotion out of them. Just make them run. They can't, they can only, if you start running, holding hands, you're going to laugh. You're going to smile, right? There's no way out of it. Same here, where I wanted to shoot, I was shooting up in this case, because there's thousands of people walking around, because we're in uh, Venice, Italy here. And so I was going, well, I got I to gotta just shoot up, because there's people all around me here, and I want to get rid of them. So I had them run towards me, and I literally was shooting at this, the wide-angle lens. Okay, action through. Uh, this is a workshop. I didn't have a, a guy and a girl, so I just had them hold hands and just run across. A scene. Laughing, running, creating this emotion, going through that scene. This one is in Hawaii. I just had them dance, twirling around. Everybody, a lot of people do that. But you've got to have a variety of emotion there. Here, here, I'm separating them. So create a few shots where you're separating the couple, too, to create variety. Here's one where I'm separating them. Okay. This, this kind of works, it's that kind of like two trains, would it, two ships passing in the night feel to it. <laughs> and it sort of can have a romantic feel to it if you kind of create that. I don't know if I really actually did it here, but that's kind of like the feeling. Like we're almost, we, we belong together, but we're just missing each other type of feeling. Okay. Okay, here's your shot list for a couple. Get at least one of the following. Tight shots. Waist up, different emotions. Waist up, just shoot right within here. Then you need a wide angle shot to incorporate the landscape that it, you're in, that location. Why did they choose this area for you to shoot at? Or why did they choose this venue? What's the key feature of this venue? Let's get it in the shot. Action shots, then you've got to create some sort of action, running, dancing, or whatever. Then you've got to create some shots that you have separation um, between them. And you've got about five minutes to do this. Okay? <laughs> it's like in your mind, it's like, I've got to kind of do all this stuff, but I've got five or ten minutes. That's what you need to prepare your mind for. Okay? And if you think that way, you're going to practice better. And when you get into that situation, you're going to be more prepared because I'm going to tell you that's what's going to happen. That's what you're going to be given. So you got, and okay, how would you like that? It's like you get paid $10,000 for a wedding and then you lose time and you're shooting the couple and they only give you 10 or 5 minutes. That's happened to me a lot, just 5 minutes, seriously. What are you, are you, how are you going to feel? Are you going to feel that you can produce $10,000 quality when given 5 minutes? Right? So when you ask for a lot, they're going to expect a lot. You have to be ready because you can't make a mistake at that point. Okay? All right. So there you got the variety. Most shots, a couple uh, should not be looking into the camera. And then a few are. And that's that feel. That's that 5K. That's that luxury feel. The luxury feel is a photojournalistic feel, not two people looking into the camera. It's very hard to arrange. I'm thankful that I was a graphic designer before I became a photographer. So I was used to arranging elements. And so that was fairly easy for me because I've been doing it for 12 years. I've been arranging elements on pieces of paper. But it's the same thing with people. So I sort of had a feel to it. 
uh, beforehand. Okay? Pose, what dif when you want to do a group shot, the first thing you do is look for even lighting, shade, something that has completely even lighting. And even in this case, I didn't have even lighting because you can see some highlights on their hair, but it was the best I could do. This was the only place in the entire, it was like smoking hot that day. It was like 90 or 100 degrees. And so this was the only area there was some shade and people could give me a nice natural smile without being felt burned up, okay? So that's the first thing is to use, find, look for even lighting. And so sometimes all you got, in this case, I've got a picnic table and I've got shade. That's it. So that's what I had them for, okay? So pose subjects in even lighting, no hot spots. Use a flash, I use a little bit of flash in there to create those rich, deep colors. See the color popping out on that? And so when you use your flash, you're able to really, it's off-camera flash, to really pop the color in this case. Also what I do is I zoom, I, I use the longest lens possible. Because what happens is, Com when you use the longest lens possible, it compresses the image, which means when you use your longer lens, it brings the background closer to the subject and makes it look bigger. And then you get that blurred out effect like that. So in this case, I think I shot it at 70 millimeters, okay? So that's it. If I had longer, I would have shot it at longer. It would have looked even better with more blurrier background. And so in this case here, this was in Paris, this wedding. And they wanted to walk all the way across and get this. They had their wedding in this 14th century mansion. It was a ca actually, it was a real, it was a castle. There was a real moat around the whole thing and whatever. But they wanted that in the background. So we got over to the other side, and I go, well, you can't even hardly see the mansion at this point. So I had to just zoom it out at 105 millimeters, walk way back to bring that mansion forward. Same thing here, uh, well, no, this is not the same thing, but what makes things creative for me? See, like, I have my basic poses, but what gets my creative juices going to make me do something different? Structures. Structures get my creative juices going, because then I can get my graphic design mind in, and I can place elements in different places. So uh, what we did is we found this abandoned, you know, uh, trains, and so I got them up there. I had to pose every single person. Say, they just don't naturally do this. You got to do it. And so you got to, you got to, this takes practice to actually pose. And then, because the problem is, is this, you're going to pose her. By the time you get to be posing him, she's changed already. She's walking over here, doing something, doing her Facebook or whatever. So you've got to really keep their attention going. And, you know, if they say, move, hey, don't move. Stay right there. Stay with me. How are you guys? Stay with me, everybody. I just need a few minutes. Hang in there. We're going to get this done. I keep talking to them like that, right? And then I start posing everybody. And by the time there, I can get the picture. But you've got to really talk it through to make sure that they don't move. Here's another thing. It's like uh, in, on the beach. And so I posed every single person, every single per literally, lean forward. Okay, you guys go back to back. Okay, you go this way. You, oh, dude, you got to lean on one leg. Okay, come over here. You're in this, you're back there, right? Pop your hip for me out. Oh, thank you. Okay, dude, put your leg out. Every single person was posed by me. And that's the case which you got to do. And so that's why I said you got to learn how to pose one person before you compose a lot of people, because they're not going to naturally fall into place like that. You got to make it happen. Okay, interesting stru structures create different moods. Okay, let's say you got a. This is the bridal party. This is what I had to deal with and shoot it. They want me to shoot a big group picture of them. All I had was one six chairs. So I took the six chairs, put them across, and then I've automatically got three levels or more, right? So I got people on the ground, then I got people sitting on the chairs, and then I got people above. So one row of chairs can be your best friend when you're trying to pose huge groups. You got automatically three levels, and then make them do something. What do you think I said to them here? 
Funny faces? Yeah, make a funny face. <laughs> Same thing, right? Chairs. That's all I had. Levels, put them in the shade. Take a shot and then make them do something interesting. This post every, uh, created a scene. I saw this little cafe on the side. They wanted something different. Okay, let's create this romantic moment, uh, right? And so, like, oh, I'm killing myself right now because I should have turned her head more towards the camera and him the other way. But anyways, okay. But then I had to pose every single one of those people. Every single one. You sit down. You two sit down together. Oh, you lean this way. Okay, you guys talk to each other. Every single person I had to pose. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. But with practice, you keep doing it, and then you can create something like that. Here, this was that these are those amazing dancer people. They came up to me and said, hey, Scott, we want to do a couple freezes. I had no idea what a freeze was, right? Because it's a dancing move, right? And so, oh, OK, great, right? Uh, OK, well, find me some shade. And so he did, they went into his freeze, right? And I was on my stomach taking this picture, creating a different angle for it. And they naturally posed themselves into that. They're awesome. Like, it's so easy. They just like went into it themselves. <laughs> that was the easiest posing ever. OK, look at it. Creative angle. You don't got anything. You want to do something different? You get on the ground, and you shoot up, uh, shoot up and you have them lean forward and do something interesting to it. Be creative about it. Okay, um, here I'm creating different by putting the groom lower and moving him forward and having his men in the background. Um, again, these guys are awesome. They just pose that way. They're all dancers, so they just like kind of all leaning with one leg, right? But if they don't, you're going to have to do that with the men because they're going to stand up really stiff and straight. Okay, you got to take a high angle sometimes. So when everybody's on the same level, you're not going to be able to see them unless you raise your camera up really high. And so this is the case here, where I had them all together, leaning together, and I took my camera real high, and I shot it so I can see everybody. If I didn't have my camera angle high, I wouldn't be able to see everybody. Same here. This was like way up here, so I could see everybody in that school bus. So she was a teacher. And so what she did was rented a school bus to take everybody around him. OK, now I'm taking a lower angle where I'm using stairs. Instead of shooting up on the stairs, I'm shooting down below and separating her by bringing over her to the wall. Here again, I'm using stairs, uh, chairs. That's all I had. These guys are taller than me. So what I got to do is I got to get them down, spread them out. Then I'm standing on top of a chair also on top of that. So I I'm not only have uh, my camera, is, it's more than that. I'm actually standing on the chair so I can create this distance between them. If I didn't, his head would be right over his head, and that doesn't look cool. So you got to get raise the angle so you could create distance uh, between the subjects. Sometimes. The bride and the groom are going to come up to you and going to say, we want to get a picture of the entire wet, a guest, all of the guests. What do you do? You have to take a higher angle. So you find anywhere where you can get above and shoot everybody. So you're, you know, I'm above them, and I'm doing this and looking right to get that higher angle. Once you go higher, then you can see everybody. Okay, movement through a scene again. So you can create a scene, and then you can have them move through the scene and create some kind of emotion there. That's what I did here. Same thing. I had them run at me while I took a slow shutter. Okay? This is great if you want to have them move, but the bridal party is large. If you want to keep them together, I have them hold hands or link arms. Because what happens if you have them run through this scene, when you do it, she's way over here. She's faster because they don't w run at the same rate. But if you have them link hands, then they're going to stay together, and they can make sure you got the shot if they're linking hands. And so I'll do arm in arm. So this is a particular post that I do just to create some I create an interesting background. I have them lock arms. OK, let's have them do that. OK, all the ladies come up here. Stand up here. We're going to shoot this way here. OK, so stand right here and lock arms. Hey, 
Okay, you, yeah, you get. Okay, so yeah, go arm in arm. Okay, now on the count of three, I want you to walk this way, and I want you to give me something really sexy and exaggerated. Okay, and look at each other and have fun and smile. Ready, go. Click, 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 click. Right, that's not good enough. You didn't sell me. Go do it again. All right. So do it again one more time. Come on, I want something, some laughter, ha ha ha, fun. Just go. You're having the best time of your life. Ready, go. Sell it, sell it. There you go. Bam, 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 bam. They're all together. Thank you very much. See, they're all together at that point, and not there's not one straying off, so I can keep them organized. Because if you have them do that by themselves, it's not going to work. I, I guarantee you. One person, and this, like this, this is what's going to happen, is that they're going to just go crazy. But in this particular case, I wanted that to happen. It wasn't necessary for me to get everybody, but I wanted that feel of running through a scene. Okay? What, this is the worst case scenario ever. Bright light, um, and you've got to shoot this photo. So what you got to do is use two light stands, and you got to create light on each side here with two light stands. If I had my on-camera flash only, this distance is farther away than these two. So let's say I was taking a picture of you folks, okay? And it was really bright light, okay? If I was shooting here to get you ev in everybody's frame, my flash would be how far away? Like 10 feet away. But I can move my flashes in closer if I have one here and I have one here. If I half the distance to my subjects, my flash becomes four times more powerful. Okay? So even moving something just a couple feet can make a huge difference in power. I don't want to get into the inverse square law because we don't have time right now, but just trust me. So if you are in this situation and you need to shoot in this extremely bright light, you're going to need, just trust me, you're going to need a lot of light. Okay, so in this particular case, I had two flashes. They're probably on half power each, and, but they're close to illuminate the subjects there. And I even had one on-camera flash, too, just to fill it. So if you're in this situation and you're for shooting a group like that, make sure you have two light stands or you've got two assistants holding your flash for you off to the side so you can get that light real close instead of far back. Okay, use an umbrella when outdoor event I know, uh, here, right? So I'm shooting a group. This is just one umbrella. I'll go over this lighting a little bit later too, is that one umbrella, one flash. But the trick is, let me show you the formula. I've gone over this in my lighting lecture too, so I'm going to go over it really fast because a lot of people have seen this already. So what you do basically is you just put your ISO high at six. This is why I said it's important for you to get a high ISO because sometimes you need to shoot at a high ISO. In this case, I did it at 1600. That made my flash 16 times more powerful. So I could put it through one umbrella, get that, put it on one quarter power. If you're at 10 feet away, it should do the job for you. So that's the formula. So if you're 12 feet away or 10 feet away, just don't, don't ask me any questions. Just do it. It works. <laughs> you can figure out the math. Like, get my other lecture, and you'll understand why. Put it at a quarter power, and bam, you should have enough power to do it. OK. And so outdoors, the umbrella out night gives me this nice, huge, soft light. So when you're outdoors, you can take a great light. If I had on-camera flash here, this shot would not look the way it's going to look. But because I could use this off-camera huge light coming down, um, I can get a shot like that, right? And we'll go over the flash techniques a little bit later. This is more about posing, so we'll just kind of run through that. So one thing is that group shots really reflect your positive energy. When you're going to get an entire group to give you the same emotion, the photographer said something because they naturally don't do that. So when you want to create this energy there, you look at these people, doesn't that remind you of me? when you see that expression on their face. Because I am trying, I am getting that energy out of them, making them laugh, doing something so that they'll give it to me. So group shots really reflect your positive energy and how, what you create to the scene and what you make them do. Here I'm telling them to do an air kiss. See that look? 
you're not going to get that look until unless they buy into the photographer taking the picture. It just won't be the same. So this was an Indian wedding, and I, you know, like I've been with them for s several days or whatever, and so we had a great relationship. So they're giving me a genuine smile here. You're not going to get it, that special extra sauce, unless they buy into you. They have to buy into what you're doing. This is a scene I created where I just threw some flowers on them and made them um, kind of... Uh, pretend that they had the best time of their life, throw flowers on them, shoot it. Group shots can make you or break you. Why do I say that? Is because when you do a group shot, that's the time everybody who's thinking about having a wedding next is watching you. Every time I went to a wedding, I said, I'm getting two weddings out of this. And I would perform for those people who were interviewing me. And when's the best time that you can let people see your skills is during the group shots. Everybody sees you. The, groom that, the, the, the groomsmen that's getting married next, the bridesmaids that's getting next, that's when you're, getting, you're having a job interview during your group shots. So if you're creating positive energy and you're doing a great job, people are going to come up to you. I'm sure they said, just, oh, man, you're awesome. Yeah, you, they haven't even seen your photos, but they like that positive energy that you're giving them, and that's what's going to get you the most weddings. We'll go into the business side of it, but that's what's going to get you rave. So don't take these group shots lightly. It's really what's going to put you over the top. Oh my gosh, that was fantastic, Scott Robert. That's, I mean, what a day. I mean, we've just been, you've been just nailing it, nailing it, nailing it all through the day. So, I, you know, I want to just send out a creative, huge creative life. Thank you to you guys. Um, you guys, I want to thank you guys out there on the internet as well for joining us today. Um, a thank you to our in-studio audience. My gosh, they really went above and beyond. Um, really, so thank you to them, and of course to our beautiful models. They were just ab Woo! absolutely fantastic. Round of applause. Let's round give them a big round of applause, please. And, and another big thank you to you guys out there on the internet. Um, we are having a, a Facebook contest, so please go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash creative live, and just click on the contest button. We're looking for your best wedding photos. So please, you know, thank you for, for sharing your work, and there's some great prizes with that as well. So, so Scott, I want to let you know that, uh, you know, speaking of Facebook and the kind of kudos that we're getting from the chat rooms, um, I'm just going to read a couple of quotes that we've had from today. Uh, Ken Schultz Photography said, oh my God, I am living Scott's previous life. I can totally relate. He's an amazing teacher and inspiration. Exactly the reassurance I need right now. And we've been hearing a lot of that today. People are really wet, ready to step up their game. And then I love this quote from Amir Leon that says, wow, another must-have class. <laughs> so, yeah, I love right. that one. And uh, excuse me for looking down right now, but I'm just looking at the, at the comments <laughs> come in. Uh, wonderful to spend the day with all of you. I love Mrs. A Photos who says, my head is spinning with all of this stuff I want to try. <laughs> uh, and that's really, that's really what we're doing here is yeah. give you, giving you all these options and giving you things to try. Because when you don't even know where to start and where, what to try, um, it's pretty hard. Yeah. But when you see what you started off saying today, Scott Robert, was that you are going to break down all of your techniques into these wax simple on, steps. Thank you, wax on, wax on. <laughs> uh, silence. Yeah, the dramatic sure. pause. No. <laughs> Try to repeat what you did earlier, but that didn't really work. In any case, um, this is a huge amount of your 15 years of knowledge that you are breaking down into these things that we can look at and create and look at simply. So everybody here, we have 
three days. This is just one of the days. Uh, when, you purchase, <laughs> when you purchase this course, you get anytime access to not just the videos, but again, I mentioned it earlier, Scott is including all of the slides that you have seen all day long today, plus the slides that will happen in the rest of the course as well. They're broken down into the various segments. You can think about them as companion guides, as posing. We look at that section, um, the second section of today that was all about posing the groom, then posing the bride, then the groom and the bride. Each of those is a Scott Robert Lim posing guide that you can look through again while you're watching the videos. I just did the math and estimated in my head. I think it's hundreds of slides. <laughs> Definitely. Just, yeah. just from today, hundreds. Uh, so it really is an incredible value. Tomorrow, everybody, is going to be another jam-packed day. We're going to continue on with the group theme, right, and talk about lighting, group table shots, yes. more lighting, uh, managing the workflow of yeah, a wedding. Oh yeah, the money Huge. shots. Huge. Getting the money shots. I think you've got 25 money shots. Again, nice. breaking it down um, on the end business, getting into the business side as well. And then on the third day, we're continuing on marketing the business and then getting into that nitty gritty of going from zero to 5,000 photographer and a $5,000 to $10,000 photographer. So a huge, a hugely <laughs> comprehensive course. Again, if you have decided already, like Amir Leone, who says this is a must-have class, um, again, when we are live right now, you can buy this class for $99. There is a buy button beneath the video that you are watching right now. That is the easiest way to add this to your Creative Live library. Mm. So. We saw so many comments throughout the day, Scott, of the incredible amount of value that our people are seeing here, and that is what tells us it's an amazing workshop. Yeah. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Please help me give a huge round of applause to Scott Robert Lim, and we will see you all for day two tomorrow. All right.